Four years ago, I was 13. I went to Comic-Con with my grandparents in my country, which was held in our capital city. I met up with some of my older friends who I met online, who were aged 17 to 19. I was a stupid kid, and they invited me to a bar near my hotel and asked me to bring my grandparents with me just to be safe. Thank God I did what they told me to do. The moment we sat down in the bar, my grandparents sat a few tables away, but still being able to see me, and basically I spent most of my time talking with my friends. It was nice, but I noticed a man sitting on the same bench as me, but on the other end. Each time I looked over at him, he was closer and closer. Finally, my grandma comes over to me and told me to get up because we were leaving. And so I did. I told my friends that I'll see them the next day. We got to the hotel, and my grandmother tells me, the guy got an erection while looking at me, and when he got too close, she saw him slowly starting to reach for me under the table. Since then, I never met up with any of my older internet friends in any kind of bar anywhere. I was young and stupid, but I'm glad I dodged that traumatic experience. So to start this, I live in a very rural town in Australia. I have a close-knit group of four to five friends, and we hang out all the time. On this specific day, I was at my friend's house. About two days before this, her family came home and all the doors were wide open, yet nothing was taken. This family isn't one to leave their doors open, specifically in this town where crime runs rampant. On the day that I was over, let's call these two friends, Alyssa and Mike. Me and Mike were over at Alyssa's just hanging out on our phones when the front door banged open. We all looked at each other, but brushed it off as wind slamming the door. In hindsight, wind would not have been able to reach this door, as it was in a little covering. I don't know how to explain it, but if you walk up the stairs, there's a little room, and there is a front door. Maybe two minutes after, the two sliding back doors were slammed very loudly. We again brushed it off to not scare ourselves, but then we heard loud noises inside the house and footsteps running around their noisy wooden floor. This is where alarm bells started firing off in my head. I was thinking about how someone had already been there and wondering if this was the same person or people. We jumped up and me and Alyssa held the bedroom door closed. Her room didn't have a lock. Alyssa suggests that we call the police. I didn't think it was a good idea, but as I'm holding the door, someone started running and slams into her door. At this point, it was definitely time to call the police. They pick up, try to talk to Alyssa, and it's a little bit difficult because she is bawling her eyes out. Eventually, the operator understood, and within less than two minutes, police were at the door. These police officers were very kind and just asked about the situation before saying, We found the kid. I thought they meant the person that broke in, so I asked them about the kid. The police looked confused and said, The missing five-year-old? We had no clue that there was a missing child on the loose. The police officer said there were about 40 cars looking for this kid, and many police knocking on doors to ask if they had seen her. While I think the police were kind, their reasoning for the break-in was crazy. They said it was probably a police officer running in and looking for the kid. We all looked confused, and then he realized what he said and backtracked, saying they should have announced themselves, though. Pretty scary experience with police officers trying to calm us down, but after talking about it with my friends, whoever broke in probably saw Alyssa's mom leaving the house with two teenagers in the back, so they thought the house was empty. Alyssa has a brother, so all together they have three in the house, but on this day, her brother had a friend over and they were driving somewhere. So please, robber who frequents my friend's house, never come back to it. So I was on the way home from Arby's with a mint chocolate shake. I zoned out for a second and almost didn't notice his car. I tried just letting him through, but he insisted I go ahead. Didn't think much of it, and I just continued to walk. He drove on and parked his car near some apartments. He had on a black polo shirt, so I assumed he was just dropping something off for a job. 
As I kept walking, he approached me and offered me a $20 bill. I asked why, but couldn't understand what he said in response. I refused since I know what's best for me. However, that did not deter him. He grabbed my waist and I stepped to the side. He then started pulling me towards his car. I grabbed his hand so he wouldn't silence me and made sure to scream as loud as possible to try and attract any bystanders I could. He managed to get me into his car and just before he could close it, I stuck my foot through the door to keep it open. I then got out and made myself go limp since adding dead weight without warning creates sudden resistance and makes it harder for them to grasp you. Due to this quick thinking, I was able to get away unharmed. I quickly booked it and got back on the phone with my mom once I was at a safe distance. I made sure to stay on the phone until I got back. After that, I had taken some time to calm down and waited for the cops to get there to get my statement. The officer ended up praising me for my quick thinking, telling me that I'd luckily done everything right in this situation. Please, guys, take self-defense seriously. I've only ever had a week-long course, and just that alone had managed to save my life. I didn't remember too much from my self-defense course, and only used the basic techniques that I had remembered, which was making noise, dropping my weight, and checking behind me. Any other actions I'd taken were a result of logic and quick thinking. Chances are, if I'd gotten more self-defense training, it likely wouldn't have been as close of a call as it was. Also, never accept money from strangers. While there are good Samaritans, there's also people who don't have your best interest in mind. If you do think they have good intentions, make sure to double check by asking why they're offering you money. If you don't get a good, legitimate reason, then make sure you refuse. If you refuse and they still persist, then get away immediately. This just happened a few weeks ago. I work at a petrol station. I have years of experience working for one. So getting this job was just a piece of cake. Only this was different. It's lone working. Can you imagine eight hours entirely by yourself? Especially doing late night shifts? My shift started early afternoon. About maybe half an hour into my shift, this guy walks in. I had seen him before as he entered the shop the day before and randomly asked me if I had any shopping bags to spare. The guy was giving me some uncomfortable vibes but luckily someone else was working with me that day for a short while, so I asked them to deal with this guy. My colleague said we don't have any to spare and told him bye. The guy leaves. Back to this very date that the guy walked in and I thought, what does he want now? Another handout? Of course he just walks up to the desk and starts chatting with me. He was asking me some advice about his living situation as he told me he used to be homeless. Since to me, it's not really my place to give advice, plus I just don't really want to be stuck talking to this man, I shrugged it off and told him to just sleep on it and have a think about things. Of course he left, he didn't enter the store to buy anything at all, just a chat. But thinking back I remembered that he asked me what time I got off, and stupidly I told him 11 o'clock tonight. I got on with my shift as usual, up until 9.30pm, he returns with another guy who may I say looked dodgy, all dressed in black, wearing a hoodie. The guy who entered the shop previously pokes his head into the door and asked if I do phone top-ups. We do, but something in my gut was telling me, make him leave now. So I lied and I told him that we do not. The guy and his dodgy friend hang outside the store for a while while I was serving customers. Then until the shop seemed quiet again, they both entered the store and what looked like they were looking all around the shop. I noticed the dodgy guy kept his hands in his pockets the whole time, and then that thought struck me. I'm getting robbed tonight. So I took some deep breaths. I tried to keep calm and just thought of my training, and I repeated in my head, just comply, give them what they want, and then call the police after they leave. But of course from the panic I thought to myself, better plan. So I stood ready with one hand under the desk, hovering over the panic button. I thought to myself, the minute they pull a weapon on me, hit the button as it is a silent alarm, and show hands and comply and hope police arrive on time to catch them. They ended up only buying a water bottle, and as of course, I did not notice, but there was someone still outside in their car. I felt a huge sigh of relief thinking that they only wanted water, or that they decided not to rob me because there's another person outside. 
They both leave the store, but hang around again outside right by the door. Then I see the car drive away, and I thought to myself, I don't want these guys in the store again. Not while I'm completely alone. So I flip the switch that automatically locks the main door. Half an hour passes. I had no customers, and still the two guys are still hanging around outside. I called my boss to tell him what was going on, and to give them the heads up that at some point I'm going to have to call the police and have them move them along as it's making me feel insanely anxious. Then another guy shows up and joins the guys that were all dressed in black and wearing the COVID masks. He also hands his mask to them and they make their way around the back of the store. And then I realized, the back door, the one I go out to puff on my vape. I ran to the back door, slammed it shut and locked it. At this point I was scared for my life as these guys stack around the place to which felt like an hour and a half. I hid in the office watching the cameras. I picked up the phone and dialed the non-emergency number for the police. At this point I was freaking out, but of course I had to listen carefully while on the phone because I was listening to the automated press one for this options. I couldn't focus because my colleague called me on my mobile to check in on me. I told him what was going on, then I came out of the office to take a peek and of course those guys were right up to the window knocking to grab my attention. And yes, they saw me with two phones to my ears. They saw me, I said to my colleague on the phone, and then I came up with an idea. I put the phone I had been making a call to the police on down, and I kept my colleague on the phone. I said, listen, I'm going to see what they want. Stay on the phone. I'm going to put you on speaker. Stay quiet. Do not say a word. Just listen. If you hear me say, the till is slow, you hang up and call the police, 911, okay? That means it's me telling you that I'm in danger. So I put him on speaker and I hid my phone in my bra. I head to the window. Hello, gentlemen, can I help you? The guy says, why is the door locked? I take a breath and reply by saying, that's because we're in night mode now. The door's locked, but I can serve you through the hatch. What can I get you? They just looked at each other and whisper among themselves. The guy says, we will just take some cigarettes and a lighter. Sure, one moment. I grab what they asked for and they pushed a $20 bill through the window. I quickly grab it and of course check it. Then I rang them up, but as I had their change ready, I saw one of their hands sticking through the hatch. I dropped their change into the hand, avoiding contact. Okay, thank you. Goodbye now. I stared them down. They finally leave for good. As soon as they were gone, I fell to the floor and I burst out crying after holding in fear for that long. I demanded that my shifts now be changed to morning shifts after that night, or I am quitting. When I was 17, my bedroom had a window looking out at my backyard. The backyard was fenced in, but on the other side of the fence were some woods and a retention pond. I had never been scared of this and I kept the blinds open so that when the sun rose in the morning, the natural light would help me wake up. One night, I was up late on my phone with my dog lying next to me in bed. Around 2 a.m., my dog jumped up and started barking at the window. At first, I thought he was just barking at his reflection, and I told him to stop, but then I realized he was looking at the left side of the window while his reflection was on the right. I couldn't see outside the window because I had left the lamp on my nightstand on. All I could see in the window was the reflection of my bedroom. Not wanting to alert whatever might be out there that I was scared, I faked a yawn, set my phone aside, and turned off the lamp. I then laid down facing the window, and I swear I saw a set of human eyes looking back at me from the left side of the window. I drink a lot of water at night, so I had an empty bottle on my nightstand. I grabbed it and pretended to realize it was empty. I turned on the lamp and acted like I was going to get water. I went to my parents' room, and my dad told me not to worry. We had these motion-activated floodlights, and they hadn't turned on, so there was no way anything was out there. I went back to my room and told myself I was just seeing things. I closed the blinds and turned off the lamp, and I got some sleep. When I woke up in the morning, I went to take my dog out and decided to check out the pine straw bedding underneath my window. It was visibly disturbed. I did my best to ignore that and remember what my dad said about the floodlights. That worked pretty well until my dad tested the floodlights later that day, and I found that the bulbs had burned out. To this day, I keep my blinds closed and my lamp off when I sleep. I don't want to risk anything being able to see me 
and if anything is somehow peeking through my window, I want to know it's there. If there was someone at my window that night, I hope I never see him again. I've wanted to tell this story for years, and now I finally have a way to share it. This is going to be a long story, but it will tell you about the scariest story of my life. I was 15 years old living in a medium-sized city in North Florida. About 60,000 people, but some areas were really spread out and rural. Don't think of it like New York City or anything. More like a lot of houses spread out over a huge area and condensed shopping centers. I was a bit of a punk that my parents had a really hard time controlling, so that meant I basically snuck out consistently and was always riding my bike around the city at all hours of the night with my friends, fighting and constantly causing trouble. For reference, I was probably 5'10", 150 pounds. My next door neighbors were my best friends. Let's call them Nick and Tim. Nick was younger than us and probably 5'5", 140 pounds. Tim was 5'8", and easily 2'10". Nick and Tim were brothers, only a year or so apart. On that night, Tim had texted me around 1 a.m. asking me to ride bikes with him and his brother to his girlfriend's house so he can get lucky. I remember being hesitant because of how long the bike ride was. It was about 9.6 miles from my house to her street, but Tim begged and begged me to go until I agreed. Our city had a curfew, meaning any police in the area that saw you and assumed you were a minor would stop you and possibly issue you a ticket and bring you home. That meant we had to be careful about being seen by cars passing by. The bike ride to her house went by without any issue. We took our time, we joked around, smoked a little pot, and genuinely enjoyed the ride together. We ran out of what little pot we had on the way and finally got to his girlfriend's house after what felt like an hour. Tim snuck around the back to go in, and Nick and I just sat on an electrical box and talked. Maybe 30 minutes went by, and Tim triumphantly snuck out of the house, bragging about his time in there, and says that we should head out. Annoyed at how long it took, and nearly sober, we both agreed. The first mile of the ride went by smoothly, but then things changed. We had just passed a decent-sized shopping center and a church. We rode by it slowly, in zero rush at all. After we passed it, it led to a long stretch of road with woods and canals on each side. The road is named Center Parkway. Two lanes on each side separated by palm trees and landscaping in the middle. Sidewalks on both sides and on the right side of the other road connects to the parkway. We were riding on the right-hand sidewalk. Off in the distance we saw a very tall older man wearing a yellow raincoat and a large backpack. He was walking back and forth on the sidewalk under a street light on the corner of the parkway and the side street. We all went silent as we got closer. I don't think he could have seen or heard us, as there weren't any lights over us, but there were sprinklers going off in the median. I remember hearing him dragging his feet across the ground and mumbling. He was dragging his feet almost like he was trying to brush away the concrete to find something underneath it. The mumbling was incoherent and frantic. Honestly, it made my heart sink and my stomach knot up. I couldn't understand anything he was saying, and the only way to go home was to go by him. Nick said, let's cross the street and get onto the other sidewalk. Tim and I both agreed. I remember this so distinctly. We crossed the landscape median, and a jet of sprinkler water hit me directly in the face and got into my mouth and my eyes. It smelled like sulfur and tasted horribly. On the other side, we could hear the mumbling and scraping of his feet clearer. I could now see more details about him. He was smoking a cigarette, and he was probably around 6'5", had on a huge green backpack, was extremely skinny, had long gray hair, was wearing combat boots and blue ripped jeans, and that he had a full white beard. He didn't seem to notice us until we were directly across from him. We all had our eyes locked on his direction when he suddenly stopped walking, talking, and scraping his feet, looked up from the ground and let out this god-awful screech. It was like he tried to say 100 words at once. None of us knew what he tried to say. After the initial scream, I could make out, what the F are you doing? It startled us. We were 25 yards away from him, and then he screams, what the F are you looking at? I was a foolish teenager. I piped up to say something smart, and Tim riding next to me grabbed onto me and said, don't say a word. So I didn't. 
and in hindsight, I'm so glad that I didn't. He kept screaming in our direction and kept riding. The further we rode, the fainter the screaming got. And then it stopped. We crossed the street again to the other side and made it about a mile down the road, all of us on edge. We glanced over our shoulders constantly to make sure he was not following us. We talked briefly about it, how strange it was, but we were glad it was over with, or so we thought. Nick and Tim were riding in front of me when I thought I heard something behind me. I turned around and there he was, maybe an arm's length away, headed directly for me. The yellow raincoat hood was pulled up over his head and buttoned. This guy was standing up on his mountain bike, pedaling as hard as he could. We locked eyes, and he started screaming. And I mean, screaming. He screamed, not words, not any language, just a constant scream as long as he could. I have the chills just telling this story now, as a 25-year-old grown-ass man with a wife and a baby. If someone ever illustrated that image, and I saw it, I would probably have a panic attack. I screamed, he's right behind us, and took up pedaling as hard as I could. I think we all did, and he was right behind us the whole time, screaming. Every so often, he would get right on top of us, screaming and trying to knock us off of our bikes. I don't know how long we rode with him behind us, but it felt like an eternity. I think age played a factor because he must have gotten tired and let us get ahead a little bit. Exhausted, we pulled into a neighborhood and started cutting through yards trying to lose him. We jumped off of our bikes and all just decided, if he's still chasing us, that we were going to make a stand together and fight. It was like a hive mind decision, all too tired to keep running. It was our only option. We waited for him, but he never came. I don't even remember hearing him. I still can't recall when we lost him. I call my house phone, waking both of my parents up in the process, and I told my dad about the situation. He told me to get home and figure it out. I asked to talk to my mother, and she yelled at me on the phone and refused to come pick us up as I stood in the middle of the street, hoping this crackhead didn't come kill us. I got home with Nick and Tim in tow, who asked if they could crash at my house. Of course I said yes. I think we all still have some weird feelings about that night, and we never really spoke of it again. I don't know what he wanted. He was clearly on drugs, but it makes me wonder if he would have robbed us, or worse. This story happened about two years ago when I was 19, and my foster sister, Kira, was 16. For the sake of the story, it's important to know that I was a female presenting and had not come out as trans yet, nor was I presenting myself in an overtly masculine style at the time. It was the summer before I was going to college, and I mostly lived with my mom and Kira except for every other weekend, where I would stay with my dad. Now, summer's where I come from, get really hot and humid, so we had a habit of waiting to walk the dogs until 6 or 7 p.m., because that's when it would be cooler, but still light outside. On this particular evening, Mom was not going to be home until late, though I don't remember the exact reason why. She's a woman that likes to stay busy and often participates in choirs, Bible studies, youth group events, classes, and more, so it was not uncommon for Kira and I to be left home alone until 8 or 9 p.m., so it was up to me and Kira to walk the dogs by ourselves, unless we wanted our younger dog, Samson, to throw tantrums due to pent-up energy. Even though we lived in the countryside and could have walked them down our street, Kira and I decided to drive out 20 minutes to a park instead. Why? I don't remember. It could have been anything from being bored, walking our roads, to not wanting to have to deal with blind curves and hills. Whatever the reason, at around 7.30 p.m., Kira and I harnessed our two dogs, packed them up into a car, and drove to the park. Let me explain the layout of the park so that it's easier to understand why we got nervous halfway through our walk. This park is not very big, but it's popular because of its loop. The entire park is surrounded by mile-long looping roads with its attractions like playgrounds, ponds, and a small country hall spaced about in the inner side of the loop. The outer side is just grass, trees, and one playground at its end. Thus, it's common and expected to pass people walking the loop at least two times if you're walking in the opposite directions. But not if you're walking in the same direction, obviously. 
Any cars on this road can only drive in one direction because it's a one-way road. At first, everything about this walk was normal. I parked the car, we clipped our dogs to the leashes, and we started on the loop. Every so often, we would stop so I could take pictures of our dogs, particularly of Kara trying to wrangle Samson, who pulls like his life depends on it, and weaves around, because he wants to smell everything. It was while I was taking one of these pictures that the first encounter takes place. A man, who was looking to be in his 40s, walked past us, walking the same direction we were, up towards the playground and the outer side of the loop. He smiled at Kira, nodded, said hello, or cute dogs, or something like that, and he kept walking. I honestly didn't think anything of it. We're at a park, at a time of day where it's very common to walk around due to the cooler temperature, and people where I am are genuinely friendly, smiling and saying hi, it's pretty normal, no matter who says it. We smiled back, maybe said hi or thanks depending on what he said, and that was that, or so we thought. This man passed us again only ten minutes later, directly across from where we had seen him previously. Just like he did before, he smiled and he said hi. This time Kira and I looked at each other once he was ahead of us, and we shared a, well that was weird, expression. Just ten minutes earlier he had passed us walking up towards the playground, and subsequently broke off from the loop and he had been walking in the same direction as us. This time, though, he'd cut in front of us, and he did it in a way where we had to stop to avoid running into him. Hell, he nearly touched Kira with how close he was walking. That was already weird in itself. The other weird part was him cutting past us in the opposite direction. The only way he could have done that was if he'd cut across the inside of the loop, since it would have been close to impossible to pass us at our certain point from the other direction if he decided to walk the opposite way of the loop. Than us. It came off almost as like he wanted to walk past us again, but just like before, Kara and I brushed off the weirdness. The guy could have been enjoying the rambling stroll and doing his own thing for all we knew. Besides, we had two reasonably sized dogs with us. Who would mess with us? Not even five minutes later, this same man passed us again, and once again, cutting so close past us that he nearly brushed shoulders with Kira. Again, he smiled and said hello before walking off. This was officially the moment I decided that we needed to leave. Sure, it's normal to pass a person at least two times walking this loop if you're going in the opposite directions, but doing so takes a while. You have to at least get to the parallel spot of the loop where your paths first intersected to see each other again. Both the time between running into the guy and the location we passed each other didn't match up in a way that didn't look suspicious. Plus, I really wasn't a fan of how he cut across us. The first time he passed us like a normal person walking faster than us would, albeit a little close. The second time, he cut in front of us from the opposite direction instead of walking around us to the point we had to stop to avoid contact with him. But this third time, he walked up behind us, then did this weird directionally slant walk to cross the street and go in the opposite directions, cutting us off again. So yeah, I told Kara to hustle so we could get to our car and get out instead of doing a second loop. So that's what we did. When we were almost to our car, we noticed a car creeping along behind us. We pulled to the side and stopped to let it pass. But for a second, it stopped too. We figured he was getting ready to park, so we walked again. The car started creeping along behind us soon after we did. So we stopped again, and the car stopped with us. This was when Kira got nervous. We hadn't seen the middle-aged guy since the third cutoff, so we figured I had overthought the whole thing. But here we were, with this tinted window car acting weird as hell. Was it the same guy? Back with his car? A different guy? We couldn't tell. Before anything could happen though, another car idled up to the one next to us, and whoever it was sped up to the expected 5 miles per hour. We got to our car pretty fast after that, and practically picked up the dogs to get them inside. We got in the car and got out of there. But my mistake, however, was neglecting my rear view mirror and the well-advised rule not to drive straight home if you're worried a stranger is taking too much interest in you. I was anxious, dumb, and primarily concerned with getting home where we could be safe. Because home is safe, right? Nothing bad is supposed to happen to you there, right? Ah, my naive false sense of security. I think we got home just past 8 o'clock. The sun had finally disappeared beyond the horizon, 
but it wasn't fully dark yet. Just that dusty purple color of the sky gets before it finally accepts that it's nighttime. Mom was not home yet, so we got the dog some water and we locked the doors and ate a late dinner and we relaxed in the living room, talking about things that really didn't matter. It was almost 9.30 when the scariest part of the ordeal happened. There, Kira and I were, sitting on different couches, talking about something or other, when we noticed the ceiling briefly light up over where Kira was sitting. An important note here is that Kira was sitting on the small couch with her back to the window that faces the front of the house, while I was on a couch on the opposite wall where I could see a sliver of the front porch. Likewise, right next to Kira was our front door, which has three small rectangular windows in it. Due to our long, slightly curved driveway, it's common to see headlights stream through that window, light up the ceiling, fade, then intensify. It means somebody was just coming home. So when the ceiling above Kira lit up, we thought nothing of it, assuming mom was finally coming back from wherever she was that night, and we didn't take any notice of the light skipping the final arc of somebody pulling up all the way in the driveway either. We also didn't pay any mind to know how long it was for mom to come inside. Mom has a habit of pulling in, checking her phone for God knows how long before she comes inside. After a couple of minutes, I noticed the small motion sensor light mom set up on the porch light up. Again, I could only see a sliver of space based on my position and the curtains. Basically, I could see a smidge of the table and the rails bordering our porch, but not its stairs or anything, approaching the door, depending on how they approached it. I wasn't paying much attention either, because I assumed it was my mom. Right after the light went off, we both heard the storm door open again, but we didn't hear anyone pressing the code keys of our lock or jiggling the door handle like mom usually does right away. The moment the storm door creaked open, our two dogs jumped up and ran to the door, barking like mad. Our golden greyhound mix, Calvin, has a deep, scary bark, which contradicts his adorable appearance. Samson, our dumb goofball son who is incapable of hurting a fly but a big boy, jumps up on his hind legs and scrambles and perches on one of the small windows in a desperate attempt to see who's outside. Immediately, the storm door slammed shut, and we heard heavy footsteps on the cement of our porch. Calvin started going nuts, and jumped on Kira's couch, standing on its back instead of the cushions to look out the window. Samson ran out of the room, and went to the doggy door that leads to the back porch, which has a ramp going down into a fenced-off portion of our yard. I couldn't move. I had never understood, really, what it meant when people described their limbs turning to lead at that moment. It felt like I didn't have limbs, really, like moving wasn't an option. If I moved, I might glimpse something, or someone, through the windows. The person could see me running around the house freaking out and decided to come after us after all. So I sat there, my mind steadily going blank as my heart sped up and limbs refused to move. In the game of fight, flight, or freeze, I'm the freezer. Kira, on the other hand, is a fighter. She spins around and looks out the window, but can't see anything because, besides the motion light on the porch, it's too dark. So naturally, she gets up, grabs a stray dog toy that just so happens to be a tug-of-war rope with one ball on the end, and she opens the door. I tell her very calmly to shut the door and stay inside. She ignores me and stepped out onto the porch. She comes back inside after not seeing anything, but to my utter disbelief, she disappears to the kitchen and comes back with a knife and goes outside again. This time she's gone for a handful of seconds before running back inside and slamming the door shut. Breathless, she tells me she went out for a bit into the yard and saw the outline of a man by the dog run that we don't use anymore. When she saw him and froze, he moved. This time she listened to me when I told her to lock the door. I managed to call my mom, despite my head being empty and my limbs being lead, and she convinced me to get up and make sure all the doors were locked, including the basement, and making sure the dogs were inside. I ended up making Kira go into the fenced up section to drag Samson back inside, because I couldn't get my legs to move after thinking about doing it myself. Cowardly, I know. After mom got home and looked around, she found nothing. We called the non-emergency number for the police, not wanting to bother them in case we were overreacting. 
Two police officers came by and walked around the yard and they found nothing. We got the sense that they didn't believe us, but instead saw us as two overexcited girls with exaggerated imaginations. Still, they humored us and told us after we told them about the park that if we think anyone might be following us, or if someone's acting a little bit too creepy, not to drive straight home and to check if anybody's following us. And then they left. To this day, I'm pretty sure the only people who believe someone with malicious intent came to our homes in hopes of finding two teenage girls is Kira and me. Though, whether or not whoever it was was the guy from the park, we aren't sure. But it's too coincidental, isn't it? That the day that we have multiple encounters with this guy who goes out of his way to get close to us and a car inching belong behind us, we also have an almost intruder encounter? Plus, there were too many details that didn't add up to us having an overexcited imagination. We both saw headlights. The motion detector on the porch turned on. The storm door opened and stayed open until Samson jumped up to look out the door's window. It's a very noisy door and makes sounds when opening and closing. We heard footsteps. Kira saw someone. And the dogs don't run up to the door like that and bark their heads off if nobody's there. I don't know if whoever was at our house was the same guy that we ran into at the park. If it was, I don't know if the reason he cut in front of us as close as he did was to test our dog's reaction to him, and then not caring at all or, the first time, wagging their tails convinced him that they weren't a threat. I don't know if he was in the car that inched behind us and stopped when we stopped. I don't know what could have happened if Calvin didn't have a scary manic bark, or if Samson wasn't tall enough to look out the high windows of the door. I don't know much of anything, but what I do know is this, if you're out and about minding your own business and a stranger is taking a lot of notice to you, following you, frequently running into you or whatever, trust your gut. Don't drive or walk straight home, meander, get to a public space or just take your time. Pay attention to your surroundings. You never know who is watching you. I was 17 when this happened. I had an early morning shift in a restaurant, and I used to bus to get there. When I got to my bus stop, somebody was already there. That was strange because it was so early in the morning. I started to walk to my workplace just to notice that the man started following me. Seeing the man following me got me scared and I started to run. There was so much off with this guy. The whole time he looked at the ground but also started to run when he saw me running. I quickly ran to the back doors and saw him coming the same direction. When I closed the doors, he was just a couple meters away from me, and I saw that he tried to open the locked door after me. When I was panicking inside the restaurant, my co-workers came to me and said that somebody is trying all the windows to get in. We called the police, and later they told us that the man was carrying a tiny saw with him. Sometimes I wonder what he would have done if he would have been quicker than me. This happened a month ago in Tokyo, Japan. I am a 28-year-old white American woman from Alaska. I am slightly above average height for a woman my age, and I am by no means tiny, though I am not particularly fat or buff either. My point of mentioning that is that I wouldn't be an easy target to just scoop up and kidnap. I also have a lot of distinctive identifying features. My waist length, hair is currently half blonde, half dark brown, and I have visible tattoos all over my upper body including on both of my arms. Last month, I was in Japan for two and a half weeks with my fiancé and some family and several of our mutual friends. The whole group was about 12 people. I speak Japanese fluently, and I am a well-traveled person and consider myself to be pretty street smart and able to take care of myself. So while I did not wander off alone much on this trip, I wasn't concerned if I did have to go somewhere by myself. It was Friday night during Golden Week in Tokyo, the day before we were leaving to come back to the States, and our group was going to go out drinking on our last night. The area we were staying in wasn't the nicest, but it wasn't particularly bad either. Just more dirty than other areas in Tokyo, and with a lot more tourists, and more homeless people. Each night when we would go out, the men in our group would be openly propositioned by prostitutes, and there were often people just passed out on the streets. Things like that. So on the last night, we were all going to meet up in front of our hotel, a large, nice hotel in the main city center, to go out. And I happened to be the first person there. 
Now, while I wasn't with my group or the people that I know, I was in no means alone. There were hundreds of people around, as this was a very populated area, and I was standing on the sidewalk in front of the hotel. A man suddenly approached me, and the first thing that put my guard up was how close he got to me. Again, this was a crowded area, but by no means crowded or noisy enough that he needed to be five inches away from my face, which he was. He was a black man and looked to be around my age, probably between 25 to 35. He immediately started asking me questions, and I got more suspicious and on edge with each question. This is how the conversation went. He says, hello, where are you from? I say I'm from Alaska. He looks visibly excited with this crazy look in his eyes. Oh, an American. I say, yes, where are you from? Ghana, are you here alone? I said, no, I'm with about 15 people, including my husband and my dad. They're in the shop right there. In reality, I was with 12 people, including my fiance. My dad was not there, and none of the group was in the nearby shop. The man says, what hotel are you staying at? I said, I don't know the name of it. It's across the city, which was also a lie as we were standing in front of the hotel I was staying at. He asks how old I was. I tell him 35, which again was also a lie. I was trying to say I was as old as possible while having it be believable. And then he says, come with me. I reply with, yeah, no thanks. And at this point I began to turn and walk away. He says, yes, come with me. We'll take something. I said, nope, bye. I then began walking towards one of the nearby shops at a fast pace. And then he says, muttering now, take something, wake up in paradise. Luckily, he did not follow me, and I waited for my group inside the store that I went into to get away from him. I immediately messaged our group and to my fiancé, and another one of the men came down immediately. This incident was particularly scary because a couple of people on the trip with us don't have a radar for this kind of thing, and it makes me feel sick to think what might have happened if they had been the one being propositioned instead of me. Also, I know I should have stopped talking to the guy sooner. I was just kind of frozen, and at the beginning, I thought he might just be a regular guy trying to hit on me, in which I planned to kindly turn him down. Asking where I'm from didn't strike me as too weird on its own, but his next lines of questioning were an enormous red flag. Notice that in the whole conversation, he never once asked my name, or if I was married or with somebody, which you would expect someone to do if they were just trying to hit on you. Also keep in mind that this happened in one of the safest countries in the world. The moral of the story is you can never be too careful, especially as a young woman. Keep your wits about you, and don't feel bad for blowing off strangers. Also, if something seems off, don't give out your real information. I shouldn't have even told him about the actual state I lived in, but luckily I realized that he was sketchy after doing that, and I didn't give him any more real information. When I was a senior in college a few years ago, I lived in an old house about a five minute walk from my campus with five of my girlfriends. It was still COVID times, so we spent a lot of time just in the house since we really couldn't go anywhere else. To preface this story, this house was old and many of the windows did not lock. Our landlord sucked, as many college ones do, and did not do anything to fix the issue. But with it being six of us, and often a boyfriend or two sleeping in the house. It felt mostly safe, and many of us would keep our windows open. Our college was in a town just outside of the second most dangerous city in the state, but right around the campus it felt relatively safe. When the weather started getting warmer in early spring, we would sit out on the roof to sunbathe, and this roof faced our street. Let's call my roommate Mary. We would access the roof from her bedroom window on the second floor, since it led straight to the roof. Our street was residential and did not get a ton of traffic, but we did have a couple of encounters of younger guys catcalling us as they drove by. But nothing seemed sinister as we were just college kids. One night, late in the semester, Mary went up to her room to call her brother while the rest of us were hanging around downstairs. That's when she rushed downstairs and said that she saw a ladder leading up to the roof where we would all sunbathe and right near her window, which was open. Later, we learned that she said out loud to her brother what she saw before she came down. When she told us this, my other roommate and her boyfriend ran outside to find a man running away from our house with the ladder, 
We assumed he heard Mary telling her brother that she saw the ladder and he knew he was caught. It was dark so they could not make out anything about him. I immediately texted our landlord, asking if he had somebody come by the house to do any work, and he said no. We then called the police who came by. They did some investigating and patrolled our house for a couple of nights, but we never found out who the man was, what his intentions were, or if he had been there before, or if he'll be there again. This story takes place three years ago. I was a 21-year-old female, and I went on vacation with my family. We stayed in a hotel resort right next to the beach. Every night my family and I went for a drink or an evening stroll on the promenade. The promenade itself was always filled with lots of people, especially couples enjoying a beautiful evening walk. On the third day, I couldn't sleep. My brother was still awake, but we had a fight earlier so I didn't ask him to come on my walk. Now before you think I was being stupid, it was midnight and still the promenade was filled with people. So I put on some loose pants and a shirt, nothing fancy, and I went on a walk. Normally I'm quite aware of my surroundings, especially at night. But since there were still so many people around, I put on my headphones and I listened to some relaxing music. The walk started off great. I was watching the beautiful nightlife on the promenade and the other resorts. After 30 minutes, I went to sit on a bench to tie my shoelaces. In the corner of my eye, I noticed a man as well stopping and sitting on the bench two benches from me. I didn't find it suspicious yet. I started to walk again, and then I noticed that the man also got up and started walking about 20 meters behind me. I slowed down my pace and put my earphones in my pocket. I was getting suspicious, but wanted to know for sure. Again, I stopped and pretended to search for something on my phone. He stopped as well. The problem with the promenade is that it's one long line, so I had to pass the creepy man to get back to my hotel. Since I was still surrounded by people, I did feel somewhat safe. In my head, I had the most genius plan to go down to the beach and hide behind one of the beach chairs. The beach was pitch black, and in my mind, this was the best solution. I started to speed up. The creepy man did not match my pace. Then a big group of people passed by, and I made a run to the beach, and I hid. Thirty seconds later, I saw him looking from the promenade in my direction. He was searching for me. I was hoping he had given up, but he started making his way towards the beach chairs. That moment I didn't think. I started to run on the beach. Once I was far enough, I went back to the promenade and I sprinted. Completely soaked in sweat, I stopped in front of my hotel and I looked back. I had lost the creepy man. I rushed back to my room. That was the only and last time I went walking alone. I know I should have asked for help from the people around me. So just because you are surrounded by people, don't think you're safe. This actually happened a few hours ago. I'm so unsettled about the whole encounter. I decided to tell my story right now to get it out of my system. I've had creeps tailgate me or try to grab my attention on the road and I just ignore them, which has always worked, but this guy takes the golden medal. My shift starts in the afternoon, and I was feeling off for most of the day. A beautiful sunny day, mind you. You know, one of those days where you drag yourself out of your bed to go be an adult? I decided to lift my mood up, so I wore something new that I'd bought in. A beautiful creamy white fur vest, and I hit the road. I looked like a million bucks. Felt like a million bucks. I played some piano tracks in hope that I will get out of this funk. I just needed something to comfort me, and those two things didn't cut it. While I was driving to work, I decided to grab a drink. An iced crisp green tea will definitely lift my spirit. There were two branches of a famous coffee shop. You know who, a grinning mermaid who's playing Twister, ring the bell? I could have gone to the first one with the drive through but they use a pretty crappy tea brand as they ran out of the good stuff. So I had to go with the one that was inside a mall. Anything to feel better, right? I parked my car and I saw a private fleet of black SUVs, making it difficult to view the entrance. This is important for later in the story. I grabbed a cold bottle of water and I headed to the counter. I paid for my drink. I got a cherry lollipop, because why not? I waited for my drink, and once I got it, I started walking out. 
I had to pass a fountain in the courtyard before I could reach the exit. I slowed my pace as I noticed that I was walking way too fast. I felt a bit off, but I brushed it off. As I passed between the SUVs, a bus shot through quickly. I stopped in shock as I almost got hit walking in its path. This didn't make me realize what was happening as I got distracted and wasn't aware of my surroundings. As I walked further, I had to pass an area where there isn't anyone. It was shaded but still outdoors, almost like under a bridge style building, if that makes sense. This was the way to my car. I noticed that I wasn't aware of my surroundings until I heard the footsteps on my right. Then I saw a man in my peripheral vision, walking and matching my speed. At first I thought he was in a uniform, so I assumed he was part of the cleaning staff in the mall. I felt off, but I told myself that I'm just being paranoid and overthinking. Next to my car, and on my left side, was a woman with a child who were getting into their car. This will all make sense later. I was sandwiched between my car and hers. I was getting my keys out of my fur vest, and then I had to turn around in order to open my driver's side door, as I was a bit ahead of it. Once I turned, I saw a man standing, looking to be in his late thirties. Average height, skinny. He had a dark blue baseball cap with sunglasses, a gray shirt with some print on it, and black sweatpants. He was wearing Crocs with socks. He was so close that it took me by surprise, and I was startled. But being nice and polite is in my blood, so I assumed nothing. The first thing that he said, why are you afraid? I told him that I wasn't, and asked him what he wanted. Is your car for sale? He said while grinning. I said no. Then he started to ask about how my day was going, and stuff along those lines. What the heck was going on? I don't know him. Alarm bells were ringing in my head. I smiled as to not escalate the situation, but I knew I had to do something. He was blocking my way to the mall entrance, and I decided to go the other way, which is a pretty large shaded parking lot with few people here and there. I said, it was nice to meet you, but I have to leave. Give me your phone number, he said bluntly. I just repeated the same phrase and took a step closer to my door, as I didn't want to show him that I was afraid. I was shitting bricks at that moment. Then he said something that made me want to crawl out of my skin. Give me your phone number so I don't have to chase you around in my car. At this moment, I knew I had to move fast, so I opened my door and I ignored him. He kept talking, and I wasn't sure what he was saying as it felt muffled. My anxiety was higher than the tip of Mount Everest, and I was hit with this realization that even in public spaces and in broad daylight with people around, you can't lose your sense of safety in a split second. I closed the door quickly and I locked it. My fingers felt weak, but I managed to turn the car around. He kept knocking on my window. He was so insistent. I put my car in reverse mode, but I couldn't back out. The woman was halfway getting out of her parking spot, thus forcing me to wait. He kept knocking pretty hard and saying stuff. At that moment, I honestly couldn't hear him. All I wanted was to get out of there. I was so afraid and baffled. I had to look at the window to see when the road will get clear so I could back out while he was standing in front of my window, rapidly banging on it. I avoided making eye contact with him. Once the road was clear, I hit the gas pedal, and I sped off. I drove to random places, while my eyes are fixated on my rearview mirror to make sure he wasn't following me. It was so hard to breathe as my chest felt so heavy, and my heart was beating out of my chest. I was glad he wasn't there. This creep followed me around the mall and waited for the right moment I was alone, and threatened me to give my phone number to him, and was totally unaware of how much of a creep he was. Needless to say, my therapist will definitely be hearing about this. I'm currently living in my SUV right now, and last night around 12am I parked in a Walmart parking lot to get some sleep. It was one of the worst days I've had in a long time, and I was absolutely exhausted. So when I got into the back of my SUV, I fell asleep right away, unfortunately forgetting to lock my doors. I've always been a very light sleeper, and I'm thankful I am, because somehow I woke up, turned around in my makeshift bed to face whoever was now sitting in the driver's seat of my car, looking directly at me. This is where the story somehow gets kind of funny, because I was so tired and in such a daze 
All I did was continue to shake my head back and forth and say, nope, while reaching across this person's lap and opening the door for them and gesturing them to leave. I don't know whoever got in my car last night, but thank you for leaving. This happened back when I was 11 or 12 years old. It was the beginning of summer, and I begged my mom to go to the water park in the next town. She couldn't drive, so she arranged for her friend to drop me off and pick me up after. I was a decent swimmer, and had been alone a couple times before. My mom had given me the money for the admission, and a little bit extra to get a drink and a snack from the vending machines. I arrived and got changed, putting my bag in a locker and strapping the key around my ankle. I couldn't wait to get on the slides. There weren't too many people there as it was an early evening, around 6 p.m., so I got on all the slides relatively quickly. My favorite was the river rapid slide. On this slide, you would slide down the small sections of the slide, splashing into small pools in between. You were supposed to use a rubber ring, but most kids and some adults didn't bother. No one ever worked on the slides anyways, so it was a bit of a free fall. I went down the river rapid slide for the fourth or fifth time and splashed into the first pool. I mucked around there for a bit before walking towards the next section of the slide. I was completely alone on the slide, or so I thought. The next pool after this section of the slide was dark and enclosed. I like to sit in there sometimes and relax before finishing the ride. However, this time, someone was already in there. A larger woman in her 30s or 40s, laying on her stomach with her feet over the last section of the slide. Her head was peeking above the water. She was cackling loudly, hysterically, a guttural laugh. She looked me dead in the eyes and pushed herself down the last section of the slide, still laughing as it echoed off in the slide walls. I was thoroughly freaked out and waited five minutes before sliding down so I did not have to encounter her at the bottom. Presuming it was a random freak coincidence, I went straight back on the slide. Again, no one else was around. I rode the first section normally before apprehensively sliding the second section into the dark cave pool. I heard it again, that creepy, genuine, hysterical laughter. There she was, the same woman from before grinning and laughing while staring straight at me. She again flushed herself down the slide, leaving me alone. I decided I wasn't going to ride the river rapid slide again that visit. She petrified me. I decided to go on the black hole next. It was a one-person slide. You were supposed to wait for the light to go green before sliding, so I figured I would be okay. I flung myself into the black abyss of the tube ride. However, I heard the second thud behind me. I turned around, I turned around, and in the darkness, my worst fears were confirmed. I saw the shadowy figure of an overweight middle-aged woman following me down the slide, and once again, she started laughing loud and hard. The kind of laugh where you can barely pause for a breath, as if you have seen the funniest show you can imagine. I have never been more terrified in my life. I panicked, slamming my hands down on the floor of the slide and pushing in an attempt to make myself go faster. It worked a little, but she was never far behind, cackling away. When I reached the bottom, I threw myself out the landing strip area, grazing my knee. I ran to the changing rooms, not looking back. I locked myself in a stall and removed the key from my ankle before running out and grabbing my stuff and going straight back in. I got changed and I bolted from the building and called my mom. She sent her friend to pick me up right away. I hope I never see that lady again, because her cackling laughter still haunts my dreams. This story took place back in 2019, but still remains in the back of my mind. I worked at Chick-fil-A. That night I was supposed to close, but I left around 8 p.m. I already know I'm going to spend around 30 to 45 minutes driving around to my usual Pokemon stops. At 8 p.m. on a Wednesday, there's some cars on the roads, but not many. Smaller town with little police present. Not much crime happens here. I've done this before. I know which spots to go to. I'm driving to the spots I know I can reach from the inside of my car. I just got off work from standing and being busy all day. I wasn't about to go walking around when it was dark outside anyways. The places I know have little to no cars at them. 
I pull into the parking lot by the high school field, spin the stops, and click on a few Pokemon. I get ready to pull on the residential street. I'm kind of just sitting at the stop sign for a bit. No cars behind me. I'm not really in a hurry. I turn on my blinker, and then I turn left onto a street. I see two cars in front of me, an older white SUV and a sedan in front of that. They're about four blocks ahead. I notice the SUV isn't really in its lane. It's driving in the middle of the road like it wants to pass the sedan. It definitely could have just passed it. The road was very wide, with no oncoming cars. I'm glancing down at my phone and the cup holder, trying not to go too fast. Then I notice the white SUV that was driving in the middle of the road is driving very slow on the shoulder of the road. Maybe they notice me, wondering what I'm doing. Maybe I'm weirding them out. I click my phone shut and drive normally. I'm nearly behind the SUV now and it speeds up quickly, takes a hard right turn onto a street. I see the SUV pull into a driveway. As I'm passing the side street, I see the SUV going in reverse and now it's backing out of that driveway. I'm behind the other sedan now at a four-way stop. In my rear view mirror, the white SUV is turning back onto the street. It's now going behind me. The sedan waits its turn at the four-way stop and then turns left. I wait my turn, then go straight. I'm watching to see if the white SUV goes straight as well, and it does. The SUV had to wait its turn at the four-way stop, so I'm a good four to six blocks ahead of it on this residential street. I want to lose this car, so I'm going around 30 miles per hour when the speed limit is maybe 20 to 25. I turn behind the church strip mall. The church has a playground behind it, but it's pretty much an alleyway. I lost the SUV. I stopped in the alley, waiting, looking in my side mirror, and sure enough, the white SUV is barreling down the street. It almost passes me, it was going so fast, but it spots me and turns into the alley where I'm parked, coming towards my car. I'm freaking out at this point. The alley is dark, no street lights. The store is in a strip mall, and they're all abandoned, but the church is on the other side, and it's well lit, so I want to go over there. I speed down the alley and around the building. The SUV is doing the same thing. I turn around the building, can't see them in my rear view. I stop my car and park in front of the well-lit church doors, basically parked in the fire lane. I'm watching my rear view mirror, waiting for this car. I know it's back there and it's going to drive around me. They'll see it was all just a misunderstanding. The SUV is there. It peeks around the building corner. They stop and wait a little bit before it turns towards where I'm parked. The SUV slowly drives by my car. They pass me slowly and I don't want to look at them. From my peripheral vision, I just see one outline in the driver's seat. As they pass me, I can feel this person's eyes on me and can see their head turning. I'm uncomfortable, but I don't want to start a conversation with them, so I don't roll down my windows, and I do not want to look at them. I don't want to acknowledge them. I really just want them to see I'm not who they probably thought I was. They pass me completely, and the SUV starts to drive towards the exit of the parking lot, but then the SUV starts to circle around again, making a big loop around in the empty church parking lot. My body fills with dread. I'm actually scared now. I gave them the benefit of the doubt, and now they're coming back around. I don't want to know what they want anymore. When they start to circle back around, I take off out of that parking lot, but so do they. My car bottoms out, and I speed down the street, and so does theirs. The police station is way out near the countryside on the outskirts of town, but there's a police annex on this street. Sometimes there's police parked out front. I know I'm just going to park there and if they're still following me, I'm going to call 911. This car is following me 100%. They've turned when I've turned, sped when I've sped, and as I turn my blinker and take a right into the annex, they turn left, and they're gone. I told my friends and family about this quickly after. No one I knew drove that kind of car. It was also an older model, so I don't think it could have been a rental. I don't know anyone who would do this to me and think it was funny. I did make a police report, but didn't get a license plate, so they really couldn't do anything. I also know what kind of car it was. I would notice any older white SUVs for months after, but I never saw that exact car again. 
I rarely tell this story for obvious reasons. I understand fully if you do not believe me. I respect your opinion. In 2006, when several of the buildings of the Intermountain Indian Schools in Brigham, Utah were still up, several friends and I had gone up three or four times. The last time we went up, we were looking for a way into the catacombs from a different building than we had before. We tried the stairwells, but the doors were all nailed shut, and trying to break them open was loud. Very loud. Remembering that in the main hall, there was a trap door in the floor, we decided to try there. It was a dead end. Basically just a tiny boiler room. My son's father and I were the first ones back up, while the others decided, hey, this is a great place to load a new bowl, because they were potheads. Anyways, we were looking around, shining our flashlights on random things, and we catch a glimpse of what we think is a person at the end of the hallway. We freeze, kind of think we're tripping. It's dark, we're slightly high, and if someone is here, it's probably more stupid kids or a homeless person. If it's a homeless person, we should probably leave. They're territorial, so they don't get caught and kicked out of the shelter. My son's father turns to holler down that we need to go, and our flashlight catches that thing again. I can see it clearly and hit his arm to get his attention. He turns and looks and freezes. So here's where we start to sound, well, crazy. This thing, yes, thing, was peeking around a wall at the end of the hall. It had maybe shoulder-length black hair that was, I was assuming, greasy, because it looked wet. In this moment, it looked like it was average height. Ever seen Pink Floyd's The Wall? Its face looked like the mask that the kids wore and another brick in the wall. I'm chalking this detail up to the distance between us and it at this point. First friend behind us out of the boiler room is V. V is Navajo. Her and I have been very good friends since the fifth grade. I grew up hearing the many stories about how her grandfather double-crossed an accused skinwalker on the reservation in New Mexico, and how her family has been followed and messed with since, no matter where they have gone. Why we thought it would be a good idea to bring her with us is lost on me. Anything we did of this nature that included her or her sister always went creepily effing sideways, including Mount Olivet Cemetery in SLC two years ago. So V comes up and asks what the F we're looking at. We tell her we're not sure, because we have no freaking clue at this point. She looks down the hall. This thing gets freaking cocky, like it's arrogant. It straightens up and steps into the middle of the hallway. It's naked and tall. It would be even taller if it had normal legs. Not legs that bent backwards at the knees, like a horse. But now the other five people with us are out of the boiler room and it screams and it books it down the hall in the direction it came from. I've never seen people run so fast in my life. And the truth be told, I'm happy that the remaining buildings are gone. My family goes to Bear Lake every summer and had to drive by them. I had to make sure I had my Xanax or sleep for that part of the ride so I wouldn't have a panic attack. First, a little backstory. I live in a small city in Oregon, right at the outskirts, which happens to be in the woods. It's very peaceful, actually. Most of my family is afraid to visit due to bears and other forest creatures invading my property. I've always told them how unreasonable that is because I almost never get bears or raccoons. It's been nearly three months since I found a raccoon in my garbage. They still refuse to visit, and I don't know why. I'm starting to suspect it's really not at all the animals I never get, but something else. I started doing some research on what scary creatures lived in dense forests and in my area. All I could find were cryptids and creepypastas. I didn't understand how someone could be so freaked out over an urban legend. I brush it all off and just decide that they're simply not interested in visiting me. Cassie! I call for my dog. The sun would start setting soon, and I needed to get our walk in before it was too dark. She rushed in, her tail swinging happily. I clip her leash to the collar, grab some dog bags, 
and we head to the trail about a half a mile away from the house. It's always been hers and my favorite spot to take walks. As I let my mind wander, I thought back to the creatures I learned about before, and one really stuck out to me. The Siren Head was its name. I pull out the article again and look at the fact sheet included. Around 38 to 43 feet in height. Some sightings rumored to be nearly 50. It read, it can mimic air raid, tornado, weather alert, and amber alert sirens. It can also mimic human speech, mostly the victim's loved ones. That sent a shiver down my spine. The thought of walking in the forest and hearing a familiar voice call to me was odd. I shake my head and sigh heavily. It's just to scare me. It's not real. I say aloud and keep reading, letting Cassie happily wander a ways ahead of me. It could stand still for days at a time while hunting. While sleeping, it sounds like white noise. And if agitated, the wires that are embedded into the tall, bony frame pulse and the large speakers shout random words and phrases. It's a very interesting creature, but I couldn't understand how so many people thought this thing was real. It even explained it was art created by somebody named Trevor Henderson. I went over to his Instagram to discover just how many creatures he's really made. Smile Room, Cartoon Cat, Little Nugget, Big Charlie, and Long Horse, just to name a few. He was very creative in writing backstories to caption the images. A clap of thunder brought me back to reality and Cassie whined. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on, let's get you home. I turned to face the opposite direction and realized there was no path. Cassie must have led me off the trail while I was invested in the article. My heart starts beating rapidly. I never lose tales so easily. Lesson learned, Jen. Never get distracted on your phone in the forest. I tell myself as I turn the flashlight on to find the trail. The sun had began to set and it was getting a lot darker. I decided to open up maps to see where I was, but service had cut out and I was at a loss. I thought tracing my steps back would help, as my dog I'm with was bred to be a hunter, but she was too scared of the thunder to help me. I was on my own for now. I start backtracking and eventually reach a small path. It wasn't too familiar, but I had a sense of direction and knew the opening was to the east so I turned that way. As I began walking, I hear what sounds like rain falling onto the leaves of the top of the trees, but I didn't feel anything. Sorry, Cassie. You might get a little wet when we get out of here, I say to my worried dog, who had her tail tucked between her legs and was very close to my feet. I keep walking, but the trail seemed to go on forever. Maybe I picked the wrong direction. I decide to turn around and go the opposite way. I'd never gotten so lost before. I was beginning to worry. I checked to see if I had gotten service back, but I was completely gone. All of a sudden it came back and my phone buzzed quickly, a loud alert coming from it. Weather warning. That's not good. I need to get home. I dismiss the alert, but the alarm still sounds and my body gets cold. I look around my surroundings for any mishap in trees, but they all blend together. It was nearly impossible to tell where one tree ended and the other began. Crap! I curse and I pick up my pace, walking down the trail. The feeling of being watched never went away long after the alarm had stopped sounding. What feels like hours pass by and I find an exit. I cry out in relief and I step out, continuing to walk quickly back to my place. I suddenly jerked backwards by Cassie, staying very still. Cassie, come on, we need to go home. But she didn't budge. She just stared in horror and growled softly at a thin tree that looked long dead and had thin branches hanging down beside us. Cassie, it's a tree. Calm down and let's go home. I bend down to pick her up and then I hear my husband's voice beside me. Jen? Jen, where have you been? Thomas? Where are you? I spin in a circle and I don't see him anywhere. His voice sounded close, yet distant. I then hear an echoey detail of it, and I got pale again. I stare at what I thought was a tree, but it was really the monster's legs I researched. Thomas's voice speaks again, this time sounding farther away. 
Come to me, Jen. You'll be safe. When I stay still, it begins to sound agitated. Come on, Jen. You'll be safe. Come. I couldn't move. I was so shocked and horrified to discover that the reason no one visited was definitely real. Another weather alert sounds as I hear tree branches being snapped and tossed aside like toys. The creature stalked closer and didn't stop emitting the sirens at me. I finally come to my senses and I run, but this thing's long stride caused it to catch up easily. I was snatched up and the sirens grew louder until I couldn't hear myself think. As Cassie and I were raised all the way to its metal head, the sirens swiveled to face us. Even though I had no eyes, I could feel it seeing. Its frequency changed to a peaceful song as large, lipless, human-like teeth grew from the top siren, and a long snake-like tongue slithered out of its mouth. The tongue wrapped around my neck and brought me to its mouth. As I faced my last moments, I remember how I never got to say goodbye to my family, and they'll never find out what happened. I let tears fall, and I sob as the thing crunches down on my bones, now emitting my own cries of fear as I fall into the dark pit that I now knew as death. In Pennsylvania, right near the border into Delaware, there is a narrow, eerie place with deformed trees, closed off paths, and lots of legends. It is formerly known as Devil's Road, the main attraction in a place called Satansville. It was written about in the book Weird Pennsylvania, which highlights the creepy places of the state. According to many rumors, there is a cult house hidden in the woods surrounding the road, and any trespassers on the road, especially those who stop, will be chased out with a black or white SUV or truck. For years, I had read about the place and heard spine-chilling stories until I couldn't stop thinking about seeing it for myself. My friend Matt and I spent almost every Friday night at the mall together, as teenagers do. As expected, it can get pretty boring fast, especially with no money to actually have a motive to shop around for anything other than disappointment. Visiting Satansville without telling our parents became another weekly tradition of sorts, after he told me about his experience a month before our first visit. He had told me that when he visited with his guy friends, his phone service completely cut out, leaving them without Google Maps in a potentially dangerous, unclear area that was already scarcely mapped. Soon after, he told me, a black truck came off of a dirt road and followed close behind them until they found the main road. It wasn't much, but it was enough for me to be hooked. Not too much happened on our first few trips. We would see other cars rarely, as it's a hidden road that is no longer marked due to excessive theft of the street sign. Occasionally, the cars would be black in color, and we would get a rush of adrenaline. It was fun, but not exactly terrifying, until one night. We finished up at the mall around 6, and we left with enough time to circle around once or twice with daylight and the remainder of the time in the dark. It was about a 40-minute drive to Satansville from the mall, and I was tingling with excitement. According to the legends, cars that visit frequently are more likely to have experiences at this place, and this would be our third time visiting in the last few weeks. Instead of Matt and I going alone this time, we brought our friend Lola, who was very outgoing and would likely have a sense of humor in a situation that we'd be too scared to continue in normally. We drove down the highway and finally made the first turn leading to seclusion. Matt and I had pinpointed several areas where we thought the Colt House may be, but stopping on the road is illegal, so we never had a real chance to explore. At least, that's the logical reason I give in lieu of us being major cowards. The ambience immediately changed as we entered Satansville and the cool night air fled in through the cracked windows. In the first few turns, other people aren't entirely a rare sight. A few trucks pulling out of the driveway. However, the turn onto Devil's Road never loses its wow factor. The trees on the both sides of the narrow road lean away from the forest aggressively, not just a tilt, but completely bending in the trunk away from things we could only imagine. We were approaching the first major bend in the road, and a car was coming up towards us. It was a tight squeeze, 
nearly impossible for two opposing vehicles to pass. The presence of a car alone was enough to cause a twinge in my gut. Matt was focused on squeezing by while turning, and Lola was too busy cracking jokes to see what I saw, but I had never forgotten the face since then. I looked over to the white jeep to my left, and the window was incredibly tinted, but half down. Looking back at me, straight into my eyes, like he'd been looking at me long before I looked at him, was a young man, maybe about 25, with long blonde hair, a deathly pale face, and horribly thin fingers on the steering wheel. He was not at all focused on driving, as his eyes pierced me, and this is the worst part. His neck was completely turned towards me, while the rest of his body was completely straightforward. This may not sound creepy, but it was not normal to bend that way. He said something, but I couldn't hear him over Lola and Matt laughing at her antics. I couldn't break his gaze. I was stuck staring at him until finally Matt passed the bend and he was gone. I kept checking the rearview windows, terrified with a feeling I'd never quite felt before. When I could no longer see the Jeep, though it felt as though he could still see me, I quietly asked my friends if they seen him. Neither of them had looked at him, nor felt anything unusual. I was pretty unsettled, yet excited to see what else would happen. We turned off of Devil's Road, but we are still in Satansville, preparing to loop back around, when we passed a little shack that always housed two black trucks. There was no sign of any other drivers, and we wanted to stir the pot a little. We stopped for a few moments and honked the horn, flashed our blinkers, and then kept driving. We also blasted Old Town Road for some reason, because that was our peak of comedy at the time. We looped back around and we were back on Devil's Road, when Matt stopped mid-sentence to adjust his mirror. In the darkening distance was a black truck. We giggled with nervous excitement and kept driving. It was exciting, but it kept a reasonable distance. I think we all kind of assumed it was a coincidence. That is, until we turned off of Devil's Road once more and saw that there were no trucks parked by the shack anymore. We lost the truck when we turned on the main road to circle back around again. We circled around two more times, nervous but skeptical, and not much happened other than the white SUV that kept blinking its headlights. I'm not gonna lie, it did freak me out. And the return of one truck to the shack. And this is where it gets really intense. On our fifth loop, we were all very tense. The aura had changed to heavy, and it was completely dark at this point. Things had started to feel more ominous, probably from the slightly less passive actions taken towards us by whoever was there. We went down the bends, peering nervously into the woods. Some trees were marked with 666s and upside-down crosses, marks of other teenagers, and there was a distant light in the woods, courtesy of God knows what. As we turned off Devil's Road, but still in the heart of Satansville, headlights appeared behind us. It was impossible to tell what kind of car it was, as it was pitch black, and we had just turned the first major bend. Moments later, the truck appeared behind us, speeding. We were going about 25, and the truck must have floored it to catch up, and it drove uncomfortably close to us. I was the one to see it first. It was a black truck, windows tinted, and driver unknown. We drove on for a minute, freaking out and turning completely behind us like creepy jeep guy, but more normal. Soon a second truck joined behind it at a fork in the road and they revved their engines as if in communication. The truck sped up, nearly crashing into us, and we were forced to speed up. This continued through many intense twists and turns where our car reached up to 70 at the maximum. They flashed their lights kept speeding up and getting closer. At this point, we were losing our minds. They were definitely either going to run us off the road or catch us and do God knows what. They had these weird red lights on the top of their trucks, and the light was reflecting off of every window in our tiny Honda. Just above a small hill, the main road was visible, and relief flooded us. We panicked again, though, when we realized we have to wait for traffic to slow before we could turn and they would definitely catch us. With nothing else to do, we stopped and glanced behind us, and the trucks were gone. We all expected a sudden ambush, but made the turn onto the highway and started home, talking about what had just happened. 
we came to the conclusion that the trucks had probably turned into a dirt road, only visible to those who know it's there, and that they were chasing us away from their activities like the rumors say. What were they doing exactly? We have no idea, and we had no intention of finding out, as we hadn't been back since. I still can't get the face and presence of the man in the jeep out of my head, and this was over a year ago. I'm currently a 22-year-old female, but this happened to me when I was around 10 years old. When I was 10, I was living with my mom and my older brother, he was 12 at the time, in a small bungalow. Nothing paranormal ever happened in this house, except for maybe this one occasion. I had one of those loft beds, sort of like a bunk bed, but without a bed at the bottom. Instead, there would be a desk or a couch underneath. I also had one of those doorway bead curtains hanging on my bedroom door frame, so whenever somebody walked in or out of my room, you would distinctly hear the beads move around. This will be relevant later. My mom's room was right next to mine, but her door was perpendicular to mine, so I could see her entire door directly from my bed. My brother's room was in the basement at the time. Now, my mom only ever closes her door when she's inside her bedroom sleeping. If she gets up during the night to go to the washroom, her door stays open until she goes back in to go back to sleep. This will also be relevant later. Now for the story. One night I fell asleep and I woke up around 3 a.m. I remember being annoyed that I woke up because I often had a hard time going back to sleep once I woke up. I still had my earbuds in from when I was listening to music while falling asleep. I took them out, rolled them up neatly, and placed them on my little wall-mounted shelf beside my bed. The house was dead quiet, except for the low hum of a refrigerator a few rooms away. I was tossing and turning for a few minutes when I heard a loud bang come from either our kitchen or our living room. The first thing that popped in my mind was that it sounded like a large, heavy cardboard box that had fallen on the floor from a higher point, maybe from the kitchen counter or a table. I was extremely awake now and very alert. I sat up slightly, listening intently for another sound, hopefully sounds of waking from my mom or brother. Maybe my mom was in the kitchen getting some water and dropped something, but her bedroom door was closed, meaning she was in her bedroom, most likely asleep. Maybe it was my brother, but after a moment I didn't hear any other sounds, not even walking, which I would have heard because our house was very small. I decided that something must have fallen on its own due to it being placed on an angle and it finally fell off its surface. I lay back down, facing away from my door, and attempt to go back to sleep. Not even a minute later, I hear my door beads move abruptly, as if somebody smacked them quickly. I jolt up and quickly look towards my bedroom door. There was nothing. My beads were motionless. I decide I must be losing my mind, and I'm just hearing things due to adrenaline. So once again, I attempt to go back to sleep this time facing my door out of paranoia. About two minutes later, I hear someone full out running in my basement. We were doing renovations in the basement at the time, so our basement floors were plywood subflooring, which were quite loud if you walked, let alone ran on them. My eyes shot wide open when I heard this. I sat up again, quietly, and listened closely for any other sounds. Then I hear somebody running in the basement for a second time, all I could think was, why in the world would my brother be running around in a basement at 3 in the morning? My brother has Asperger's and therefore behaves in very specific and repetitive manner, and he never runs around anywhere, let alone at 3 o'clock in the morning. I try to stay calm, and I try not to think of the worst, a break-in. I listen intently for several minutes. Because of the small size of our house and the plywood subflooring, I could hear if somebody was walking in the basement but I heard nothing else. I wanted to call for my mom or run to her room, but I didn't dare move or make a sound. If it was an intruder, they most likely just wanted to steal some stuff, and I didn't want to give them any reason to come upstairs and potentially hurt my mom. She was a single mother with two young kids, with no means of protection. Self-defense weapons are illegal in my country. I laid back down. It took me several hours to finally fall back to sleep. When I woke up in the morning, 
My mom's door was open, and I heard her and my brother talking in the kitchen, along with cartoons playing in the living room. I got up quickly and went straight to the kitchen to ask them if they heard anything strange last night. Both of them said they did not. I asked if either of them found anything on the kitchen or living room floor that might have fallen in the night. They both said no. I then asked if either of them got up during the night for any reason. Again, looking at me very strangely, they said no. I asked my brother, so you weren't running around in the basement last night? He looked at me in confusion and answered no. Neither my mom nor my brother have ever sleepwalked in their lives. My brother wasn't interested, and he went downstairs to play on his computer as usual. My mom was slightly concerned, so I told her what I heard the night before. We checked the front door, which was locked, and then checked all the windows, which were all closed, locked, and undamaged. I still have no idea what happened that night. No one in my family ever plays pranks, and I can't think of any reason why they would lose a good night's sleep just to scare me. Beside, I have no idea how they would have pulled it off, seeing as how I didn't hear any sounds of walking or anyone returning to their bedrooms at any point. And how would they have made the sound of my beads moving without ever actually moving them? I never found out what happened, but it still rattles my brain. I had just turned 15, and it was the end of the summer. My parents were working. They were administrative and monetary consultants, and my brother was in basketball practice. So I was home alone with my puppy while watching TV. The phone rang. I said, hello? A feminine voice answered and said, hello, are you Martha's son? Uh, yes, my name is OP. Who asks? Oh, it's Janice. Your mom and I have been working together for five years. I have never seen or heard Janice. My parents have always kept their jobs and personal lives miles apart, but I knew who she was. My mom always spoke about her. She was the personal assistant of one of the owners. Oh, Janice? Uh, my mom's not here right now. What can I help you with? Oh, I'm sorry, but Mr. Delgado called me. Your mom and dad are in court. They seem to be in trouble, and he is just arriving there. A fraud allegation, he said. They can't call due to the legal proceedings, but can I have your cell phone number? Mr. Delgado will call you right away, so he can explain better. Yeah, sure. My number is 123-456-789. Don't worry, I'm sure it's nothing serious. Take care. And she ended the call. Don't worry. I was scared. My mom and dad would never commit a crime. Or I didn't think so. Maybe this was a misunderstanding. Before I continue, I must clarify some things. Mr. Delgado was another name I knew. This time, thanks to my dad. He was a junior associate in the same place my parents and Janice worked. And as far as my parents' conversation went, he was a very capable lawyer. My cell phone rang. It was a male voice. Hello, is this OP? Yeah, Mr. Delgado? Yeah, kid, listen to me. We are in quite the trouble. I am here in the court. Your parents are being prosecuted for tax evasion and financial fraud. I am working with bare minimum here and the judge won't let me talk to them, so I need your help. This is a thunder case, so if we don't work fast, we could be in serious problems. What? But my parents would never do anything like that. We haven't done anything illegal. OP, I believe you. I know you are scared, but listen to me. I need your help so you can help mom and dad, all right? Almost crying, I said I will try. Have your parents made some really big purchases recently? Property, a car maybe? House items like a TV, computer, fridges, anything like that? Anything that could set the government alarms about illegal money movement? Well, my dad bought me a computer for my birthday, and my brother got a new iPad. He may have used my dad's credit card. Oh, that's great. That could be part of it. Anything else? Not that I can remember. Maybe they just took an extra large sum of cash from the bank. Do you have access to the safe? Your dad said you have one. Safe? We, we don't have a safe. Not one that I'm aware of. I don't know what you're talking about. Darn, I thought he told you about it. Maybe it's because you're too young. Your brother didn't know either. Have you talked to Josh? I was going to call him, but he rarely answers when he's playing. Yeah, Janice spoke to him before calling you. OP, you can't call your brother nor your parents. These kind of procedures are very sketchy. Your parents' cell phones are held by the police, and I'm sure they are going to track calls. 
They won't trek mine or Janice's because we're their lawyers, but yours are not safe. So please answer only if it's just the two of us. Janice's number is this, and this is mine. Understand? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, I'll call you later. Take care. He hung up. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. Couldn't call anyone. And I just found out my dad was keeping a secret safe from me. What the heck? Since when did my parents manage that kind of money? I waited for an hour. I was just about to call Mr. Delgado when I received a call. The number was Janice. OP, sweetie, how are you? Um, I'm fine. Oh, baby, don't cry. We're going to solve this together. I know this is going to end well. Mr. Delgado was able to speak with your dad, Philip, and they had made a deal with the prosecution. They are going to do a home check to see if there's not any stolen or fraudulent assets, and all of this will be over. Oh, okay, that's amazing, Janice. I know, I know, but that brings us another problem. These break-ins are sometimes done by crooked people, and they will take anything they consider valuable as evidence and will never return it. Your mother fears they will do that, especially to her jewelry and, most importantly, her wedding ring. You need to take it all out, including the computers. We already told the judge about them, and he discarded them as the case. But we don't know if the agents will respect that verdict. Mr. Delgado is going to pick the things up. I said, but wait. I don't know where my mom keeps her jewels or her wedding ring. Janice said they must be in her room. Just look for those you can save. Worry about those that could look suspicious. Okay, but does Mr. Delgado know where I live? Yes, sweetie. He will wait for you in the park on the other side of the street. Be ready in 30 minutes. She hung up, and I did what I was told. I went to my house, searching for anything that looked expensive, and put it in my backpack. I was able to find Mom's ring and other gold jewels. I also packed my brother's laptop and my old computer. Better be safe, I thought. I went to the park and I waited. Mere minutes later, a black SUV made a turn and parked in the other side. A bald man in a suit came out and made signs. When I came close, about three-fourths of the distance between us, my survival instinct finally kicked off. I said, Mr. Delgado? Yes, boy, it's me. That voice on the cell phone, no doubt about that. But there was something off. Mr. Delgado was a junior associate, and my father always said how he was an intelligent young man that would go very far. The guy in front of me was at least in his 40s, not young at all. I stopped, so the man came closer. He said, is there a problem? Are you alright? His fatherly tone was almost enough to put my guards down, almost. Uh, no, no, I'm fine. Well then, let's go. Your parents are waiting. Sorry, what? Where are we going? To court, obviously. You can't be here when the police does the checkup. The alarm has gone off in my head and its volume was just increasing. In that moment, I finally started putting pieces together. Mistakes in their story. Some illogical points they have made. This was wrong. There was something wrong in here. I needed to get away from there as fast as I could, but there was a problem. Mr. Delgado had company. I could see in the SUV there was another man in the driving place. The park was totally empty, and my house was not too far away for a sprint. No one in the streets either. I was alone, until I remembered I was not. Mr. Delgado looked at me very suspiciously, like he knew something had changed. Kid, let's go. I said, oh, my puppy. What? I can't leave my puppy alone. He's just a few months old. But I need to go for him. It's important. We don't have time for the dog. I was making time. I needed him to believe I was still in his game until someone arrived in the area. It was still a public park in summer. It was bound to happen sooner or later. More likely sooner. I think he knew the same. Whoever he was, he knew he couldn't stay long in the open. Fine. Go for the puppy, but give me the backpack. It looks heavy. It will only make you slower. I didn't want to give it to him, but I did. It would at least appease him somehow. If I refused, who knows what he could do. And I went away. I didn't run. I just walked, trying to keep the charade, until I was sure the distance between us was enough. And I speed up. Never have I ran that fast. I didn't know it was possible for me to go that fast. As I was getting farther, I could hear the SUV engine as it started and went its way. I stopped. I was in front of my house and broke apart. I was crying. I shouted, scared, sad, mad. How could I be that stupid? 
My neighbor heard me and came at that moment. She must have thought I was having a panic attack. Well, maybe I was, and she hugged me, trying to calm me down. I told her everything, and she was the one who called my mom. My mom was at her house in 15 minutes after that and hugged me so tight, I was still terrified, and it would still be a long time after the incident. And I still would be, even for a long time after that incident. To this day, I'm unable to answer a phone call of an unknown number without feeling a pain in my stomach. And in general, I hate phone calls. Only text is what I say to everyone I meet. I gave away the equivalent of $5,000 in electronics, jewels, and some spare cash I had found. I gave away my mom's wedding ring and two family heirlooms. I gave away my birthday present and the iPad my brother had spent all year saving for. In that moment, I just hated myself. I hated that I was tricked so easily. Even if my family said the most important thing was that I wasn't hurt, I still saw the pain on losing all the material things, especially mom, that hurt me the most. With time, we were able to understand that this was a very long game we have been involved for for months. How did they know my parents' co-workers' names and jobs? My mom lost a flash drive with lots of documents some weeks prior. She believes on the bus with a lot of job information. Nothing legal, mostly administrative. It is also likely that they got our home telephone from one of those documents. How did they know where we lived? That summer, we had received a lot of calls from different services ex-bank, ex-cell phone line, ex-public service to verify data. Most of the time it was my brother who answered, sometimes my mom or me. We understood that under the pretext, they were able to obtain not only our address, but they verified my parents' name. How did they know I was alone so they could trick me? Same method, with their almost daily calls. They knew who was at home and what time, and were able to pinpoint that most Tuesdays and Thursdays, I was left in the house with nobody else, not even my brother. I also believe they had come to the area at some time, as they knew the park had no security cameras, and that my mom did not use her ring. They created this whole story, almost perfect, but it still had flaws. First, the one that saved me, Mr. Delgado's age. Second, I forgot my mother had just been working in the Buffett for three years. It was impossible she met Janice five years prior. Third, the safe thing. Obviously a general assumption, they may believe every person has one. Fourth, I found weird Mr. Delgado was acting as my parents' lawyer when my uncle, my dad's brother, had always been the one in charge of small legal problems that we had. And fifth, all of their legal chit-chat. I didn't really know our legal system that well, but it's almost impossible that you're taken suddenly to court and judged in less than a day without being able to establish a defense. This is just what I can remember. As this was almost 12 years ago, my conversations with Janice and Mr. Delgado were longer, and I know I had seen more holes in their story once I reviewed them without panic. Sadly, I saw through their lies too late, and when I was already in a very bad position, I was a victim of the millionaire call, a method in which criminals manipulate the most naive and vulnerable people in a household, using an emotional bargain so that they will willingly give up their things or even themselves. The thieves were never caught. The phones they used were fake ones. And without camera footage, the police had nothing to work with. There were no fingerprints or similar because they didn't touch anything that I kept. I was not able to see the SUV plate due to the distance. And Mr. Delgado was an average guy without any identifiable marks. The only good thing that happened that day was that I didn't enter their car. Maybe I won't be writing this if I did. We lived in fear that they would reappear someday as they knew our address, but thank God it didn't happen, and I hope it stays that way. I have a few frightening stories to tell, but this one is playing out right now, so I thought I would share it with you. Last May, my husband, myself, and our two small boys left our farm in the country, and we moved into a posh boutique-style urban apartment building. My husband had recently received a sizable raise after many years with his current company, and we wanted to be closer to his office and to mine. We chose this particular building as it was brand new and offered an array of shopping, eating, and outdoor amenities without ever having to leave the building or surrounding shopping center. We quickly settled in and started enjoying the new change of pace. At first, everything was fine, but about three months into our lease, we noticed that the front office completely changed staff. 
We were upset about the change because two of the receptionists had been personal friends of ours. We asked them why everybody had been let go, but they said they didn't know why. Apparently, corporate had just decided they wanted a change. We were sad to see our friends go, especially our two- and three-year-old boys, who had grown quite fond of their daily visit to the office of milk and cookies. We also noticed that the new staff was mainly comprised of much younger, attractive women. We assumed then that the management company intended to appeal to the college crowd and singles. We were slightly annoyed with the general lack of experience in customer service, but thought that it wasn't the end of the world, and we moved on. Then weird stuff happened. One morning I walked into the living room to find our patio door wide open. It seemed odd because we triple locked it to keep the children from accessing the patio unsupervised. I locked the door and then accused my husband of being absent-minded and leaving it open. He swore that he hadn't touched the door or the locks in days, and I let it go but made a mental note to start checking it every night before bed just in case. About two weeks later, I awoke to the sound of my oldest boy screaming for me somewhere outside of the apartment. When I found him, he was wandering the hallway outside, soaked in urine and utterly terrified. At the time, we were absolutely baffled at how he managed to unlock two locks and a childproof lock cover. When we asked him what happened, he said that a monster was in his room looking at him and he didn't want to move, so he peed in the bed. Honestly, I was so happy he was safe that I just chalked it up to a kid imagination and my husband not locking the door properly again. It never crossed my mind that someone had potentially been inside the apartment and let him out. They would have had to open the door from the outside, and only we have a key. Weird stuff like that kept happening for several more months, and we kept finding reasonable excuses that explained everything away. But then one afternoon, I got a call from the office of our apartment. We had recently installed a ring doorbell to alert us when someone was at the door. It was mostly an attempt to prevent another runaway toddler. The woman from the office asked me if our door camera was operational or just put there to make people think that we had security. I informed her that it was 100% functional and that we installed video surveillance in our nursery and the adjoining bathroom to keep the kids safe. She then asked me a really weird question. She wanted to know if I would add her to our security devices so that she could view our ring footage. Of course, I politely told her that that was not going to happen. I asked her why she wanted it, but never got a clear answer. I told my husband about the call later that night, and he agreed that we should make an effort to always keep the ring charged and recording to the cloud. We did, and things seemed fine for a while. Over the course of our release, the doors have continued to occasionally, magically, come unlocked and open even locks that the kids can't reach, and it's always overnight, or we notice them when we get home from work. About two months ago, things started to go missing from the apartment. At first, it was little things like a new tube of mascara or a $20 bill left on the kitchen island. My husband and I thought it might be our baby storing them somewhere like treasures. He sometimes does that with my husband's golf balls, so it wasn't too far-fetched. But then bigger, more expensive items started to disappear. Our iPad vanished from my nightstand. A leather jacket with a designer label no longer hung from its hanger on the side of my closet. A bra, still with tags, went absent from one of my dresser drawers, and a full bottle of prescription painkillers was nowhere to be found. So was half of a bottle of my anxiety meds. We now began to suspect that something really weird was happening in our apartment, but had no proof. The nursery and bathroom cameras didn't show anything during the day and we started making our boys sleep in bed with us at night. The bedroom door locked from the inside. I could swear that I woke up in the middle of the night, once to a slight thudding noise, and saw the shadows of movement on the other side of the door. But I fell back asleep before I could register what was happening. I take a Tylenol 3 most nights before bed. So while I do wake up at the slightest noise, staying awake is a battle of its own. This is our last month at these apartments. In two weeks, we'll be moving into our home. Two weeks ago, I obtained a money order for the last month's rent. It was a large money order, and had to be halved in two. As always, I brought it home, along with the receipt, and placed them in a magnetic sleeve attached to the freezer that also housed our monthly invoice. Now, I don't know how to fill out a money order. I know how stupid that is, but I never worried about it since my husband usually fills them out and pays our rent. It's not that I can't learn, but I'm lazy, 
and don't mind letting him do that. That means that the money order in the rent sleeve was blank. And guess what? It too went missing. A novice mistake, I know. But thank God for online banking. One call to our bank and an investigation had begun. We waited with unease until this afternoon when a representative from the company that had an issue with the money order gave us a call. The call was to inform us that the order had been cashed and that a thief was identified. Sure enough, it was one of the receptionists in our building, the same young woman who had called to ask about our new security devices. She had been using the spare maintenance key to come inside of our apartment whenever she wanted to. Tomorrow I will take this information to the building's manager. At the moment we weren't pressing charges as long as our conditions are met. Hopefully this young lady gets help because we don't think she's malicious, just a thief and a grade A creeper. Don't worry, tonight will be our last night here. As far as her watching our As far as her watching my children's sleep goes, I can't say that I'll be comfortable having them sleep away from me for a good long while. I feel terrible for not believing my son. I tear up just thinking about how scared he must have been. The new house will get a full security system with every bell and whistle. We're still not sure how she got past the ring camera without being seen, but my husband is dead set on figuring it out. An update to the story. When we got to the office this morning, the manager greeted us, apologized about 20 times, and informed us that said receptionist had been let go when she arrived on the property this morning. We made sure that he understood the gravity of the situation, especially concerning our children's safety and the fact that the building is mostly comprised of families and retirees. We came to an agreement not to pursue legal action against the company as long as we could leave today with our deposit in hand and never hear from them again. We also made him promise to send out a PSA to the other residents explaining portions of the situation in case she had been doing this to other people, which I would put money on that she did. We are currently throwing our belongings into boxes and laundry baskets, awaiting family and friends coming to help us move out. My husband and I decided not to pursue our missing property. However, we will be filing charges for the theft of the money order. We think she was leaving the patio doors unlocked because we have a first floor apartment with a sunroom and she was unlocking them at night when we charged the ring so that she could let herself in during the day via the patio. It explains why we never got her on camera and why she would be so bold as to come in at night while we were home asleep. My guess is that the night that our son got out, she had snuck in to unlock the back door and saw him awake. She must have waited until he was still for a while and then ran back out the front door forgetting to completely shut and lock it. When he finally felt safe enough to get out of the bed, he saw the lights from the hall and followed them, wanting to be out of the dark, where he saw the monster. The story was from around five years ago, give or take a few months. To set the stage, I was 19 and living in a very large city in the southern US, population nearly two million, and with several military installations. I was dating a guy at the time who was in the army and stationed at the joint base nearest to where I was living at the time. I had a full-time job and also was in school, but all of my free time was spent with my boyfriend, and since he was in training at the time, he didn't have a car, so I was on and off that base constantly, and I had gotten to know the gate guards. I still had to present my visitor ID and pass every time because it was protocol, but they knew me. The base itself is huge like its own little small town, in and of itself. Driving onto the base by accident is impossible. There are a few entrances, but I usually use the second biggest entrance. To get there, you had to drive down a five lane road, two lanes each way, and one turning lane. As you approach, there's a huge golf course that's part of the base, as well as our national cemetery. So there's huge fences and large signs stating that it's government property. And to the right is some businesses, restaurants, barbershops, dry cleaners and gas stations, as well as a few residential neighborhoods with smaller side streets. But as you get closer to the gate, there's really nowhere to go except the base, unless you're going to the physical rehab center, senior living center, that's on the right and literally the last place to turn in before you're going through the gates. The road leading into the base is really long, so as you go further away from the base on the same road, there's more businesses, more neighborhoods, apartments, and a Walmart both approximately three to five miles, give or take, from the gate. I also happened to use this road when I was going straight from work to pick up my boyfriend, as there's an exit from the interstate and the most direct route. So I was just heading down the road 
And one thing I'll note is that I'm a pretty careful driver ever since I got into a terrible car accident with my mom when I was 12 and seriously injured. I drive a little faster than the speed limit, but not by much, and I always try to move out of the way for people going faster than me, because I know it can be annoying to be stuck driving behind somebody going slower than you, and just because I want to go slower doesn't mean I want to annoy other drivers by it. I was about two miles from base in the right-hand lane when I came up on somebody slowing down to take a turn. I checked my mirrors and flicked on my blinker and went to make a lane change to go around. There had been an old clunky blue van, like a Chevy Astro or something similar looking, in the left lane, but it was still pretty far back, and I was planning to move back to my lane anyways as soon as I passed the car in front of me. Well, Mr. Astro didn't like me getting into his lane when I was going slower than he was. Again, he was far enough back that if he maintained his speed, I would have been back over before he reached me. But no, I heard an engine rev, and all of a sudden this guy was right on my bumper, laying on his horn making rude gestures. I've always been a rather meek and quiet person, and I hate confrontation, so I was going to pull back into the right lane to get back over once I passed the car in front of me. But by then it was another car in that lane trying to speed past everyone, so I couldn't move over immediately. As I waited for another car to pass so I could move into the right lane, the Astro behind me is speeding up on my tail and then backing off just to speed up on my tail again. Other car passes and I move into the right lane so the Astro can pass me. He sped up and then slowed so he was driving right next to my car. I glanced over and this older guy with raggedy hair and a dirty ratty beard just stared over at me, still making rude gestures. Then made a gun sign with his hand and pointed his fingers at me, miming shooting me in the head. This really freaked me out, but not as much as when he slowed down even further and got right behind me again. This road can be really trafficy during rush hours, but I'd gotten off of work early that day, around 3.45, so the traffic wasn't bad, and he definitely did not need to be behind me anymore, so there was so much room for him just to go around and leave behind me. Obviously freaked out, I tried to shake him. I changed lanes, he followed me, and I slowed down, and so did he. So I got back into the right lane, coming up on a light that just turned yellow, and made a risky, very quick right turn on that road hoping he wouldn't be able to follow me. He apparently didn't care and took the turn right after me. I remember looking into my rear view and seeing the van practically leaning on the turn, and he was still yelling, making hand gestures at me. I took some more turns and started weaving through a neighborhood trying to lose him, but he just kept following me. Finally, a moment of clarity hit me when I took a sharp turn and my visitor's pass for, and my visitor's pass for base slid off of the front seat. I wove through the neighborhood until I got back to the road that we had been on, the one that leads straight into the base, and I booked it down the road with Mr. Astro right behind me. I saw him in my rear view as I pulled up to the gate, and was terrified to see him pull in behind me. I thought there was no way that this guy could follow me onto the base. At the time, they were an FPCON Bravo, which means no one could drive onto the base unless they had proper military staff or ID for a 30-day visitor pass and driver's license but luckily I knew the guard at the gate. I pulled in and he could tell I was a bit frazzled because my hands were shaking as I handed him my ID and my pass. Before he could ask, I said, the guy in the car behind me is very scary. He's been following me for 15 minutes making hand gestures and yelling. He made finger guns like he was going to shoot me. And the guard was very nice and smiled and nodded and acted like everything was okay. Didn't even glance back at the van. He told me, okay, don't worry about it. You're safe now and this guy won't get anywhere near you. Is your boyfriend done for the day? I said, no, I don't think he's done till 4.30. I was just going to read in my car until he's done. He told me to go about with my plans, to head over to my boyfriend's barracks, and he and the other guards would handle it. I did exactly what he told me to do. My boyfriend's barracks weren't too far from the gate entrance, luckily, and after two turns, I would be completely out of sight of the gate. I waited for my boyfriend, and when he came out, I told him everything that happened. I was shaking and crying. He ended up driving us back to my place, and we exited from the main gate that was on the other side of the base. It was a longer drive home, but meant that we wouldn't run the risk of a guy possibly waiting on the side of a road to drive back out of base. When I took him back that night, guards had obviously done a shift change, but my boyfriend knew the one working and asked if she'd heard anything about the guy following somebody. 
She was very excited to tell us about the guy in the blue van who ended up being arrested by military police. As it turned out, the dude tried to tell the guard I was his daughter and was just being difficult. And could he please let him through to go and get me? The guard played it cool and pretended to be understanding, but said he needed to do a sweep of the car and that they would have to have somebody escort him to find me since he didn't have military ID or visitor pass. The guy tried to say no, but the guard insisted. The guy tried to get in through the gate on foot. Clearly not a good idea to try to force your way onto a military installation. He didn't even make it a quarter mile before MPs had pulled over and cuffed him, and they found a gun in his center console. I don't know what that guy would have done if he caught up with me, maybe assaulted or killed any number of things, who knows. I no longer live in that city. I'm no longer dating that boyfriend. I have new license plates on my car from my new state, and I have no idea what eventually happened to Mr. Astro. I'm sure he probably did some jail time, considering that he tried to gun it through a base with a firearm in the console, but I have no idea how much time, and I have no desire to try and find out what happened to him. It was in college. My roommate was a born-again Christian, and she invited me to her Bible study in church all the time. Eventually I went, and I kept going. Wasn't a fan of the pastor, but there were a lot of nice young adults who liked to have clean, sober fun, and I didn't drink or party, so I felt like I fit in. But I didn't agree with everything they believed in. Just the more normal stuff like God and helping the poor, not some other things. This one guy in the Bible study, Drew, was pretty quiet. Good looking. Seemed like he knew everything about the Bible, which amazed me. I thought, I know nothing about this. He's very wise. I was 21 and he was 27. He wasn't a college student. He just worked, which I later learned maybe he didn't. We were going to go on a young adult retreat, and because I worked, I couldn't leave early on Friday to drive up to the mountains with the girls in the group. A mutual friend said that I could ride with Drew, so I said okay. On the way up, Drew was pretty quiet for the first hour. Not very friendly at all, and it was a long trip. But as we got closer to the mountains, he really warmed up. We got pizza, and he paid, which was nice. Then he stopped the car just so we could look at the stars. He even played some Brian McKnight. He was turning it into a date, but I didn't know it or see it that way then. I was starting to really like him and felt like we had a connection. He's just about to drop me off at the girl's cabin when he suddenly gets very serious and tells me that something happened between him and another girl in our church group, but she is telling lies about him and to not believe whatever I hear. He doesn't explain what actually happened and doesn't say who it is. I enter the cabin and all the girls are there, and very quickly one girl, Bree, who is probably the youngest in the group, who is 19, tells all of us, Ladies, there is a wolf in sheep clothing among us at this retreat. Now, if you don't know church folk, they get very dramatic and talk like this all the time. So I just thought, okay, here is some drama. She tells us the story about how she was talking to some guy here, but he started stalking her and wouldn't take no for an answer and even threatened her sister. Now my spidey sense is up and I realize this must be what Drew was telling me about. The church group doesn't know who it is because she won't say, because she doesn't want to gossip, and she says leadership will handle it. Well, Drew eventually leaves the weekend retreat early. There goes my ride back, I thought. I don't know if he was ever asked to leave or what. That week, Drew asks me to hang out, and we do. I still like him and don't know who to believe. On our hangout, we didn't really do anything. He takes me to the mall and reads the Bible to me. Okay, cool. Then he parks his car on some suburban lookout, top of the world type of thing, and just says that he is a view guy who really likes views. I'm not one to be impressed by suburban lights. So I'm just like, okay, well, this is boring. I give him another chance. I invite him to come see a play with me. When he does, he immediately meets one of my friends, Brian. Brian introduces us to his boyfriend, Nick. I'm in the theater, many gay friends. Well, for the majority of the rest of the date, Drew lectures me about how gays are going to hell and I must not really love them if I don't stop to tell them that. I eventually cry because it is this ugly argument in his car that we were having for hours in the parking lot of Panera. I say, I want to go home. This is basically the worst date ever. I don't agree with what he says. He also tells me I need to give up my dream of being an actress because what if the Lord doesn't want me to do that? Theater is something I did my whole life, not to mention my major, 
and his reasons for giving it up had nothing to do with the impracticality of it, but because of God. This guy was nuts. I get home and I offer to make us some cocoa to just kind of end things as friends, or at least on a better note. I know I will see him at church, and we have mutual friends and are in the same Bible study. Things got weird. He tried to get sexual with me, but then also blamed me for tempting him. I ended up crying again. I just wanted him to go home, but I was so emotionally exhausted I didn't know what to make of this. He calls and texts me that week, and I don't respond. Then it's a Sunday night. I am talking to my friend Tim, who no longer goes to this church anymore. I tell him I went on a date with Drew. Before I can tell him how it went, Tim says, What? That guy's crazy. You need to abort that mission. Tim tells me that he is close with Bree and her family, and Drew is a stalker and threatened Bree's sister. I don't know what to believe, because it sounds like Tim believes this just based on Bree's story. I hang up and I call my mom trying to tell her what happened. What Tim told me about Drew and how it was such weird timing considering what happened with me. While I'm on the phone with my mom, I get a knock at the door. It's 10 p.m. on Sunday night. I look out, but nobody's there. I go to get my roommate and ask her if she can just sit with me in the front room because I'm freaked out and think somebody's there. There's another knock at the door. I open it, and it's Drew, and he looks all in a frenzy. I asked him what he was doing here, and he said he just needed to talk to me, and I wasn't answering my phone, which was because I was genuinely busy earlier in the day. The conversation is getting long, and my roommate is still sitting there, so I tell her she can go back to her room. It's okay. I let him come in, because I'm conditioned to be overly nice, and this was a big mistake. We started talking, and as soon as my roommate is gone, he pulls out a knife and starts saying how he was worried my neighbors did something to me, because I wasn't answering his text, and he didn't know what kind of situation he'd be walking into. I have zero fighting skills, no experience in that situation at all. So I calmly say, as casually as possible, Hey, can you put the knife away? It makes me feel uncomfortable. He asked me if I want the knife, and I say no. I just want to pretend it's not here. I somehow talk him down, get him to leave. I think I convince him that he still has a shot with me somehow. The next morning, my mind is clearer, and I feel like I need to tell my mom what happened. She has me tell my dad, who has me tell the church youth leader and security at my apartment. I tell the cop the whole story and he says that this guy is definitely a stalker and I will see him again unless the police call him. I say it's fine, I think everything's going to be okay, there's no need to call. I just didn't want any more drama. I have never talked to a policeman about anything before. I was still processing and didn't understand that this was serious. My mistake. The next night I went to a party, another church related one, but Drew is not supposed to be here. He told me before that he wasn't going. Well, he is there. I decided to leave, but my 21-year-old self doesn't think to ask to have someone walk me out. I figure, if I leave, and he is still there, problem solved. I didn't anticipate him realizing I left and following me. I'm walking to my car in a dark apartment parking lot, and I hear him call out my name. He's following me. I start running and say I don't want to talk. He begins chasing me. I am clicking my car to open thinking this is how girls die because she did not let the cop call the stalker because she is dumb. Thankfully, my car unlocks and I get in and drive away. Problem is, this guy knows where I live. I move out two weeks later and I block him on all social media and my phone. Drew eventually somehow managed to make another Facebook profile and sent me a message that Summer says he was praying for me and had forgiven me for trashing him to people, even though I still never told anyone what happened except for the useless pastor who did nothing. That was the last I saw and heard of him. Unfortunately, this predator continued to serve at the church in the junior high ministries of all places, around many young girls. No one on church leadership listened to me, or to Bree, who both complained that this guy was stalking us. I never reached out to Bree to let her know what happened to me, and I never got to hear her story in detail. But I had told the young adult pastor about the knife, and him trying to get sexual with me and how I was scared. Thankfully, I didn't go to that church anymore, and this was all before the Me Too movement. What sucks is I've had a few experiences with crazy religious guys. This was the first, but not the last, and I'm still trying to come to terms with why that is. I guess I should give some background before I get into this story. I became homeless in late January, 
So I am living in my car with my 120 pound female Mastiff, who is a guarding breed. She keeps me very, very safe and always has. We have a routine in the mornings. First, I walk her at my cousin's house. Then I go to a local rest stop to use the facilities and brush my teeth and wash my face and whatnot. After that, I go to a park and ride by the rest stop to walk my dog again. Because of the virus, lots of people frequent this park and ride to either sit and read, listen to podcasts or audiobooks, or to nap. Now, when I walk my dog, I leave the back door of my car open because she is old and has arthritis and it's hard for her to get in and out of the car. I usually have to lift her up from her underbelly to load her into the car. I also leave it open that way because she is fear aggressive with humans due to being abused as a puppy and she is a dog aggressive, so I like to make sure I can get her in the car quickly if I need to. I also like to park my car between a large van and an SUV that are seemingly abandoned there or just left there for whatever reason so that my car is kind of hidden and nobody will park next to me. Last week, the van wasn't at the park and ride, so I parked to the left of the SUV, as usual, with a huge space between my car and any others in that row. I was walking my dog in the grass pretty far away from my car, and as usual, I had the car running with the back door slightly open. I was far enough from it that you wouldn't know it was mine if you passed it. While walking my dog, I noticed a flash of a silver car out of the corner of my eye. I thought it might be a state trooper, and if it was, because I have both paranoia and an anxiety disorder, that he might reprimand me for walking my dog there. I stayed calm and continued to walk my dog, intent on getting her to do her business so we could get back in the car and leave. The car passed by once more, and I noticed it wasn't a state police car. It was a silver Honda with an old man driving. He was purposely driving as close as he could to my dog and I without hitting the curb and was literally just crawling the car along our path. When I turned around, he did too. He crept past once more, staring out of his open window at me the entire time and not even watching the road. I got agitated at that and resigned myself to the idea that I would have to confront him if he continued to stalk us. He passed by once more, crawling again and trying to get closer. When he realized I was headed for the cars, he turned around again. I got my dog, named Karma, in the car and settled myself into the driver's seat and took some time to give her a bowl of fresh, clean water and her treats and took a moment to plug in my laptop to my inverter and charge it for later. I saw the silver car out of the corner of my eye again and watched as the old man parked a few cars away from mine in the same row next to a man in a black pickup truck that I noticed was watching this old man curiously. I was thankful the man in the truck was there and watching and had noticed the way the old man was creeping by me and stalking me. The old man purposely reverse parked so his window was lined up with my driver's side window and continued to belligerently stare at me from out of his open window as I did what I needed to before I'd leave the park and ride. He was leaning against his door with his head out and just staring straight at me, not even blinking. I ignored him as I had been doing, carrying on with my business, when I plugged in my phone and organized the belongings in my front seat and gathered up some garbage to put in the little garbage bag I kept on the floor of the front seat. I was raised to be tough and unafraid, and I wasn't going to let this creepy old guy spook me. I looked up after about ten minutes, and he was still staring right at me, still not even blinking so I turned my head and avoided eye contact as I put on my seatbelt. I had been running the car the whole time I walked my dog, so I was good to go. I went to pull out of my spot, and my backup camera went off, and I saw that silver car right behind me, blocking me from pulling out of my parking spot. At this point, I was angry and ready to give this old man a what for, but I reminded myself that he just might be a little bit off. My grandpa had dementia, and before he was diagnosed, he did strange things and would often forget where he was, and he would hallucinate. I figured maybe this old man was having troubles of his own. The old man pulled up next to me, and as I put my car back in gear to leave, my dog began going wild, and I heard a voice. Mind you, I had locked all my doors and closed all my windows while this man was staring at me to make it clear that I was not to be approached, 
and was not interested in conversation. My dog was climbing into my front seat and blocking off my view so I couldn't pull out. She was barking like crazy and snarling at this man with her hair standing up on her back. At this point, I just stopped and put the car in park, shoved her into the back seat and rolled down my window to see what this creep wanted. I noticed he had an oxygen tube in his nose, but there was no oxygen tank to be seen anywhere in his car. I have a good eye for these things because my grandma had one for two years before she died, and I also worked in a pharmacy where I delivered pharmacy supplies door to door at an elderly living community with a health center and assisted living center. I can spot an oxygen tank of any size and in any kind of container or case anywhere. There was none in his car. He says to me, are you all right? So I say, yes, I'm fine. I go to roll my window back up when he speaks again. Are you broken down? Do you need help? I give him an incredulous look and firmly say, no, I'm not. My car is fine and so am I. Again, I try to roll up the windows as he shouts. Well, it looked like your car was broken down, which is why I pulled up here next to you. I think something's wrong with your car. Again, I tell him my car is fine. I'm fine. I don't need any help and rudely thank him for his concern, but he doesn't let it go. He tells me once more that he thinks my car is broken down and that he can help me. At this point, I'm no longer trying to be polite. I give him a nasty look. Don't even bother to stop my dog from barking at him. And I say, I'm fine. Thanks. He just nods and slowly, ever so slowly, crawls out of his parking space and down the lot towards the exit, and hangs there as if he's waiting for me to drive out. My instincts are telling me that something is really off with this guy, but I'm trying to rationalize, chalking it up to my paranoia and anxiety and general distrust of people. I tell myself he's probably just a bit senile and means well. Still, I stay stubbornly in my spot and do not leave until he gives up and pulls out of the lot going the opposite way that I was going to. The whole day, the entire incident bothered me. It wasn't until later, when talking to my male friend, that I realized how messed up the whole thing was. He didn't know which car was mine when he began stalking me. I was nowhere near it. Once I got in my car, he pulled up a few spots away to purposely continue watching me, and seeing that my car was clearly fine and running since I was blasting the AC and rolled up my windows without any difficulty. I've had cars that have broken down before, and I'm mechanically inclined enough, as my friend pointed out. If my car was broken down, I would have at least had the hood popped, and I'd be elbows deep in my engine, checking my oil, my other fluids, my belt, radiator, battery, my alternator. Been there, done that a million times. Once again, he had the oxygen tube in his nose, and no tank anywhere in sight. I drive an SUV, and he was in a Honda sedan, so I was easily able to see into his vehicle and nothing. The fact that he insisted something was wrong with my car bothered me. It was as if he wanted me to get out of the car to either check, probably thinking because I'm a young, small female that I don't understand mechanics, or know when something is wrong with my car, or to prove to him that it was fine. There were no signs at all that anything was wrong with my car, and if there was, I wouldn't be out walking my dog. I'd be elbows deep in the engine bay, on the phone with the towing company, and I would be highly stressed out and filthy. What's even more bothersome is he did this in broad daylight, with people watching from their cars. He purposely stalked me as close as he could with his car, nearly driving in the grass, turning around and creeping slowly past me three times, and following me as I walked, and then parked near my car once he saw me get in. I think he parked next to me and stared at me like that, to try to take some time to figure out an excuse or a reason to approach me before he stopped me from leaving and pulled up next to me. The entire thing was incredibly uncomfortable, creepy, off and gave me Ted Bundy vibes. After all, an elderly man with an oxygen tube in his nose doesn't look like he's capable of harming anybody, but oh boy did he want me to get out of my car. Him hanging around the exit to try and catch me leaving was probably the worst of it all. It wasn't enough that he stalked and harassed me in the lot, no. Why not try to follow me where I was going? So old man in the park, with the oxygen tube that connected to nothing, let's not meet again. 
Two and a half years ago, I was what you might call the right hand for my boss, who owned the motel that I worked for, technically as head housekeeper. But I had recently begun training to run the full spectrum of the motel, including all things office and front desk, overseeing staff and minor maintenance, so that my boss could take a vacation. It was a 42-room mom-and-pop place set back off the road, so it was pretty peaceful for the most part. There were still a few motley ones every now and then, but that's at any motel in small town USA. But as intimidating as the new responsibility sounded, with only two other staff members to worry about, it was a cakewalk. The day comes for the boss to take her leave, and I'm now in charge of her life's blood, sweat, and tears, and pumped for the opportunity to show what I was made of. She left Friday morning, and the rest of the day ran like clockwork until around 8.30 that night. I also lived on the property in an apartment, which allowed me to run back and forth to the office for guest check-ins and any office duties I needed to tend to. So when the ring the doorbell alerted, I looked at my phone and saw an older gentleman, early 60s maybe, staring through the door looking at an attendant. I spoke through the camera to let him know that I'd be there in 30 seconds and started on my way to the office. As I would with any guest, while checking them in, I made small talk about his trip and gave the lowdown on where to get good food in town. I got him squared away in the computer and showed him how to get to his room. As he was getting his credit card situated back in his wallet, I thanked him for staying with us and called him Mr. Logan. He looked up at me and smiled and said I should call him Joe, and then he made his way out of the office. Less than 30 minutes had passed and I get a call from room 135, Joe's room. He proceeds to tell me that he would like to use the desk lamp, but there is no light bulb in it, and could he please get one which immediately threw up a red flag, because I had cleaned that room myself, and I made it a habit to check every light bulb in the room, and know for a fact that the light bulb was there, because I used the desk lamp as I was cleaning. I told him I would bring one down, and he immediately said he would rather come to the office to get it. The office was attached to an apartment type space that my boss lived in during the week and it was very dark in the back and set up in a way that would have made it very difficult, if not impossible, to see through the door to the apartment. Considering I was the only employee on the property, having him come to the very secluded office in the dark wasn't going to happen. I felt more comfortable taking him to his room where I knew there were other guests around that area that were sitting outside that could help me if needed. So when he says he would rather come to the office, I told him that I would have to bring it to him because my boss would kill me if I made a guest change a light bulb. He says he understands and I breathe a little easier. He's not going to get me cornered in my secluded office to do God knows what. I grab the light bulb and before I can get to the front door, I look and there he is looking through the glass on the door, staring me down in the most unsettling way. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and I finally started shaking. I opened the door and just said, let's get your lamp working, and started walking past him. He then said he thinks he forgot to sign his credit card receipt, and can we please go back and double check? I told him that he had already dropped the receipt, but that I would check it in the morning, and get it from him if I needed it. That was total crap. He made a big deal about finding his good pen to sign it with. We both know he signed it, with that rejected idea, we continued to his room. As I walked in, I kicked the door stop wedge that I brought with me under the door so it couldn't close without assistance. And had he tried, I would have had time to yell for help from the guys next door to him. I think he figured that out and moved away from the door. As I put the bulb in the lamp and turned to leave, I noticed the original light bulb halfway sticking out from under a couch pillow. I picked up my pace, chose to say nothing, and I left. I made sure that he didn't see where I went because I sure didn't want him to know that I lived there or which apartment was mine. 30 minutes later and the phone rings again. Of course it's Joe. This time he would like extra coffee for in the morning. I tell him that I'm unable to get to the housekeeping supply room because the housekeeper accidentally took it home. Total lie, but I wasn't going back over there. He had legitimately scared me. He called two more times that night, but I changed my voicemail to the motel's information, and I let him leave a message. I never even checked them, 
bad customer service for my first night running the place alone, but I really didn't think my boss would entertain the idea of penalizing me after she heard the whole story. The next morning starts out as quiet as usual. I was running audit when Joe shows up at the door. I wasn't scared this time because one of my housekeepers was getting coffee in the kitchen and I had people coming and going, checking out. Joe asked me to go to breakfast with him. I explained that I'm on the clock and have business to keep afloat for my boss, but thank you for the offer. I'm not sure exactly what went down in this next two hours because I was working, but somewhere in there, Joe's car quit working. He was trying to go to the next town over, which is significantly bigger than my town, for one reason or another. Anyway, he starts getting unreasonably angry that his car won't start, and saying things like, How am I supposed to do this without a car? Then it dawns on him that there is a car dealership next door, and he starts off in that direction. But before he goes too far away, he sees me coming out of a room, and he says, You're gonna marry me. Just wait and see. We're going to Vegas. All while smiling and chuckling. So I chuckle too because there's no way he's being serious. I hoped. And I continued on with my day. About five hours pass. And I get a phone call from the dealership. Asking if Mr. Logan had checked out. I said he was booked for one more night. And he proceeds to tell me that Joe took a car for a test drive. And was supposed to return in 30 minutes. But hadn't returned. And he isn't answering his phone calls. They asked if I could check his room to see if his belongings were still there, and I obliged. I opened his door after knocking with no response, and found the room completely destroyed. Papers all over the place, trash on the floor, pictures off the wall, the whole nine. But I wasn't sure if the papers were something he would come back for, or if he bailed and just left that stuff behind. Aside from the papers, the only other personal belongings were a pair of swim trunks, and a pair of socks. Again, was that worth coming back for? So I tell the dealership that I'm not 100% sure he's coming back, and they call the police. After another couple hours, the police show up at the motel, Joe in tow. I had decided since he didn't pay until the next day, I would just leave his stuff there in case he returned, which I honestly did not think would happen. He goes in and starts taking his things out of his room. That's when the cop comes up to me. And being a small town, he knows me and he pulls me aside. He says, hey, you need to thank God every night that you're still alive and well and here. I said, okay, but what makes you say that? He said, that man had every intention of taking you with him tonight and going somewhere you'd never be looked for in. I don't know that he would have let you live. He's a sick man. We are taking him for a psych evaluation and then to the country to see if he's okay for general population. He then says I should call my boss and let her know what was happening and maybe take my own vacation for a few days, just in case they can't make the car theft thing stick since the dealership no longer wanted to press charges given his psychological state and that was technically the only law he broke. They also said they would have to patrol the motel every hour or so to check on me if he is released. I was completely taken back by this whole ordeal and to this day wonder how he planned on getting me out of there and what he was going to do if he did. He was released after 24 hours, but I never saw him again, and I am okay with that. I'm going to put this in for context that will be useful later down the road. On March 10th, my very good friend committed suicide. I was on site with officers and a few close friends who showed up that day as well. It was really rough for me and many others, and still affects me to this day. Now to the story, and a quick note, I'm going to skip the sexual parts of the relationship, as it was a weird sexual experience for me that genuinely made me lose my sex drive. So back at the end of October, beginning of November, I dated this girl named Tina. She had such a crappy name that just fit completely with the crappy type of person she was. The girl was really something. She was your basic white girl, loud, unfunny, and always on TikTok trying to do those dances. Our first date rolled around and we went to our high school's football game, and she wouldn't try to meet up with me at the concession stand because she was genuinely intimidated by me for whatever reason. Then all of a sudden she basically wanted to be by me for the rest of the football game. She was extremely erratic in her behavior that day, and that should have been a first red flag for me. 
Later that night, I was texting her, and she pressured me into telling her about what happened to my friend and what it made me feel like. Normally, I'm a pretty open guy, but I just met this girl and didn't know what to think about her. So I gave in and I told her. Later that night, she started talking about how nobody would miss her if she was gone. I didn't know how to react as my anxiety kicked in. I kept trying to tell her that people needed her, and soon I told her I loved her as a panic response as things ramped up in her behavior. This was the first red flag I noticed, but in reality, I wish it was the second, and I wish I stopped talking to her after that football game. But now that I was believing that girl was suicidal, I really stuck with it. I played up an act of liking her for a few more weeks. My high school's homecoming was coming up, and I asked her to the dance. However, all my plans almost ended right there when she ran from me in the middle of the night and had her friend text me about how she was going to kill herself. It got real for me. I was so angry as I yelled at her over the phone, asking for her to tell me where she was. I told her that I was going to call the cops, but she insisted that I didn't. I was going about 60 on every single road. She kept telling me that the cliffside she had been sitting on would be great for jumping off and killing herself with. My rage and fear stirred up so hot that I started crying and screaming. I went numb. I found her due to the fact she was describing a woman who she thought was going to kidnap her or something. In reality, it was just a woman trying to get an owl out of the way of her car. So I slammed the brakes as soon as I saw the woman and the owl and jumped out of my car. I had tears in my eyes and rage in my blood as I begged this woman to help me find her. Soon I did, as I saw her outline in the near tree line. I basically had to drag this 5 foot 2 person out of this ditch and put her in the back of my car. Immediately she switched from being sad to angry and was calling me insane and kicking the back of my seat like a child. Later that night I was talking with my mom. I was telling her that I wanted to break up with her, and I almost did, but I was completely terrified of the fact that if I did, she may end up dead. She was in my head. I constantly worried about her. And on top of that, her friends came after me as well and her to stir up more attention and drama, which they ate up like a pack of lions with their newly caught prey. Eventually, I did break up with her. However, as I found it was the right time and I built up the courage to do it, I was happy for once and she was not. I felt powerful and in control of my actions again. I even stood up for myself when she tried to pin me as a sex addict and abuser, which was far from the case and many people can confirm it. I told her how manipulative she was and how crappy her two-faced friends were. I told her how delusional her reality was. We went in tandem with a side conflict I was having with another friend named Griffin. It turned out she and Griffin had not only been manipulating me and my friend's group, but were having an affair and screwing each other while I and Tina were dating. So many friends decided to fully cut these people off, and Griffin was gone from our lives, but Tina was not. She continued to send her goons after us and harass us. I was the main target, but my friend Anna took a beating due to the fact that she was the only other girl in the friend group. I had enough and told the principal about each incident in the hopes that she would be removed from the school. I told them I wanted her away from me and my friends as the harassment became worse and worse. It went from just insults over Instagram DMs to filming our conversation and listening in on us and using it as blackmail. They even tried to tear apart a relationship I was in with this girl from my history class, Selena. They didn't do anything but tell them to stop and then told me to stop, which I have no idea why as I wasn't doing anything in particular. I took that quote unquote advice and stopped. When she would harass us, I would just block them out. Or if they harassed us in person, we made them out to be fooled as soon as they realized they couldn't get to us anymore. But quarantine happened and things became bad. Harassment picked up again as they knew their school career couldn't be put on the line anymore. And I eventually got pictures of Tina and Griffin FaceTiming and sexting over it as she flashed him and other things like that. I was disgusted. However, things slowed down as the one year of our friend's passing came up, and I just hoped it would be the end of it, as maybe a time of sadness would make them realize, but it sure didn't. I got a text last night from an unknown number at about 1am, 
telling me I was a disgusting person and looked gross. I kept asking who it was, although I knew deep down who it really was. They were insulting me, and I insulted back, showing I wouldn't take any of their crap. I asked who it was again, and they said, someone who hates you, and I kept going. I told them that I didn't even know them, and they must be miserable to be texting someone they hate at 1 a.m. They texted me saying, I know who you are, and I asked, well, who am I then? Then they said my name, spelled perfectly, which is a rare occurrence, surprisingly. It's not even a hard name to say or spell. Then they went on to say things like, why did you hit me? You ruined my life. People thought my parents were abusing me, and then immediately switched to how they loved me and wanted me to be their wife, and how I was all of a sudden gay. None of this made sense, and I was genuinely afraid as the erratic behavior was genuinely scary and concerning with some of the things they had said earlier. Soon it turned for the worst. They were telling me that they knew where I lived, and they were describing my house in perfect detail. I grabbed a baseball bat I kept next to my bed and ran downstairs and looked out the windows. It was pitch black and my fight or flight instincts kicked in. As I stared out of the window trying to see any sort of shadow moving in the dark, my phone buzzed. They were in my backyard. I just texted call me, but in reality I was in a panic and I ran to the back windows. Still pitch black and our dim porch and backyard lights wouldn't help a thing. All I knew to do then was to call the police. Two cars showed up at my house, and I and my parents stayed up a bit later until they left. I showed them the texts, and they asked if there was anyone who would threaten me or anything I did to anyone in the past that would result in this. I just told them about my crazy ex. I got a text about how boring I was and that they were blocking me. Not sure if it was related to the cops showing up making things lame for them or because I started texting with no reactions whatsoever. Either way, things definitely went too far. As a child, kindergarten age, I loved to talk. If anyone had a question for me, I would gleefully give them way too much information. Most people found it endearing and would praise me for being so smart, which encouraged me a lot. My mom and I normally shopped at the market just a few minutes away from our house. My mom had been shopping there for 20-some years at that point, and was friends with most of the workers, so I was friendly with them too, and was always happy to talk with them. Whenever my mom got distracted talking to someone, I, with the attention span of a six-year-old, would wander around the aisle. My mom would keep an eye on me to make sure I didn't get too far, but if she was distracted, one of the other employees would usually be around and gently guide me back over. One day, though, we went to a different market that I couldn't remember having been to before, and we didn't go back to for nearly a decade. We were walking around the aisles when my mom ran into her friend. They started talking, and I, not realizing that I no longer had a store full of adults keeping an eye on me, started wandering around the aisle. My eyes caught some colorful display. I think flowers or balloons. It went over to look. Once I was satisfied with my inspection... I turned back to the aisle only to find that my mom wasn't there, that it had never happened before. I looked around a little, though not moving from my spot near the colorful displays. Since it was right next to the registers, there was a decent amount of people nearby, which I'm thankful for now. As I was looking around, an employee came up to me. He was older than my sister. She was 12 or 13 at the time, and younger than my dad in his mid-40s which was the only way I could gauge age. Now, I would probably say he was in his early to mid-twenties if I remember right. Hi there, he said sweetly, in that tone you normally speak to kids in. I cheerfully said hello, actually stepping a little bit closer. Are you looking for your mommy? I say yes, happily explaining that I had last seen her talking to her friend and that I could normally find her easily when I wandered away, so I wasn't sure where she could have gone. Does she leave you alone often? Not really. My older sister was normally with me, if my mom wasn't. She was 12 or 13, and she was super mature. So if my mom had to leave for a little bit, she knew I would be okay, and she never left us alone in public, just at home if she needed to run somewhere. Never for very long, just the length of a time of a Pokemon episode or something. And my dad was at work a lot, 
and didn't come back until late, usually, if you were wondering. Where do you live? Well, wouldn't you know, I just learned my address. We just learned how to mail a letter in school. Even took a little class trip to the mailbox on our school corner to send them out. I knew how to write my address now, and I knew how to say it. You want to hear? Of course you do. I know kids are naive, but I was downright dumb. I was diagnosed with color blindness two years later, otherwise known as red-green color blindness. It makes sense. I was totally blind to all the red flags. Where do you go to school? Who picks you up? Well, I go to the local elementary school. I don't know the address, though. Sorry. But I know what street it's on, because I wait on the sidewalk for my mom or daycare sitter, depending on the day. So I see the street sign a lot since I'm usually waiting for a while to be grabbed. Do you like animals? You like puppies? Dogs scare me. Cats scare me. Pigeons scare me. Fish scare me. Flies scare me. You know what doesn't scare me? Turtles. I have five turtles. No dog that might bark or bite if someone drops by the house like our neighbor does. Those dogs are always behind the gate though, so they don't scare me a lot. It had only been a few minutes since I last saw my mom. Even with how much information I was dumping, I was a very fast talker. But I was starting to get a little antsy. Not because I was uncomfortable talking to a stranger, but because I had skipped lunch that day specifically to con my mom into letting me get a bagel from the store next door, which is why we were at that market in the first place. My mom was holding onto the bagel to make sure I didn't eat it too fast and choke, which I had done several times in the past. I wanted my bagel, and while I talked to this grown man who made me feel so smart and was oh so interested in my life, I liked bagels more. Plus, if I caught my mom when we were at the bakery section, I might be able to use my charm and cuteness to get a cookie. So I gotta find my mom now. Oh well, I'll walk around with you to help find her. You want to lead me through a marketplace you work at, where you can easily bring me to the back room, meat locker, or any number of places? Yeah, sounds good. Ozzy! I look around to see my mom. The relieved look on her face slowly changed into something more anxious. I smile happily and wave her over. She immediately grabs my hand, and I can tell she wants to chide me, probably for leaving the aisle. But she seems more occupied on the man in front of me. Before I can open my mouth to introduce him, or remember that I even got his name, he quickly says that he's glad I found my mom, and he needs to get back to work, and practically runs to the back of the store. My mom puts her hands on my shoulders and looks me in the eye, her expression a lot more worried now. What was he talking to you about? She asks, her voice more serious than I'd ever heard her. Can I have my bagel? My mom opens her mouth, pauses, and goes into her purse to hand me my bagel. Between bites, I happily tell her about the conversation and everything I remembered. My age, my grade, pickup schedule, likes and dislikes, my literal address, my mom gradually became paler, then became red with anger. She brought me over to the manager, and I don't remember much about the conversation. I got a cookie. I remember that pretty well. It was shaped like a watermelon, which was apparently far more important to me than paying attention to what was being said. The police were not called. We went home, and my mom told me I wasn't allowed to walk around the store anymore. No more talking to any strangers, even if they worked at the store that we were at unless she was with me. If I ever saw that man again, I was to run away, find someone I know, and ask for help. If all else fails, scream at the top of my lungs, just like when a fly lands on me. I agree pleasantly, not really phased by anything she's saying. I know that some people are bad, but bad people look bad, right? They talk mean, they look scary, and they try to grab you. But this guy didn't, so he wasn't bad, was he? But if my mom was saying it, then I would listen. I better enjoy that cookie, because we weren't going back to that store ever again. In exchange, I can get a donut once a month from our usual store. When I was around 12, our school had a safety assembly and was talking about the shady things adults do to get kids, in a very, very watered-down version of what they most likely wanted. And I'm sitting there, listening, and I suddenly realize, if my mom hadn't found me, something bad might have happened. If not in the store, then in front of my school. If not in front of my school in my house. It's been a little over a decade later. Now I'm 18, and I've never seen the guy again, and let's keep it that way. I apologize if this gets lengthy. There's a lot to unpack here. 
This happened to one of my best friends and I back in 2017, and I felt like it's worth sharing. For some backstory, my best friend Elise was dating this guy Mark in 2016. They broke up right as New Year's was approaching. I've known Elise for over a decade, but we didn't talk much while they were together. I ran into them once at a local coffee shop, hugged her, and was chatting a while, while Mark stared at me in disgust, as if Elise wasn't allowed to talk to her friends. At the time, I thought nothing of it, assuming he was just antisocial. I had no idea he would go on to ruin an entire year of my life. It's really fuzzy as to how Mark got in contact with me specifically. I believe Elise posted about her breakup, and I offered my support publicly, so he targeted me. It began on New Year's Eve. He started messaging me on Instagram over and over, threatening me. I was having a get-together with my then-boyfriend, two of my now ex-best friends, and my now ex-best friend's boyfriend. I remember seeing my notifications blowing up and ignoring it. Everyone else seemed more concerned than I was. I brushed it off until late that next day. I checked my phone and I had dozens of DMs from Mark, as well as a few public posts that he tagged Elise and I in, calling us every name in the book and claiming I was the reason they broke up. I answered his DMs, asking why he was targeting me. That was the biggest mistake I ever made. After some angry messages from him, he blocked me and I thought it was over. I also had some missed calls from Elise, so I finally contacted her and asked what was going on. She frantically told me that Mark was a dangerous man, and he's been tormenting her since the day they became a couple. He would throw her around his apartment, leaving awful bruises that she sent me photos of. He would threaten to commit suicide if she left him, and he even threw a hissy fit at a tattoo shop because they wouldn't tattoo Elise's first and middle name over his eyebrow. He got Crybaby instead. Elise also informed me that Mark had went to jail before meeting her for domestic abuse. He stabbed his ex-girlfriend in the leg and was only behind bars for a month before his dad bailed him out. With this new information, I was terrified. Elise told me where he lived and it was directly behind the coffee shop I mentioned earlier. I frequented that building and that part of town in general. That'll come into play later. I eventually calmed myself down and I forgot about him, until he got my phone number. I still don't know how he got it, but I woke up to 30 plus messages from him one day and I was horrified. His messages included threats to kill himself if I didn't help him and Elise get back together. Threats to kill me, cries for help, him blocking my number and then unblocking it just to start the cycle all over again. I, being very naive, and not wanting to be held responsible if he actually killed himself, did not block him. I asked him to leave me alone, and if he wanted a hotline to where he could get some help, and he pretended to calm down for a bit. I gave him the number after many messages from him saying how much he missed Elise, but also wanted to kill her. I told her immediately and pushed her to go to the cops, but she didn't. Her condition helped her believe that she would get into trouble if she reported him. This went on for months. I usually didn't respond, and when I did, he seemed to chill out for a bit. I'm skipping ahead to a particular night where Elise and I were hanging out at my house. We were chatting away on the phone, starting to light up. I ignored it and kept talking because I didn't want to be rude. Elise peeked at my phone and said, It's Mark. Look. Sure enough, Mark was bombing my phone with threats to slit his own throat because he knew Elise was at my house calling us both the C word and claiming it would be our fault if he died that night. I didn't answer, but what came next is something that still haunts me to this day. He sent a video, and being curious, I clicked on it. Elise watching over my shoulder. The video was of Mark's arm, a huge gash going down the middle. He was fake crying in the background saying, you made me do this, I hate you both. He clenched his fist over and over again to make more blood squish out. Elise and I were so in shock that we watched the entire 50 second clip, despite how disturbing it was. I immediately called our local police station. Elise gave him his address and an officer came to my house to view the video and take down some notes. While we waited for the police to arrive, 
Mark posted the gruesome video to his Instagram and unblocked Elise and I just to tag it, claiming we told him to do it. Being a conventionally attractive guy, the girls that swooned over him commented some pretty harsh things about us and kissed his butt like crazy. He was admitted to the hospital that night, and I wish they kept him. The harassment continued the second he got out. Time traveling a little more now to a few months later. Mark hadn't let up, and Elise and I were still very close. We had a friend, Kayla, visiting from across the country. She also had a run-in online with Mark and hated him, but wasn't afraid of him. She was always carrying more than one weapon, some pepper spray, and she knew how to fight. So she suggested we go take a walk in the part of town he lived in. She wanted to visit that coffee shop, see some of our small businesses, and then grab dinner at a pizzeria. Elise and I reluctantly agreed. We parked in front of the coffee shop, grabbed some drinks, and started walking down the road. Within about five minutes, Mark drove by on his motorcycle. Elise and Kayla were immersed in conversation as I trailed behind. I looked up and made eye contact with Mark. Elise and Kayla noticed him as he was speeding off. Kayla assured us he wouldn't get anywhere near us with her around, so he kept walking. Mark began circling the block we were walking on with his bike. As we crossed to the next block, he switched to that block and circled it too. On the third block was the pizza place. Their walls are all glass. All see-through, of course. We went in and were seated in the corner, right next to the glass. We sat there for about an hour and a half, eating, talking, and sipping on soda. Mark circled the restaurant the entire time, and we did our best to ignore him. Once we were finished up and got to leave, Mark sped off and we didn't see him again that evening. Some time passed, and Mark began riding by Elisa's house every night. Within a week, he started doing the same to me. I told my parents and my stepdad, who kept a close eye on the street. My mom always made sure our doors and windows were locked and shades were shut before going to bed. My dad would even do a nightly patrol where he would drive around my street for a few minutes on his way home from work since he no longer lived there. He would call me and let me know that the coast was clear as he was leaving. I still woke up almost every night to the sound of his motorcycle engine revving outside my house. We had no proof of this to show the police because he was somehow doing this without a trace, so we did not bother reporting it. At the end of 2017, Mark took his motorcycle and sped off to California to avoid the legal trouble he'd gotten in here. Elise and I were relieved, to say the least. He still harassed us from time to time, but he never came back. We stopped hearing from him after a while, and we thought nothing of it. Fast forward one last time to September 2019. Elise and I were out and about, enjoying the sunshine, when she got a phone call. Mark was dead. He had died right after his calls and messages to us stopped. He got into his car with his new drug dealer in Arizona and pissed them off enough for them to shoot him. He died instantly. He also caught two more domestic violence charges in California and Arizona and was on the run from his warrant. His father told everyone it was an accidental overdose because Mark was known for abusing Xanax and other miscellaneous drugs. But it was fun to cover his sociopath son's butt. I'm not sure if Mark's death was karma or some higher being protected us and all of those girls. He's hurt before and would hurt in the future, but he's gone. We never have to worry about our safety because of him again, although seeing photos of him still does give me the creeps. I am a 26-year-old woman who has lived in Alaska my whole life. This will become important later when you see just how far this person would try to go and be with me. This all happened a few years back when I was in college. Like any woman at that age, I made a grave mistake of attempting online dating to disastrous consequences. I was using OkCupid to try and find a potential partner, but I also had it listed in my bio that I was looking for real friends. One day this girl, who we will call Jen, messaged me. She seems nice, and we got to talking and really hit it off, but I made it clear that at the time I wasn't looking for a relationship due to being preoccupied with work and school. I should preface the rest of this story by saying that I like to help people and it's really hard for me to not. Honestly, it's the biggest flaw I've had over the years and was a contributing factor in multiple abusive relationships that I've been in before. 
end since this incident. Anyways, the result of this has been that I tend to train myself to try and help others, and it attracts unsavory and unstable people. We started going into conversations about our various interests, and eventually we stumbled across gaming as a mutual interest. Jen suggested we play this new game, Ark Survival Evolved. It's a cursed rune of a game that wasn't very well optimized for any system. To be honest, it was an absolute dumpster fire of a game, but at the time I thought it had a lot of potential. So I spent countless hours making various bases and trading dinosaurs and getting into the whole bit of brave explorer of a new world kind of thing. Jen and I spent a lot of time in the multiplayer, building things, and training dinos and talking and having a good time. During this time, she opened up to me about a lot of the abuse that she had suffered from past relationships and from a family that didn't accept her being gay. Having also been through some difficult times, I felt a lot of empathy for her and I would try to build her and talk her out of her self-hating talk when I had the energy to. This is when the trouble started though. I noticed that she was being a bit too friendly with me and kept overly being sexual and flirty for a week or two. It started with in-game RP kind of stuff, where you do the asterisk kisses and hugs thing, and it was really just all too much. She was really nice, but totally not my type. I had addressed the situation multiple times, saying that it had made me feel very uncomfortable, but every time we had that conversation, Jen would tell me that she understood and she would back off. You know the drill, but it never really got through to her. By this time, we had started having communications on a chat app called Telegram. I wasn't always on my computer, so it seemed like a convenient solution. I've started noticing that a lot of the emojis she was using displayed a very similar lack of respect for my boundaries. Just as before, I had mentioned to Jen that it made me feel uncomfortable. I knew she had a lot going on upstairs, but me being me, I have always had a very gentle soul. It's always been very difficult for me to set firm boundaries, and to keep those, especially when somebody is suffering. One weekend was very packed with homework and a double shift at work, so I ended up getting home very late. I booted up the computer just to check some emails as I ate my dinner of Top Ramen before zonking out. When Steam loaded, I noticed that I had hundreds of missed messages and comments, all from Jen. I started from the top, and as I read through, things became progressively more and more out of control. By the time I was halfway through, Every other message was either calling me names or threatening to kill herself if I didn't reply. I had seen enough, so I just sent a message that her behavior was unacceptable. But I can't be friends with somebody who is going to be abusive like this. I blocked her on Steam and on Telegram. And this is where it really hits the fan. About 30 minutes later, my phone starts going off. Mind you, this is about 12.30am Alaska time, so that would make it about 3am for her. She called my cell phone number with what she had saved from Telegram. She was absolutely out of control. From the moment I picked up the phone, she was screaming obscenities and slurs at me, interspersed with confessions of love and desperate pleas for me to unblock her so we could just be friends again and that she would make it up to me and all that crap. I tried to explain to her that what she had done was out of line and that I didn't have the emotional capacity to go through another abusive friendship but she was having absolutely none of it. I did the only thing I could do. I ended the call and blocked the number. Five minutes later, I get a call from an unrecognized private number, and I pick up, knowing exactly what I was in for. It was her again, calling from her parents' landline. I immediately hung up. Fifteen seconds goes by and my phone rings again, and I dismiss the call. My phone rang about five minutes later from the same number, this goes on for a solid 15 minutes before I just turned my phone off and I went to bed. It was a fairly sleepless night, but thankfully the next day I had class in the evening, so I had an opportunity to sleep in. I woke up from an okay sleep and turned my phone on to find over 100 missed calls and about as many voicemails. I checked my telegram to talk to a different friend about the chaos that was going on to find new messages from six new accounts. Most of them were just walls of text, filled with some same out-of-control ramblings that she had said on the phone. They were the texts of someone who had completely lost it. All over the place in tone and message, switching back and forth between I love you and slurs, with little regard for spacing, punctuation, capitalization, 
or general legibility. I was horrified. I mean, I had seen my fair share of breakdowns, but never ones that impacted me directly. Then I get a phone call. Same unknown private number. Hoping she had calmed down enough to listen to reason, I picked up, and she started in sobbing and screaming unintelligibly at me. Starting right back in. I got so mad and I screamed into the phone for her to shut up. And for the first time in what was probably about 14 hours, she did. Very clearly, I told her to not call me again and that she had gone way over the line, and that I wanted nothing to do with her after this. In a calm monotone that still makes me shudder to this day, she said, What do I do to prove my love for you? Do you want me to kill myself? How about my dog? I can kill her for you. Honestly, I was so shocked, I just told her no, and that if she loved me, she would move on and get help. This was the worst possible answer. Immediately, she started screaming again, so I just hung up and turned my phone off. She called me back constantly for the rest of the morning until I turned off my phone. The next day, I went in and I got my number changed. Hopefully, that would be the end of it. A few days passed and I'm at work. My boss comes over saying that I had a phone call for my mom. I thought nothing of it until I picked up the phone and I heard Jen's voice on the other end. She started in talking about how she had been cutting herself and how she would keep going until she was dead if I didn't unblock her. So I hung up the phone without a word. I told my boss to not bother me with phone calls unless it was from a known listed number on my emergency contact file. With my new phone, I set up Telegram again and started going through blocking all of her alternate accounts. But that still wasn't the end of it. For about six months after this whole thing went down, every few weeks I would get a new Telegram contact on a new number begging me to unblock her so we could be together. I know it's not some big climatic ending, but honestly what could I do? All I knew of her at the time was her first name, her screen name, and her state. If I had reported it to the police, nothing would have been done anyways. The cops here don't take kindly to queer people like myself, so I just didn't want to risk any BS with them. And to Jen, the out of control person who was making my life miserable, I've hope you gotten help. I truly do. I've been debating if I wanted to post this story because it was so unnerving. However, with all this COVID-19 and quarantine, I figured that I might as well share a story in order to kill some time. For the past two years, I've been working at a haunted house attraction. It's a really fun gig, but the job does tend to attract some rather creepy individuals. For the last two years that I've worked there, there's always been some kind of creep that works there. I had one very creepy incident that happened my first year of working there, but this story in particular will recount my second year's creepy incident. I'll start with the story with Orientation Day. This is where we met all of the fellow actors and chose our roles. When I walked into the building, my heart fell to the pit of my stomach. A man who looked like the same creeper from my first year at the haunted house was waiting for orientation to start, but I knew that it couldn't possibly be the same man, because the man from my first year had killed himself months ago. And to make matters even stranger, this man even had the same name, Daniel. So I first thought that this was all just a wild coincidence. There was no way this man will also turn out to be a creep. But I was wrong. Allow me to describe Daniel. He was a man probably in his 40s or early 50s. He was a short and pudgy man, from the beginning, everyone could kind of tell that he was a little socially awkward, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he really did kind of creep me out, and most of the workers. Additionally, he couldn't drive, so he was either super early to work or very late, and he was usually the last to leave. So overall, he was a peculiar fellow. But hey, we were all working at a peculiar job. Orientation came and went without any issues, and soon the attraction started. To understand the story, let me explain where I was located in the attraction. I was located in a large maze outside of the main house with about five other guys, including Daniel. These five guys were scattered throughout the maze, and I was at the center in a large rectangular room. This room was enclosed, unlike the rest of the maze, and it had two exits. All of the guys besides Daniel were around my age, which was 18. 
Honestly, I don't even know whose brilliant idea it was to put a lone girl in a large maze with five guys. Thankfully, I was somewhat friends with one of the guys, so I didn't feel too alone. However, this friend was located at the tail end of the maze. Daniel was located decently close to my room, but that didn't bother me at first. There was no reason for Daniel or any of the other guys to enter my room. They all had their own positions to handle. One other thing to understand about this maze is that all of the actors were still able to see one another because the walls in the maze were relatively short. So despite being far away from my friend, I was still able to see him. Now I hope I explained that clearly. Nothing strange occurred the first two nights, but on the third night, Daniel made his move. When no customers were going through the attraction, the actors would just walk around the maze or sit on the ground to relax. During these times, I would leave my room and either sit on the ground somewhere or enter the maze house to grab a water bottle. In order to enter the main house, I would have to go through the maze and past Daniel's area. The first few times I did this, Daniel said nothing and would just watch me. On the third day, he finally mustered up the courage to say, Hey, how are you? Not thinking anything of it, I happily replied and carried on to fetch a water bottle. From then on, any time I passed him, he would always have some comment. It was harmless things at first, like, Oh, you're really good. The weather's nice out here. You're a pretty scary actor. So other than him having to say something, I really didn't think too much of it. Days continued on, and Daniel kept getting a little braver. In between breaks, he would awkwardly walk towards the center of the maze. He moved really slow, like he was trying to be stealthy. My only saving grace was that before he could reach my room, a group of customers would begin to approach, and he would have to run back to his position. This is when alarm bells started to ring. I knew there was no reason for Daniel to leave his position and come to mine. Now whenever I saw that he was motioning towards my room, I would go out the other direction in hopes to put more distance between us. It didn't help that he was dressed in a scary costume and wearing a mask. This only added to the attention. This only added to the tension. On the times where I chose to sit on the ground and wait for customers, Daniel would go through the maze and stand where a single wall separated us. Looking back, I should have just walked away, but I didn't want to come off as a rude teenager. This is when he introduced himself, even though we already did that on orientation day. Trying to play nice, I introduced myself and we shook hands. Then he said the words that I'll never forget. You're beautiful. This caught me off guard that all I could say was, I'm sorry? He then repeated himself and kept his gaze locked on me. I very awkwardly replied, thanks, and refused to make eye contact with him. Keep in mind I'm an 18-year-old girl, and he's a man in his 40s, maybe 50s. I'm also covered in sweat, mud, and fake blood. Thoroughly creeped out, I was now determined to avoid him at all costs. Whenever we had breaks, I now went through the maze in the opposite direction of Daniel in order to get to the main house. It was a longer route, but it was worth it. And Daniel soon noticed this, and now put more of an effort in walking towards my room between breaks. There were several times where he actually entered the room, but thankfully I had the wits to leave the room entirely and go stand out where my friend was. Daniel would just stand in my room, look around, and one time he sat down on the floor. It was actually comical sometimes to see him standing in my room, realize customers were coming, and then rush out of there and back into his position. Sadly, with how dark the maze was, I couldn't always keep a sharp eye on Daniel's whereabouts. There was one incident where he approached me unexpectedly and said, I like the way you scream. One of my lines that I said in the attraction to customers was, You can't leave me. I need you. And Daniel just absolutely ate that up and loved it. Well, you can bet after he said that he liked me, that line, I stopped using. Well, you can bet after he said that he liked that line, I stopped using it. I had to endure a month of this, but over time Daniel got the message that I was not interested. In retaliation, he began to steal my scare points. There were certain areas near my room that I would pop out of and scare customers. These scare points were accessible to the other actors, but no one else used them but me. I suppose Daniel was mad that I wasn't giving him any attention, so he decided to steal my scare points as revenge. He also began to copy some of my lines. Thankfully, towards the end of the haunt season, the managers of the attraction moved me inside the main house. 
I'm not sure why, because I didn't say anything to them about Daniel, even though I know I should have. So for the final days working there, I was nowhere near Daniel. When the season ended, I was relieved. However, the managers had the bright idea to open a Christmas-themed haunted house, and they asked me to work out. I loved the job and didn't plan on having a creep ruin it for me. Although many actors from the Halloween season didn't return for the Christmas attraction, Daniel was not one of them. He was there, and boy was he thrilled to see that I returned as well. This time, however, I convinced my best friend to work there. So with my best friend being there, she sort of acted as a deterrent for Daniel. Throughout the whole season, he never approached me. Well, that was until the final night. My friend and I were chilling in one of the rooms and waiting on customers. This room was the first room in the attraction, so everyone else was passing through in order to get to their positions. Daniel began to pass through, then suddenly turned back around to face my friend and me. Again, with those beady, never-blinking eyes, he said, I think you two are beautiful. I just cringed and looked away, as my friend shyly replied, Thank you. So overall, Daniel was pretty creepy, but I suspect that maybe he doesn't know what he's doing wrong. I don't think he really realizes that flirting with young girls and trying to be in a room alone with them is okay. I caught word that he might be autistic, but I don't know for sure. But the feeling of dread I had in that maze is a feeling that I'll never forget. In retrospect, I should have told somebody. I kept telling myself that if Daniel did one more thing or tried to enter my room again, that I would tell the managers. One thing I can think of that at least lightens the mood is that his costume was literally Tree Man. His mask was just a tree with a contorted scary face. Many customers would walk by, they would all shout, Hey look, it's Groot. It got a laugh out of me every time. So Daniel, maybe you're just looking for love, but you're looking in all the wrong places, man. I'm going to tell you the story of a terrifying old creep that has stalked me since I was 16 years old. Basically, to set the scene, I'm an average height, average size 20-year-old female. I've been told I'm very approachable and perhaps too nice to strangers. I sometimes just don't have the heart to tell people to screw off, but I definitely should. Obviously, I'm not going to give specific details, but I work in a restaurant which was inside a bigger shopping center. My stalker an old man named Eric, worked for the actual shopping center itself, and not a store inside it like me. When I was 16 and first started the job, I was quite timid and awkward, and I'd let anybody say pretty much anything to me. I didn't quite know what to say when older customers and other employees would make inappropriate comments to me. I would simply just laugh off whatever people would say, or not respond. In my 16-year-old mind, this was a lot easier to handle. I had one other friend at my job who was my age. Her name was Jessica. Jessica had worked there for longer than I had. And one day she asked me if I heard of this guy who worked in the shopping center named Eric. Jessica described Eric as very strange. She didn't describe him as frightening or unsettling. Or even someone to be afraid of. Just as a very eccentric man. Really, she and other employees would laugh at his odd sayings and awkward behavior. Jessica had also told me that Eric had brought her a present on Valentine's Day. Chocolate. Anybody would think this was friendly behavior, or harmless flirting, if he wasn't a 50-something-year-old man bringing chocolates to a 16-year-old girl that he barely knows. I began to see for myself that Eric wasn't just an innocent old man with a slight crush. He had other intentions. The first time I remember Eric approaching me was when I was filling up a machine near the entrance of my work. This machine was out of the view of all the other employees, and the restaurant was empty, so this was pretty much the perfect time for a creep to approach without being seen. Eric wasn't supposed to enter my place of work when he was working at the shopping center, so he had deliberately gone out of his way to come and speak to me. To describe his appearance, he's your typical creepy old loner. He was gaunt, had gray hair with bald patches, and had beady little eyes, which he never adverted from yours, and I can't get them out of my head till this day. Eric must have sneaked up on me. As I looked up, he was standing right next to me, a little too close. I could feel his breath on my cheek. My name is Lucy. Eric asked me, Lucy, are you married? He almost giggled after he asked me this, 
He had a smirk on his face which made me feel as if he was trying to pretend that he thought I was older than I was. And at 16, I looked 16. Eric liked to ask me questions that he already knew the answer to, just to see what my reaction would be, letting me know in his own way that he'd been looking up information about me on social media. He would do this frequently. I began to clock onto the fact that Eric had been going a little further than just approaching me at work and instead stalking my social media accounts in the weeks following this first encounter, such as Twitter and Instagram, when he'd asked me very specific questions about the things I posted about in the days before. For example, I had posted on Instagram about a tattoo I got, which was an homage to my favorite band. I was serving a customer one day, only to be interrupted by a shrill but quiet voice. It was Eric. His eyes were huge, and he had a look of pure excitement and menace on his face. He had yet again entered my workplace when he wasn't supposed to, just to talk to me. He asked me, Lucy, what's your favorite song from this specific band? Eric relished in my discomfort. You could see by my reaction that I was clocking on the fact that he had been viewing my personal social media, and the thought of that made my blood run cold. I felt disgusted and violated. The tattoo I had gotten was covered by my work uniform, so the only way that he could have seen it was by going through my Instagram page. This creeped me out majorly, but somehow I just forced myself to forget all about it and I carried on working. Over the course of a few months, Eric would come into my workplace more and more frequently, asking me bizarre questions and still reciting back to me things that I tweeted about or posted on Instagram. Every time I would see him, I would get visibly uncomfortable and he liked this. This is what he wanted. All while this was happening, Jessica approached me and let me know that Erica had followed her in his car on her walk home from work, slowing down to ask her where she lived. I had also been told other disturbing news about Eric from multiple different people. It seemed as if he was becoming more invested in whatever his intentions were towards me and Jessica. News had traveled to one of my managers about Eric's unsettling actions towards me and this manager informed me that a few years ago Eric was rumored to have followed a young girl who used to work for our restaurant into a toilet. Things didn't quite make sense to me. He was known for being a creep, yet still employed at the shopping center? On one hand, I was glad to know I wasn't just creeped out for no reason, but on the other hand, I was frightened, as he'd been doing this for years, but nobody had stopped him. There was a woman who worked at the same place of me, called Rebecca, and she had some sort of disability, which caused her to befriend and be trusting to people without knowing anything about them. It seems that Eric took advantage of her, as he had asked for her phone number, and she gave it to him. Rebecca had shown me her text with Eric. He had texted her things like, Rebecca, are you alone? And Rebecca, are you sitting on the bus alone? But the most unsettling part of it was the text from Eric that read, Rebecca, could you please let me know any information on the girls that work at the restaurant? I was stunned. This was quite slowly turning into a nightmare. I was constantly questioning why this old man was so hell-bent on finding out everything to do with my life. Why me? He'd gone out of his way to source information about me through a vulnerable person I worked with, and I was scared he was going to go further. Again, this creeped me out, but still, for some reason, I forgot about it and carried on with my life, which was very hectic at the time. And in a way, I'm grateful that I didn't have the time to dwell on Eric's grown obsession. However, this was something I wouldn't be able to ignore forever, as Eric began inserting himself into my life in ways I couldn't just ignore or brush off. One night, I was watching the movie Grease with my family, and I must have tweeted something stupid, like Grease is my favorite film, because it is a great film, right? The morning after my tweet, Eric approaches me in his usual way and utters, Do you like the film Grease, Lucy? The same usual smirk lit up his face, and the same usual wave of disgust washed over me. I tried to carry on with my day, but spent the entirety of my shift feeling a little shaken up. To someone reading the story, it may not seem as unsettling to you as it did to me at the time, but when someone is going out of their way to make sure you know they know information about you, you spend every waking hour thinking about what they plan to do with this information. 
and why they insist on taunting you with this knowledge. The very second I clocked out of work, I got into my car, and my phone went off. It was a notification for PayPal. I clicked on this notification to see that I had received something from Eric Stanley, and the note attached to it read, To Lucy, graces the word from Eric. He literally found my PayPal account and sent me a quote from the movie attached to it along with some money. If this wasn't crazy enough, in the days following I received a string of anonymous calls. Calls one after the other. I was in floods of tears and ended up having a huge panic attack. I felt like there was no escape. My phone rang and rang and rang all night. I had to turn it off to get away. Even when I turned my phone back on, the calls continued, and every time my phone would ring, my head felt like it was being impaled with the sharpest knife in the world. I was on complete edge. The phone calls that I did answer were just someone breathing down the phone, making a point to breathe heavy. I even swear that they were trying to sound like they were doing things to themselves, which sickened me. I had no proof that this was Eric but it wasn't hard to put two and two together after all the lengths he had gone in order to track down my personal info. If he had found out my PayPal address, my phone number, and all my social media accounts, what was stopping him from finding out where I lived, breaking in, hurting me or my family? That night I had horrific dreams in which he chased me around my house and taunted me for hours. I still have similar dreams and struggle to sleep without my boyfriend present as I'm scared he's standing right outside my door to this day. I reported Eric to my managers, and they passed my complaints on to the managers of the shopping center. At this point, I was genuinely scared for my safety. Multiple girls added to my statement and added details of times they had witnessed Eric's unsettling behavior, or times that he had been inappropriate with them too. Eric had been cautioned by the shopping center's management, yet nothing was done, except for the fact that he was warned not to talk to me. But Eric found ways around the whole no talking to Lucy rule. He would make animal noises at me when he would see me, like a monkey, or a dog, or any bizarre noise that would get my attention. I think he just wanted me to think that he outsmarted me, found a way around the rules. After this, I stopped working at the restaurant as a full-time job, and saw Eric less and less, which was obviously great for me. I moved cities as I went away for university and made new friends which distracted me from my old life in my hometown. I still thought about Eric every now and then, and when I focus on it for too long, I can't be alone, out of fear that he is still keeping tabs on me. The thought of that terrifies me. After moving away and starting my new life, I forgot all about the twisted little man who used to obsess about me at my old job. I forgot he existed, but I was soon going to remember. On Christmas Day, I was back home, in my hometown with my parents. My phone buzzed and I expected it to just be another message from a friend or a family member, but I was wrong. I received a notification from PayPal and it was the same amount of money, only not from Eric this time, but from a girl whose name I did not recognize at all. I opened up the PayPal app only to see a note attached to this payment I received. The note said, sending on behalf of Eric. My blood ran cold again. I had forgotten all about this man and all that he had done to make me feel unsafe and unsettled, and here he was again, antagonizing me, yet this time doing it through other people. Perhaps his way of telling me that him being banned from talking to me himself won't stop him from entering my world. I threw my phone down on the couch and spent the night drinking with family until I forgot about the notification. I probably should have told somebody about it, but I just wanted to do as much as I could to block him out. I didn't want him to control me anymore, and I since haven't seen or heard from him, and I wanted to stay that way. I think Eric still works at the shopping center and lives local to me. I avoid my old workplace so I don't have to see him, and he doesn't have to see me. So to the creepy beady-eyed freak that made me live in fear, I'm glad I'm never seeing you again. The course of events in this story happened from 2007 to 2012. However, the actual terrifying encounter in this story happened exactly on 2012, two years after my graduation. So like others who cannot get over with their horrifying encounters, you're not alone. 
since that encounter still remains fresh in my mind until now. Before we start with the story, let me tell you a short history about my father and his family's struggle and life in the early days as an immigrant in U.S. My family currently lived in Pennsylvania, Lancaster to be exact, but before that my paternal side hails from Romania. They migrated to U.S. in 1964. My paternal grandfather fled to the West during the last days of World War II. He was not a soldier nor a collaborator during the war. Being just a regular civilian, he fled to the West due to the widespread bombings. He also feared of getting killed since their house was already damaged by a bomb during an air raid in 1944. Luckily, they survived. When he fled, he was already married and had one kid who was my oldest paternal uncle. They settled and lived in France for 19 years. My paternal grandpa went into several jobs to earn money there. My dad, along with his siblings, were also born and raised there. By the time, when they finally migrated to the U.S., my father was just five years old. My dad was the fourth out of five children. After migrating to the U.S., they arrived in New York, penniless. They experienced being homeless, beggars in the streets for days, until my paternal grandfather, along with his older son, my uncle, went into several jobs until they were able to make much money and rent an apartment. My paternal grandmother also found a job as a cleaner in various parks, and usually my father, along with his two older sisters, my paternal aunts, and his younger brother, my younger paternal uncle, would come there to help her. After that, my father, along with his siblings, would study and work there for a long time. They were all able to finish primary and secondary education. To be short, they became working students during their time there studying. My dad, along with his siblings, also studied college there. They were lucky enough to finish their studies and find a stable job. My dad planned on applying as a teacher after moving to another state since education was his course on college. Unfortunately for his brother, he didn't finish his education due to his vices. Instead of using his money to enroll in the college, he would use it to drink in the bar, buy cigarettes, and the worst, he used it to buy drugs. Sometimes he would even get into fights with his older siblings, including my dad, for allegedly stealing their cash to use it for his own luxury. They really feel sorry for him. After their parents found out what's happening to him, they forced him to rehabilitate himself for the longest time and was only able to walk free by 1981 from the rehabilitation center. Like he promised to them, he had already changed for the better by the time he was released. Destiny also gave him a second chance. He was able to find a stable job and meet a woman who gave him all the love and time when they got married. It would take years for my father and his family to find a comfortable life. His three siblings did move to other states. However, my paternal grandfather and grandmother decided to just move into Plattsburgh. My younger paternal uncle also decided to live so close to them so he can keep an eye on them since they are already old. My father would finally move to Pennsylvania in 85. His other siblings moved as early as 1983. He settled and lived in Lancaster, and he also found a job there as a school teacher. Soon after, he will meet and date my mom there until they got married. When I was a kid, Romanian language became the first language for me since I was always close with my dad. I admit I am a daddy's boy. My mom, however, was very busy. My mom, however, was always busy with her work as a nurse in a hospital while my dad just worked as a high school teacher. I grew up with no siblings, so honestly, I was the only child, and it was so boring for me since I don't have a younger brother or sister to play and interact with. It took several years for me to fully understand and learn how to speak English. Honestly, that was hard. During elementary, I am a total loner. I don't have any friends. And the worst part is I was ridiculed whenever I tried to speak English, since I was always stuttering whenever I tried to do it. So to be simple, I can compare myself to an alien during my childhood. A kid with no friends. A kid who was always a whipping boy and a kid who had nothing to defend himself from the judgments he received. My parents were always here for me though, so even when I get bullied, there would be somebody there who could stand up for me. I don't want to bring back all the harm on those kids. By that time, I just wanted to live in peace and harmony along with them, so I just ignored the bullies. As time passed by from 4th to 6th grade, 
I was able to make some friends since my parents noted to my advisor that I had troubles about communicating in English. Luckily, like a gift from heaven, my mom had a friend who was fluent in Romanian. He volunteered to translate what I'm saying without asking any payment in exchange. So he became my interpreter until I was able to fully speak and understand English. At least my stress had been reduced when I was in 4th to 6th grade, since my parents explained my problem to the school authorities so they allowed my mom's friend to translate what I'm saying while at school every day. My advisors every school year knew about my situation. They were good and kind to me. My classmates also knew my problem, and they seemed to be good and humble to me as well. My bullying experiences also started to dwindle as those kids who bullied me received a hard-earned lesson from the school authorities. During that time, my parents also enrolled me to an English tutorial school. The schedule of classes there was every weekend. I would frequently attend the school mostly on summer. Most of the kids who attended that school were the same as me. They also can't speak and understand English. When I was in high school, my abilities to communicate and understand English seemed to improve well. Now I was able to make friends easily, but I would still stutter sometimes, which would make some students laugh. But I no longer experienced bullying that much since I was a consistent honor student until I finished high school. In 2007, when I was 19, I moved to Harrisburg to study college. I'll be spending four years studying there. Due to privacy reasons, I won't mention the name of the college I went to. During my first month there, life was absolutely great. I lived in a dormitory along with other male students, since our dorms are separated from girls. Our class had many activities to deal with during the first month, so it was hard for me to have some time to talk with my parents or relax. I also felt stressed and pressured at first, but I soon realized that I will grow up and become more responsible when dealing with our activities. The campus also housed some students with strange and weird personalities. I could tell that I had several encounters with odd students. Some encounters are funny, but some are also sketchy. But I accepted the fact that all of us in the campus had different personalities. I made a lot of friends during my first year. One of them was Terry, who became my best friend during most of the college years. Bullying is not an issue on the campus, since the system was very good. I also started to actively participate in school clubs or extracurricular activities in the campus, a thing that would make me more socialized. When going back to my hometown and enjoying time with my family, it only happens fully on summer. However, on summer breaks or holidays like Christmas break, we usually spent our time working on projects and presentations while at home. On weekends, we are not spared from every activity and assignment so we usually spend weekends typing on laptops and researching rather than relaxing and having time with our families. In 2008, when I was a sophomore in college, I met this girl named Laura, who has recently transferred to the university. I met her when Terry and I went to the girl's dormitory as he talked with her girlfriend, Christine. By that time, Laura happens to be Christine's roommate, and they were both friends as well. During our stay there, Laura began asking me several questions like, do I have a girlfriend? She also stated how she would like to date a boy like me. I can say that she's clearly into me, but my main focus by that time was my studies. I also claimed that she is only kidding at the time, so I just continued to answer her questions as simple as I could without making a sign that I was interested in her. I've never had a girlfriend, but I planned on getting one after I graduated. But by that time, there was a long road for me to walk. A day passed by, and I became a topic on Laura's friends. She apparently told her friends about me, and yes, I became a hot topic to them. Meanwhile, Terry and I decided to not say it out loud. We just decided to tell a few trusted friends. However, as time went by, Laura started texting me. She was able to get my number via Terry. Actually, he had my phone number. Since we are close friends, we have been ever since my first year in college. But believe me, it was upsetting at first, since it was sensitive information but I managed to accept it as my best friend provided a deep explanation for me to understand. I admit at first it was hard to talk to her since I'm busy on my studies and I don't have any interest on flirting with her, but I lately realized that I shall grab the opportunity as Terry told me that Laura is really serious on flirting with me, so I made a life-changing decision. When I texted her back, we started talking on the phone about various things about love. After that, we started meeting in person until we started dating and officially she became my girlfriend after several dates. 
During our relationship, we both exchanged questions to each other. To be exact, she asked me where I lived. I told her that I lived in Lancaster, while she told me that she lived somewhere else. It was normal since people who engage in relationships wouldn't expect to have their hometown asked by their fellow partner. I started meeting her every day. Her calls and texts would become more prevalent than usual. She also introduced me to her friends. They seemed to like me, and I was able to get along with them. As time passed by, I started to know more about her. However, she was starting to become overprotective in our relationship, and she also started to become annoyed whenever I failed to meet her on time. At first, it was nothing, since I knew that girls like her wanted a good relationship. However, as time passed by, I decided to talk about my time on my studies. At first, she was upset, but the deeper I explained to her, convinced her to approve my decision. Our relationship continued on the course of the college years without any conflict, but only short arguments. But everything started to get out of hand during our fourth and final year of college. She changed a lot during the final year. She became paranoid to the extreme, doubtful, and envious. She would also start arguments even inside the campus, which would turn into a scene. It was very embarrassing for me. So one time I decided to become distant to her and focus more on my studies. However, one night while I was studying, I heard a knock on my door. My roommate was already asleep, so I assumed it must be Terry, so I opened it. However, I was wrong. It was Laura standing straight in the doorway. She had this look on her face while looking towards me. She began asking why I started to distance away from her. I explained everything to her, and that was it. She angrily left my dormitory without any words. I can even tell that she didn't even listen to what I said. One time while I was heading to my room after the end of our last subject, I saw her inside when I entered. She was vandalizing the room, and to make matters worse, she had been writing something in big letters that said, You are going to pay for this, on the walls. The sign was written in red. The letters looked like they were almost drawn in blood, and that creeped me out. I immediately took her outside to confront her, but she started to make a scene. It only stopped when the school authorities intervened. Afterwards, I explained everything to them, and it became sufficient evidence for Laura to be suspended for one week. My roommate and I relocated to another room in the dorms, since our previous room was cleaned up. However, the cleaners found broken glass under my bed while cleaning. Now I knew that she was up to no good with her intentions. After that, Laura started messaging me on my phone. The messages ranged from her deep explanations to profanities. She even started threatening me, which is creepy and far disturbing for me. So I had enough, and I decided to block her number. But it doesn't end there. The incident really changed my perspective on Laura but I'm thankful that I saw her true colors that shined very bad. After her suspension ended, I decided to break up with her. She didn't say any words at all, but her face looked as sick as a parrot, and she didn't show up for several days. I apologized to her when I broke up with her, but I also felt sorry for her, since I felt that she might be depressed. But as days passed, I saw her on the campus. She continued to attend classes, However, I didn't see her being accompanied by her friends. That made me think that our breakup was also a big impact on her friendship with her friends. However, I didn't expect that she would also use the social media to pour her anger into me. One time while I was surfing Facebook, I saw a post from Laura that shows my pictures. The post's captions had profanities. Those were intended to insult, so I had enough. I reported the post and blocked her on Facebook. I already had enough with her immaturity, so I did just the right thing. After our breakup, I gained the courage to talk to Terry and my friends. I decided to reconcile with them. Our relationship as brothers started to deteriorate when I started dating Laura, so I apologized to them. They accepted my apology and welcomed me back to the squad. One time I decided to ask Christine about Laura. She said that she didn't really move on and it made things worse. That's the reason why she requested another roommate to replace Laura. According to Christine, Laura's obsession to me caused her to be imprisoned in a quagmire. So to be simple, she became a prisoner of her own woes and misery. She changed a lot after the breakup. She would cry for the longest time, and sometimes she would swear uncontrollably inside the room. 
She also became delusional after our breakup. She continued to live in fantasy while denouncing the reality. Laura also started to show her darker side on them. She would get into fights with other students. She would even make threats. She also started to talk about dark and creepy stuff, which scared her friends. Scratch marks also appeared on her arm, which made her friends speculate that she's going to kill herself any time. So they confronted her, but it didn't help since she also became violent. She started throwing her objects violently, and she would even harass Christine and her friends. This caused them to distance themselves from Laura. Those things shocked me a lot. I expect that she will realize her wrongdoings and change for the best, but I was wrong. She changed for the worst. Afterwards, I didn't hear much about Laura. She didn't try to talk to me. In fact, she was always alone. She never even apologized to her friends, and it looked like she didn't have any interest on having friends anymore. Months passed by and I finally graduated. I was able to erase those bad memories on my mind and move on. After graduation, I decided to go back to Lancaster, where I would start my new life. Most of my friends who live in Harrisburg went to enjoy their new life by partying, while others went on vacation. My other friends who lived outside the city, meanwhile, returned back to their hometowns, where they celebrated their achievement with their family. All of them would celebrate before they would go into job hunting. Christine moved in with Terry. They both lived in one roof in the suburbs of Harrisburg. I stayed in contact with my friends. However, I didn't receive any news about Laura. I expect her to change and finally move on. Meanwhile, after summer, I went into a job hunting like other grads did. I was lucky enough to find a stable job in my hometown. The salary is good. My fellow coworkers are friendly and my boss is not a jerk, which is a plus and I easily got promoted due to my skills. I also decided to move out of my parents' house as I bought a new house to live in. I really expected that my life would be peaceful now. Laura's past actions were not a big concern for me now. I already planned on facing the future and not reversing on the past, and so I did. However, my expectations for a peaceful life was wrong. That doesn't end there. One evening after a long, stressful day at work, I was driving back to my home when I received a call from an unknown number. When I picked it up, there was just this breathing sound in the other end, so I hung up since I knew it was just a prank caller. However, when I was already at home, the number wouldn't stop calling, only for me to hear the same breathing sound on the other end. I then blocked the number and went to sleep. That morning, I saw something in the mailbox outside my house. The mail contained these words. I don't forgive and I don't forget, written in red. That reminded me of what Laura wrote on the walls of our room, but I threw it in the garbage since I knew it was just a prank from some kids. One afternoon, since my shift had already ended, I decided to go home. However, before I could even park my car in the garage, I saw this mail at the top of my mailbox. By this time it said, You can't run, you can't hide, you can't escape, written in red again. I decided to ask my neighbor about that mail in my box. He said that he saw a car hours ago pulling over on the side of the road, directly in my house. Then he saw a girl that went out, and she placed mail on top of the mailbox. That's when my heart dropped. That night I had so many questions. I knew it was Laura, but how could she know where I lived? My mind is full of questions until I received a call from a random number. I picked it up, and I heard a familiar voice saying, go outside. I have a gift for you. That's when I was shocked. It was Laura telling me to go out, but how could she possibly trace where I lived? That's my biggest question of all time. I made a deep breath and went out on my house, yelling for her to show up, but I was greeted by an eerie silence outside. Not a single car or person passed by the streets by that time, but then I heard a glass shattering behind me. When I looked back, I saw my front window broken. I was very angry at that point. I knew it was Laura, and I'm ready to confront her without knowing the dangers behind. I can't see anything, so I decided to check my window. As I went back to go inside my house, a rock hit me on the head. It nearly knocked me unconscious. That didn't stop there, though. There were rocks hitting me. It came from the woods, which is very close and parallel to my house. I got seriously hurt, so I dashed towards the front door and I slammed it shut. Then I saw pieces of broken glass on the floor. A brick was also on the floor. It had a saying, you made the wrong choice. 
I had enough and I called the police and explained the whole situation to them. Before the police arrived, I decided to take a peek to know if it was Laura. So I slowly opened my door since I had no peephole. But I was surprised when a brick suddenly landed on my front porch. And then I shut the door and waited for eternity. The police quickly arrived. I heard them yelling at someone. I then seeked through the broken windows to see the officer storming through the woods since my house was the very last on the block and the place is surrounded by trees. After minutes of waiting, the officers knocked on my door. I immediately opened it. They told me that they saw someone behind a tree near the side street before they got out of the car. The person is wearing all black. It also dashed back to the woods when the officers yelled at it. As they chased it, they ended up not finding the person. I told them exactly about my speculations about the person they saw, but they said that they could not just arrest a person without proper evidence. It was also hard for them to identify whether it was Laura or another person since the person they saw was wearing all black. I gave the brick with a sign to the officers so they can turn it into evidence, and after that they told me to call them if something happened again, and they left. The next few days nothing happened until one Friday night. While I was watching TV, I heard a hard thud coming from my front door. It sounded like a rock, so I decided to open the door for me to see another brick with a sign on it. The sign said, I can see you. That creeped me out a lot. And when I looked on the street, there was this white SUV parked directly on the other side street parallel to my house. I decided to confront whoever was there. But when I looked inside the SUV, it was blurred so I could not make up who was in there, or was it Laura or just another person. I decided to go back inside and close the door. As I felt sleepy, I decided to turn off everything. I went upstairs to my bedroom and I fell asleep shortly. I woke up by 2.15 a.m. in the morning. Strangely, the power was gone, so my aircon is turned off and it was hot, so I went to find out if there was a blackout, but there isn't, as my neighbor's lights downstairs were turned on. Now there must be someone who turned off the power switch that's in my basement. When I went out, it was very dark at all corners by that time. So I fetched my flashlight from my room and used it as I went downstairs. I saw that both front door and back door are closed, so I went to the basement. My basement had a door outside, however it has no lock, so someone could have broken in and turned the power off. As I went down to the basement, I switched the power on and all the electricity in the house is back once again, but the light also in the basement opened for me to see someone hiding behind the boxes. When I saw who that guy was, my heart dropped. It was Laura. She was wearing a white dress. Her face is unrecognizable since it had bruises all over. Her skin is pale white, and she was like the girl on the ring. She is not that Laura that I met in college, but she is something way worse. My heart started raising as she smiled and asked in a persuading voice, I wanted to be with you again, can we? I then aggressively yelled, No! Get out of here or I'm calling the cops. She stood and started walking towards me while also looking to my soul. She then pulled something on her back. It was a gun and she tossed one box on the floor, only for me to see her deranged obsession on me. It was all pictures of me on a collage scattered in the ground. She said that it was her intention to bring all of those with her in my basement. She also admitted to breaking into my room several times while I was in college. She then took one picture and it was the picture of me sleeping in my room in the dormitory. She showed it to me and said in a kidding voice, you are such a handsome guy, but you wasted such a beautiful diamond like me. So I'm gonna make sure that your life is gonna be a waste too. She then tore my picture into pieces and aimed the gun at me. I easily evaded it as she fired one shot that could surely wake my neighbors. I then dashed upstairs and tried to lock the basement door, only to fail as she fired another shot. It almost hit me, so I left it wide open as I quickly dashed upstairs back to my bedroom. I locked my door and hid in my closet. At first I heard her footsteps going room to room until it stopped at my door. She tried to open the door, but it was locked, so she began pounding and yelling in a frantic voice for me to open the door. Then there was a brief silence until she used enough force to break the door down. She began searching the whole room with her gun still drawn. Luckily, she passed my closet. She looked on my bed, but since the closet was behind her, 
I picked up my baseball bat inside the closet, which I always use for self-defense, and I took a deep breath. Since my closet door doesn't make that loud sound when I open or close it, that was not a problem anymore, but I still slowly opened the door and tiptoed silently to make sure that her attention wouldn't be drawn to me. Luckily, she didn't hear any noise, since she was just standing and staring at my bed like a statue. So before she could even stare back at me, I took another deep breath and presumed to hit her back with my baseball bat as hard as I could. It knocked her unconscious. I then tied her up to a chair so she couldn't escape. I called the police and I took her gun. The police arrived shortly. They entered my house. By that time, Laura started to regain her consciousness as she was handcuffed by the police. However, she began threatening me and even tried to attack me, but she ended up being tackled by the police officers. After that, I pressed charges against her. However, during her trial, she was declared mentally insane due to her behavior in the courtroom. This led her to be sent to a mental asylum instead. It was not a major concern for me anymore since the asylum had a strong and maximum security, so it would only be a pain on her if she tried to escape. Laura apparently had a mental disorder that encompasses extreme obsession, which is dangerous when left uncontrolled. She went into a psychiatric therapy during the course of her trial to determine if she was actually mentally insane. My friends and family knew the incident. I recount one time when I met with Terry and Christine in a bar, they explained Laura's ultimate fate after the graduation. She was apparently missing for 12 days after the graduation. Her older brother began contacting her friends, including them, but they didn't know where she went. However, one student did contact her brother and said that she was last seen in a bar, drinking. This concerned her brother very much, so he filed a missing persons report. However, he didn't receive any news after that. However, one faithful morning, she returned home crying, apparently. She walked kilometers to reach her home, and she slept in the streets for days. The reason? Her wallet was stolen in the bar, as she was drunk by that time. She arrived home penniless. Months passed by, and her brother started to witness her strange behavior. So he urged her to consult a psychologist, but she refused. Her brother was really concerned about her, so he still forced her to do so. This resulted in a conflict between them. After that, she left suddenly one morning, without leaving any mail, as her brother woke up and didn't see her anywhere in the house. He began coordinating with the police to track her down, but all of their efforts unfortunately failed. During her trial, Laura confessed in the courtroom that the firearm she brought that night was owned by her brother. Apparently, she stole the gun on her brother's drawer while he was sleeping that night, before her departure. She also admitted that she was behind on those phone calls, all the mail and the bricks being thrown at me. I recently found out that she was able to trace me by having some of my personal information. While we were still dating, I decided to give her some of my personal information. I gave her my phone number and told her where my hometown was since I trusted her very much by that time. When I moved into my new house, she was still able to track it by simply asking one of my neighbors if they know me. Of course they knew me, so it was a piece of cake for her to find where I lived. Honestly, one small mistake that I made almost killed me, yet I'm lucky enough to dodge this bullet. For now on, I wouldn't trust a person easily. I would observe the behavior and personality before I could fully trust them. I would also become more private of my personal information so I won't end up witnessing a random guy breaking into my house. This happened about two years ago, in my second year at university when I was 20. For some context, I'm French, so if anything's weird about how I describe my experience, that's why. At the time, I lived in a government-owned building on the third floor. My direct neighbor was my younger sister, who was studying in the same college that I was. One other thing that's important to the story is that I'm disabled. My right leg is useless after an accident I had when I was 13, and I suffer from horrible chronic pain to a degree that keeps me bedridden and nonverbal unless I take a twice a day dosage of prescribed morphine. All of that is important detail. When I take my medication, I am able to leave my bed. On the worst days, I have to either use a wheelchair or a cane to get around. So it's really nice that we live on the third floor building with no elevator. On top of that, as you might guess, morphine is a very strong pain medication. 
It screws with your visual and hearing perception. It makes you sleepy and dizzy, lessens your reflexes, numbs your nervous system. You get the idea. At the time, I had only been taking morphine for less than six months. After 10 years of various other pain medications, and I was still dealing with the side effects in full force, most of them are gone now. So for me, that meant mainly auditory hallucinations, sleepiness, dizziness, and bad reflexes and nervous response. At that point, I had gotten used to hearing stuff that wasn't there, mostly clapping noises, clicking noises, small things ultimately. I have never hallucinated human voices. That night I had gone out to the center of the city to meet with some friends. This was a rare occasion for me, and I do mean rare. I didn't go out more than once every two months or so, for multiple reasons that my friends, bless them, understood perfectly. Morphine means no drinking, so that's half the fun of going to a bar removed from the start. Despite the very useful nature of the meds, I was still, and am still, in a tremendous amount of pain if I stand for more than a couple of minutes, and I was sure to do a lot of that at the bar, plus walking back from the bus stop to my building, about a five minute walk, but I went anyways, like I did exceptionally. For a few days there had been rumors going around, about a group that was going around kidnapping people from my school. From memory, two girls had disappeared already and it was suspected that a blue van was the vehicle being used. Those reports were circulating on our majors group, and on the UNI group as well. About the same details each time, but my friends and I were skeptical, mainly about the blue van, because we didn't believe the van would still be running around if the information had spread enough that we were hearing about it on Facebook, you know? Not that I was thinking about any of that as I came back from the bar around midnight, but I was in a lot of pain, and the bus stops at half past midnight. And missing it would mean waking up my sister so she could pick me up at the tram station, since I was physically unable to walk the 20 minutes required. I got onto the bus. Only three people were there, and none got out at my bus stop. Now bear in mind that I was in an extreme amount of pain, so much that my vision was blurring out on the edges, and I was swaying a bit from side to side, trying to minimize the weight being put on my leg. On top of that, I had just taken a fast-working morphine dose to help me get through the five-minute walk back to my building, and unlike my twice-a-day dose, those pills I could take to my discretion whenever I needed a quick relief. The downside of that very practical pill is that it basically knocks you out within 30 minutes, so you get sleepy, you can barely keep your eyes open, and basically you're high for about 20 minutes before either passing out or getting through it, and it gets better after a while. I get out of the bus. On the right is a parking lot in front of a bakery with lots of cars. It's normal because there are a lot of government-owned student flats around that block, and that's where most of them park, so I'm not concerned. The road I take is straight from where the bus dropped me off for the whole walk before my building is to the right, a couple of parking spots in front of it, and a wheelchair slope going to a magnetic door. You need your magnetic student ID to open the door then a key to a specific door to your building. As I walk by the parking lot, I see movement in the corner of my eye. But since I'm halfway out of it, from my pain meds, I don't turn and look. I hear some noise and I just assume I'm hallucinating. So I keep on walking. But then the street light reflects on a car window. And I don't know why that made me turn around. My brain was catching on to weird stuff. So I briefly looked to the side and I see an old, beat-up white car, pretty long and low to the ground. On the driver's seat is an Algerian man, in his mid-fifties. The neighboring being half students, half friends born Algerian, the thing that gives me pause is more the fact that there's somebody awake in the front seat of a car at one in the morning. But again, I'm out of it, so I don't question it. I don't even stop walking, because at this point, my only thought is, put one foot in front of the other, there you go, you are almost there. You are almost done with the pain. Literally all my attention, my focus, was on putting one foot after the other because of the debilitating pain. I walk past the small roundabout to my left, still going straight, when I hear a car starting. I don't know why that was the first thing that slapped me in the face, but suddenly I was worried. My heart was beating fast, probably half being the meds and half being fear. But also, I was well aware that morphine tends to make me paranoid, so I try to calm down. I see the headlights coming from behind me, 
drawing a long shadow in front of me. In a second, I run through the calculations. I'm still about 300 meters from my building. Then I need to get out my ID and open the door. A slow, automatic, magnetic door. I can't run. I can barely walk. I'm up to the head in morphine. It's the middle of the night. I'm alone with no residential building close enough to hear a scream. That's when I start to panic. I'm right to do so. The car catches up to me, slows down to my walking speed. I notice that the man isn't alone in the car anymore. Someone is in the passenger seat, and there's movement in the back, but I don't turn my head because I try to pretend I didn't notice them slowing down. I had my earphones in with no music, as I didn't turn it back on after the bus ride. I just keep walking, hoping with everything that they'll leave me alone. I'm trying to walk faster, but I'm in so much pain that a few tears fell down my face. I can hear that they're calling for my attention, but not what they're saying. Finally, I see the lane going up to my building. I take my backpack off and I shove my hand down the front pocket, fumbling because my nervous response is crap, and I can't feel my fingers, and I'm shaking like crazy, and I can't find my ID. At that point, I'm close to a panic attack. My heart is beating too fast, and I'm feeling close to fainting from the combined pain and terror. I turn to face the wheelchair slope when I see from the corner of my eye the car stopping abruptly right next to the slope and the car door slamming open. I don't know how I did it because I was so close to fainting, but I managed to run the last 10 feet to the door and slap my ID on the reader, yelling at the door to open faster. I could hear the people running behind me. The door finally opened enough for me to slip in, and I slammed it shut behind me. I heard the men run into the door with a loud noise, and them cursing and yelling things at me. I didn't stick around to hear what they had to say. I fumbled with my keys to the point of almost dropping them before opening the door to my flat complex. I got inside on shaky legs, and as soon as the door closed behind me, I dropped to the floor and had the worst panic attack of my life. When I managed to put myself back together and painstakingly climbed the three flights of stairs, I crawled into my sister's flat, and I woke her up, telling her the whole story. She told me later I was deathly pale, so much that I scared her enough that she offered for me to share her single bed that night. I was too messed up to refuse. The worst part was, this isn't even the end of the story. My sister went out to bars a lot more than I did, as she's able-bodied and drop-dead gorgeous. About three weeks later, she called me in the middle of the night, and she was coming back from a bar. She had seen the exact car that I described in the parking lot at the bus stop. She didn't stop to see if there was anyone inside. She reacted and sprinted to our building. Of course, she was a lot faster than my drugged, disabled self, so she made it to the door, where I was waiting for her, having it opened from the inside, just in case the car stopped the lane. After that, we left a note on our flat complex door to explain everything to other people. Posted about it on every university group we knew of, and we contacted the police, who helpfully told us that they could do nothing without catching them in the act, but that they probably would send somebody to patrol, as it matched the reports they had gotten that sparked the whole blue van rumors in the first place. In the following year it took to finish my degree, neither me nor my sister saw those men in their car again, but we still hear from people, the same kind of story being shared from other parts of the city. As far as we can tell, they're still active, and two years later, I'm still messed up about it. In the summer of 2011, I was a university student, enrolled in summer courses to help accelerate my Bachelor of Science degree. I was offsetting a more difficult biostat course with a narrative literature course one of the options for the mandatory first-year English requirement. He caught my eye on the very first day. I was 20 years old, slightly older than my classmates, but what set me apart, even more, was that my status was a single mother. It was one of those things that was omnipresent for me. I looked at my fellow students and saw them as fledglings, able to enjoy that space between childhood and adulthood. I would never know how it felt to be a young, carefree adult, I was stuck between worlds, too young and inexperienced to fit in with other mothers, too much baggage to fit in with other students. But he wasn't like the other students. He was older, in his thirties. He was also handsome with his dark hair and slim build. 
He was sitting near the center of the room and I sat at the edge, sneaking glances. It wasn't long before he spoke. He was extroverted and confident, easily engaging with the professor. His voice was rich and low, closely assembling that of Matthew McConaughey, minus the southern accent. It moved me at a cellular level. It took me about five classes before I drummed up the courage to sit next to him. I noticed that he was often one of the first to arrive, so it was simply a matter of arriving early enough to claim the empty chair beside him. The first time I had difficulty making eye contact, and I may have squeaked out a hello. I had high hopes of initiating a conversation about the weather at the very least, but I couldn't will my mouth to speak. I arrived, prepared the next time. I pulled out a fresh sheet of notepaper, and while the professor began her lecture, I scribbled, Hi, I'm Willow. My hand trembled as I nudged the paper in his direction. His eyes caught the movement, and he didn't hesitate to scrawl back. Hi, I'm Chris. It was on from then. We spent our lectures passing notes back and forth, asking about likes and dislikes, trying to make each other laugh and risk having all the eyes of the class on us after our barely muffled giggles and snorts. We thought we were being inconspicuous, but I'm pretty sure we weren't fooling anybody. I lived for our cutesy handwritten conversations, but I wanted more. I dropped hints about coffee and my favorite place to get it. The next class, he was there waiting with a cup. He started walking me to my car after class, lingering for a chat, with his long form leaned against my window. I found myself focusing less on what he was saying and willing him to make a move. As I mentioned, I wasn't a virgin. I knew where I wanted this to go and I was growing bolder by the day, but also frustrated by my own impotence. I sensed that he wanted it too. His arm often brushed against mine while sitting side by side. Sometimes his leg would shift and touch mine and hesitate there and the blood rushing in my ears would drown out the lecture. We had a rare July thunder shower one hot afternoon as he walked me to my car. My tank top was getting soaked and my hair plastered to my forehead, but I didn't care. I could feel it. Today was the day that something would finally happen. I leaned up against my car, hyper aware of his glance. He moved so suddenly it almost frightened me. He kissed me as the percussive raindrops drummed my car roof and pressed his body against mine. His hand grappled for the door handle, opened it, and lip-locked, we fell into the back seat of his car. His hands were everywhere, sweat mingled with rain and steamed with the windows. Breathless, we finally pulled apart before any clothes came off. We agreed that we could hardly wait to see each other in class again, and he walked away from me in the rain. Our notes were more explicit during the next class together. I was eager and throbbing. I knew what I wanted and was ready. After class, we drove off to a secluded wooded area near the school. He took out protection, and we had about the best lovemaking experience you can have with one in a car with a brand new partner. But this is where the story goes south. During the afterglow, while he held me tight to his chest, he told me that he was married. I felt like the world crashed down on me. I had broken up with the cheating father of my child just over a year previous, and I couldn't believe the position I was suddenly in. I had spent a month falling for this man, romanticizing him and our slow ascent, and suddenly I knew clearly why he had been so hesitant to make a move on me. I really care about you. You're the most incredible girl I've ever met. It's like we were built for each other. He spoke the words I wanted to hear. He told me about how his wife was 12 years his senior. He was 33, 13 years older than me, and sexless. He also talked about how badly they wanted children, but upon discovering that she was infertile, they pretty much stopped having sex altogether. He claimed that they were currently a little bit more than really considerate roommates, and I fell for it. Our relationship was really fun at first. I let him meet my barely toddler-sized children early on. He loved coming over often and playing house with us. We were the family he never had, and he talked about his desire for children often. He told me he loved me, and us, early on. I reciprocated his affection gladly. Eventually it would get dark outside though, and he would leave for his real home. I resented his wife at first. We had a lot of talks about her, and I would try to present logical arguments for why it was time to leave. Weeks passed into months, and it was never the right time. 
I don't know exactly when it began to shift, but there were some red flags. His extroversion and confidence morphed into leading comments about my behavior and how it could improve. He made some racist comments on one occasion, and his views on the female body were not in line with mine. He was also religious and convinced that one day I would be smart enough to figure out that God did exist after all because I'm an atheist. In retrospect, he was quite talented at gaslighting, but I didn't pick up on it at the time. I started to pull away and he sensed it. He responded by granting one of my wishes. An entire night together, just me and him. We arranged a night at a local upscale wellness resort. The room was beautiful and I still have lovely photos of our time there. But at three in the morning, I woke up and I suddenly couldn't do it anymore. I broke up with him. Frankly, it shocked both of us. He didn't argue. He just gathered up his stuff and drove away. And I was stunned at the ease of it. If only it was that easy. We had finished our narrative lit class by this time, but had conspired to choose the same elective, psychology, for the next semester. This meant that we still had a class to attend together every other day. He didn't use his cell phone for texting. It was too easy for his wife to trace so we communicated exclusively through email when we were apart. It was common for him to sign his emails, I'll see you soon, but not soon enough. After we broke up, there were six of these emails before I had a chance to respond, ranging in tone from brisk to playful to pleading. I wasn't swayed. I told him that I'd fallen out of love and that it was over. He responded by sending more emails, but when they went unanswered, he showed up at my house late that evening. I didn't let him in. I was feeling rattled by his persistence, but I thought if I refused to answer the door, he would go away. I could hear him calling for me, alternating between sweet, loving words and irritated commands for me to talk to him. For context, I lived in the end unit of a row of townhouses. I had a front door, a back basement door, and an upper floor balcony. The front and back doors were locked, but I rarely locked the balcony door because it was easily accessible from the ground. I was sitting in my living room on the upper level. My son was asleep downstairs when I heard a commotion in the direction of the balcony. I looked up to see him toppling over the railing. I jumped up and managed to lock the balcony door seconds before he could open it and let himself in. By this time I was shaking. He had gone from zero to creepy, fast enough to give me whiplash. I barely recognized him as someone I had been so incredibly enamored with. His pleas to let him in were frenetic, and he switched from wrenching on the door handle to trying to push the dining room window open. I felt like I had entered someone else's nightmare as I fought to keep the window closed, begging him to leave while he begged me to let him in. I managed to wedge the security stick in that kept it from opening further than a small gap. He demanded that I let him in. I shook my head and I asked him to leave as assertively as I could. He switched gears and told me that even though he managed to climb up the second floor balcony, he didn't think that he would be able to safely climb back down. I wavered, considering this. I didn't want him to get hurt. He saw my resolve weekend and promised that he would simply walk through the kitchen, down the stairs, and out the front door if I let him in. I tried one more time to encourage him to leave the way he came, but he refused, citing possible injury, so I caved. He lied. He stood there in my kitchen with his arms folded, and demanded a better explanation for why I decided to end the relationship. I tried to usher him out, but he was unmovable. I couldn't even explain it. Didn't want to explain it, I just wanted him out. I told him that if he didn't leave right away, I would call the cops. I reached for my cell phone and he reacted quickly. He snatched it from my hands and held it high out of my reach. My blood ran cold at this point. Here, I was trapped in my home with this guy my child sleeping downstairs, and my main source for calling for help was in his hands. I'll scream. No, you won't. I reached for it, but it was no use. I begged, just leave me alone. Not until you admit you love me. I don't. It's over. We're done. Those are just the lies you tell yourself because you're afraid to be close. Be real. He looked like he believed exactly what he was saying with full conviction. It was too much. Please, you're scaring me. He softened. Willoughby, 
he murmured and reached for me. I sniffed as his arms encircled me. He squeezed me tight, but as his hold loosened, I seized my chance and pulled away from him having grabbed my phone from his unexpected fingers. I was already dialing a friend of mine, also happened to be a local police officer, as he chased me down the stairs. My police officer friend, Paul, answered on the second ring. Backed into a corner in the basement, I held my phone in front of me like a shield and spoke to my friend on speakerphone while Chris waited at arm's length, silently listening to my quivering voice explain the situation. Paul sternly admonished Chris to leave my house immediately, and with a withering glare, Chris exited and drove away. After Chris left, he checked in with me to be sure I was okay and recommended that I call the actual police. I explained that I still had some feelings for Chris and didn't think he deserved to have his whole life blown up, despite how much he had scared me. After we disconnected, I wrapped myself up in several blankets, but it took a long time before I felt warm. I wish I could say that the ordeal was over after this, but I'd be lying. For weeks, he emailed me and waited for me outside of my classes. We only shared one class, but he knew my schedule and would wait for me outside my other classes too. I walked silently past him, and he would follow me, trying fruitlessly to get me to engage. He would also wait outside my house at night sometimes and leave me loving messages on the sidewalk in chalk. He would spell out in block letters, I love you, Willow B. So I stopped going to my classes. I did my best to stay caught up on the material by studying the slides posted online and reading the textbook. Weeks passed without me being forced to see or talk to him. I had to attend the exams though, and sure enough, he was there outside my psychology exam, waiting. I walked quickly towards my car and he followed, begging, please go away. Months of feeling afraid and powerless were welling to the surface. I raced into the driver's seat of my car, but he was there, holding the door open against me as I tried to pull it closed. I tried uselessly to shut it, then scooted out of my car. He followed me as I did laps around the car. I threatened to call the cops on him for harassment, and he laughed at me. I tried to reason with him. It was impossible. I darted for the driver's seat again, and this time was successful at slamming the door shut before he could hold it open. His response? He placed his foot under the driver's side tire and told me that in order to drive away, I would have to run him over. I so badly wanted to do it. Weeks of looking over my shoulder, of reading his emails with shivers, he rambled for paragraphs, accusing me of being pregnant with his child mostly, promising me everything, accusing me of lying about my feelings. Here's one of the many emails left unanswered. I called you back, but I didn't hear back. I'm worried that you are hurting and or in trouble. I can't drop by to check on you. You keep pretending that I'm not welcome there. I'll send you this so that you know what's going on. I'll call you again as well. But I do understand what and why you are doing this. No, I really don't. Who would? Especially that we both know it's BS. I have ideas and guesses. There's no way to understand. I don't know what's really going on. I'm lacking whatever information you think you need to hide. I don't have the real info. I would like to know. However, that is your prerogative. I wish you wouldn't hide and hold back, but we both have said so much already. So no, I don't understand. I hope reading the messages I sent matter to you. Actually, I'm sure they do. We both know that you care, that we both care far more than we will ever let on. I asked you to do the courtesy of telling me what's really going on, even if you'll never see me again, as you say. Such a waste. You don't need to drive away. You should really think hard and think about all that I said in those messages. You don't have to pretend this is all BS. And you don't have to hide from the truth or from me. Or have I guessed it already that you are pregnant and full of fear and that you don't want to be the cause of my marital breakdown? Well, you're not. A catalyst, yes, but you're not the case. You're just helping me realize that I could be happy. And I was, and I'd still be there for you at the drop of a hat. We both were happy. I'd love to have that again, even for a short time. Any time would be worth it, and more, knowing that I could be fulfilled, and so were you. But is it also that you're worried about your condition, so you think you invest your heart and love into us already? Maybe you think it's easier to drive me away, and just waste away with your personal misery, and not have a love to share with. As I say, I have ideas, maybe closer to the mark than I know, maybe not. You tell me, I dare you. So here I am in the driver's seat of my car, 
with my married ex-boyfriend stubbornly sticking his leg in the way of my wheel. I had two choices. I could drive him over, or I could call for help. It was at this point that I finally called the police. He figured out I was talking to the cops early enough to leave before they could arrive. They took my statement and sent a member to his home to warn him to stop contacting me. And he sent one final email. This is the second time you have way crossed the line of decent behavior. Now to the business at hand. I'm asking you to stop harassing me and stop threatening me. If you have any pictures of me at this time, I demand that you delete them. I do not give you permission to have anything like this at that time. I don't want to have to inform the police that you stalked me. I'm sure that breach of trust and many others would not be well looked upon. Or that you have made personal threats to harm me or to otherwise harm my family. You have gone way too ridiculous with this, so stop bothering me. I told you that I care, but I'm not interested in you attacking me or your threats against me. If you can be civil and respond, you may explain your poor actions via email. If not, I choose to forgive you anyways. Goodbye. Stop harassing me. A gaslighter to his last breath. Let's not meet again. When I was in fifth grade, I started going to the school where I had to walk down my neighborhood so the bus could pick me up. My mom, being nervous, bought me a purple Pantech so I could text her on my way if any creeps tried to talk to me. I had only had the phone for a couple of weeks in August when a guy randomly called me. It was a phone number in my area, so I just figured it was a friend and probably would have answered either way. The guy sounded like he was in his late 30s. He had one of those deep, monotone voices where you can easily tell when they're acting off because it goes up in volume when they're nervous. I don't know any other way to describe his voice other than that, to be honest. When I answered at first, he acted as if we regularly talked and started with something along the lines of, Hey, what's up with not angry, a little friendly? During the call, he referred to me as Jenna. And when I said that wasn't my name, he said, I know it's you and I just want to talk. I hung up and he called me again and he had lost his temper and was mad that I was pretending I wasn't Jenna. And it was like he wasn't even listening to my sassy responses before he just said that I should have a happy birthday and hung up. Me being in fifth grade, I barely knew what blocking somebody meant and just told my mom it was suspect. I never thought about it again until a year later to the day in sixth grade when he called again. I totally forgot about the guy when I answered and at first it just seemed like someone I didn't save the contact for. I did dog walking and so neighbors hit me up. Until after saying our hellos, I asked who this was and he immediately dropped his voice. It's been six years since fifth grade, so I'm just paraphrasing. But he essentially said something in a creepy seductive voice about Jenna being gorgeous, thinking I was her and how I should have a beautiful birthday and that he wishes I talked to him again. During his gross rant, I repeatedly said I was not Jenna and that he has the wrong person. After this, I told my mom, and she and I both came to a theory that Jenna was maybe a mistress or an ex-girlfriend and changed her number without telling him, or maybe even on purpose. The guy sounded like a stalkerish boyfriend type. Anyways, still didn't block him. The random man was calling in August, so I was confused one day in sixth grade when he called months after Jenna's birthday. Not gonna lie, he sounded trashed when he called and was trying to be seductive once again and still calling me Jenna. He only said something like, Hey Jenna, I don't know why you won't talk to me. I haven't seen you in so long, but in a creepy drunk booty call way. This time I just hung up without saying anything and I was disgusted. He called again and left a voicemail. I showed my mom. My mom and I just thought it was kind of funny that he got played and still thought it was harmless. In middle school, he called, but only in August, on Jenna's birthday. I usually just ran through the same routine of telling him I was not Jenna, and him still thinking there's hope between him and Jenna. Each time started getting worse, and he would get more angry and aggressive in words. One time he even started insulting Jenna's body, even though it was always a birthday call. After 7th and 8th grade, he called both times in August. Somehow he seemed to slip my mind every time a year went by until he called. Until one day freshman year, I was walking out of the field from hockey when he called. He wasn't angry, he just said the regular things, but this time my friend listened and I filled her in on everything. She and I both loved the drama 
in all of it, so neither of us thought blocking was the smart thing. It was harmless. He called me again in same night freshman year on Jenna's birthday in August and was angry. Angry that this morning I kept denying it and basically that I kept saying I wasn't Jenna. At this point when I got home and told my mom who had forgotten once again as well, she thought it was creepy and had enough that he called me from fifth grade to freshman year and I agreed and I blocked him. If he wasn't so aggressive during the calls and calling me baby, I wouldn't have cared, but he was weird. That same night I blocked him, my mom was stalking his phone number on the yellow pages, mostly because it was in the area, which made it very suspect. It didn't take too much to put in his phone number and find his name in his real estate agency. My mom even found his address. We call him Peter Smith. He had daughters and a wife. Why is he calling Jenna baby if he has a wife? My mom and I didn't recognize him, but it was nice to have a name. To describe Peter Smith, I'd say he looked like an angry, aggressive type. He had those types of eyes that wrinkled in a way where even looking at a picture of him smiling, you can perfectly imagine what he looks like angry. His Instagram was full of motivational quotes with weird neon backgrounds. I would like to note, I didn't stalk his Instagram while on mine, but rather on my laptop so he wouldn't know. After I blocked Peter, I didn't think about him at all until junior year when he followed me on my Instagram. My Instagram is public and noticeably my name is not Jenna and I was definitely not old enough for his weird self. I quickly blocked him but it was very uncomfortable to know that he had seen what I looked like and my pubescent self yet he was still creepy enough to follow me. I figured he had the contact or something because Instagram lets you find people through phone numbers. Even though I blocked him, I don't know, but it was weird. Senior year, I was getting a tattoo with my mom next to me when we both got into this long conversation about the guy. My mom started talking about how she had stalked his Facebook, and I mentioned if she looked at his Facebook friends. I had only seen his Instagram, so I was interested. This is when it got gross. In his top friends, or closest, or however Facebook ranks it, was my close-by neighbors. Neighbors that I especially hung out with during fifth grade at their house. My neighbors had a bunch of kids, and their ages were all over the place, so I never noticed any of the vast amount of other children running around. But I did notice his daughters are friends with my neighbor's kids as well. My neighbors always had random adults over, and random kids' parents, so there's no way I would have remembered seeing his name until before my yellow page search. In his Facebook photos, he had a bunch of photos with my neighbors of them drinking and their kids all together at my neighbor's house. It was weird. We tried to find Jenna in his following, or followed but didn't. Figured if Jenna even existed, she would have blocked him. My mom and I were both shocked that he knew our neighbors and started piecing together a little timeline. I'll tell you our theories. One, when I was young I spent every day of summer at their house. They were the only ones with a pool and along with all their kids, it was always the place to be. Adults were drinking, kids were playing, and no one paid much attention to each other. But Peter, being very close with my neighbors, was over and saw me, and being very tempered, he started stalking me. That wouldn't explain how he got my number though, but also in fifth grade I sounded very young, so I don't get why that didn't set him off if Jenna existed. By some random chance I ended up with Jenna's phone number after she changed hers, Jenna might have changed her number because Peter Smith and her were in an affair, but things got heated. He seemed to have an anger problem and had some choice words for Jenna that only someone with a lot of hatred for her would. This type of relationship would explain why he only called her on her birthday once a year. If they talked more, he would know that she changed her number. It's just strange how he was best friends with the mother of my close friends at the time the first call happened and that he followed my account knowing I was 16 and not Jenna. But this one seems more possible, even if it's weird that he was close friends with my neighbor. All I know is Peter Smith, I don't ever want to have you call me again. And Jenna, I hope you're well. This happened two summers ago while I was house sitting out in California for an older couple I'd met at a conference for work. It had seemed like a dream scenario the couple wanted to vacation in Hawaii for two weeks, 
but didn't want to board their cats, and I had been chatting with them about wanting to visit California again, where they happened to live, because I had loved it the first time I went, and we figured that we could mutually benefit if I came out and house sat for them. So I flew out there, and they showed me around for a few days, taught me how to care for the cats, two of them, one that was extremely shy and I barely saw, and their plants gave me access to their house and cars. These people were so generous, and before I knew it, I had dropped them off at the airport and I was on my own. At first it was really the dream vacation. I was staying in Oakland and making forays in San Fran, Sonoma, and Monterey. In the mornings, I could walk out the front door and shortly be hiking the paths surrounding nearby Mount Diablo, and I was just ultra content with the world. I was so enamored by the area that I had actually started looking into taking some steps to relocate out there. But then one day, about halfway through my final week there, when I got back to the house, I felt really odd, almost like I shouldn't go inside. I shook it off and went inside anyway, because it was getting late and I needed to put out dinner for the cats. Once I was inside, I forced myself to ignore how off I felt, and I made some food for myself went to bed, and was shocked to find the shy cat hiding under my bed and crying. This was the first time I had even seen her this close. The entire time I had been up there, up to that point, she never left my host's bedroom unless she didn't realize I was around. Again, I ignored feeling weird, and just assumed she had decided I was okay and went to bed. I did start locking my bedroom door that night, though. I also remember that about halfway through that night, I thought I had heard somebody walking around in the gravel outside of my window, but after listening for a bit, I didn't hear anything else, and I went back to sleep. The day after, in the morning, I still felt a little bit odd, but kept up with my plans for the day. I drove out to a little music festival in Sonoma, and went clothes shopping, and had an overall great day. When I got back to the house, though, I found the front door locked in a way that I hadn't left it. Basically, my host never locked the deadbolt, only the lower, second lock, and that's the only lock my key would work on, so I never messed with the deadbolt, but it was definitely locked. So I had to call my host and find the hideaway key, which to their credit, safety-wise, was buried about a whole foot underneath the bush outside, and had definitely not been unearthed for a long time. So I used that, went inside, and kept the key with me just in case it happened again. And it did, but with a different door. This time I had stepped out into the garage to get a drink. And when I turned around to get back in the house, the door was shut and locked. I could use my normal key on that door, but I was still pretty bewildered. My own cats were whack, so I think in my mind I was trying to come up with a way that the cats could be locking me out of the house. But I was coming up empty. I decided I must have been misunderstanding how the locks worked and I just wrote it off and started checking and triple checking locks when I went out of the house or out to the garage. That night when I went to bed, the really awful feeling of unease was still there, and so was the shy cat, who was clearly unhappy to see me, but also wouldn't leave my room. But again, I just locked my bedroom door and I went to sleep. The next morning I felt awful, nausea, body aches. I had no desire to leave the house so I decided to stay in and Netflix for a day. This vacation stay was about a full two weeks, so I didn't feel like I was in a hurry to get all my touristy things in, but as the day went, I started to feel that feeling of wrongness again, and it morphed into feeling incredibly watched. Around mid-afternoon, I got to the point that I was so uneasy that even feeling awful, I decided to get out of the house for a bit to shake it off. I was getting a bit low on food, so I went to the grocery store and bought a couple food items that I didn't think would hurt my stomach. And as I started to leave the checkout, the cashier said the generic, have a great evening, and I just instantly started crying, shocking myself and the poor cashier, because I just had this intrusive thought that said, you might be the last person to ever say that to me. When I got to my car, I was still crying, and my entire body was telling me not to drive back to the house. I couldn't not, though because I didn't want to neglect the cats. So I drove back, parked in the driveway, and convinced myself after about a half an hour to just go open the front door. Once I did that, I thought I would get over it 
and be able to go in and at least feed the cats. And then maybe I'd go get a hotel room after. But my body physically would not let me inside. It's like I was stuck in the entryway. I then made a deal with myself. I would yell into the house saying I had already called the police and that they were on their way. In panic logic, I figured that would make anyone in the house want to leave. So I faced the inside of the house, looking down the hallway towards the bedrooms, and I did just that. The second I had finished saying, they're almost here, so if you want to avoid being arrested, you need to leave now. The light in my host's room turned on, and I heard some banging. I immediately hightailed it back to the car, and I called the police for real, and proceeded to have a mental breakdown while talking to the dispatcher. Once they got there, they checked the house and didn't find anyone, but the double doors in my host's bedroom were left wide open. I'm so glad the cats didn't get out, and there was a pile of food wrappers in the corner behind the blinds so they said it looked like somebody had been there. What makes it so scary to me is that nothing was taken, and that based on the shape of the house, that would have been the perfect vantage point to see me in the living room as I stayed home sick. To explain this, the house was in an L shape, and from the window into the garden that were in my host's bedroom, you could see into the living room windows. Also, the minute the police were gone, they said they couldn't prove anybody was there. There were no signs of forced entry, and we couldn't get a hold of my hosts immediately to verify if anything had been taken, which once they were back, they verified that nothing had been taken. So they said they would patrol a bit, but nothing else. The shy cat was right back in my host's bedroom, and I didn't see her again until I left to go back home. Basically, I think the intruder had been there at least two days, forcing her to choose between two strangers, and leading her to choose the one that was at least a little less strange, me. It messed me up pretty bad, especially because they didn't catch the person and didn't seem to have any desire to look. And I still had to stay in that house for the next three days. Nothing else odd happened, and I didn't feel anything off the rest of the time I was there, but the damage was done. I've never felt completely safe in a home without doing a complete search before bed ever since, but I am extremely glad my gut spoke up. I guess I'd rather have some residual anxiety than be dead. So whoever was in my house watching me, please let's never meet. This story is about an encounter that happened to my uncle. This is all verbatim, and it's not exactly a short story, but I wanted to stay true to my uncle's account, hence why it's word for word. The following is all from my uncle's perspective, and the use of I refers to himself. This would have happened around 20 odd years ago very long time ago now and it's when your father and i ran that call center during the contracting work for various businesses all within the financial service industry and roughly around 50 staff including managers and supervisors and so on and so on things were a lot different then the internet was still very much in its infancy as was technology we didn't have the same access to things as you would now if you ran the same kind of operation on top of this, we were running all of this out of a warehouse on an industrial estate right next to a gypsy camp because that's all we could afford for the amount of floor space we needed. The campaign we were working on wasn't going so well for us. For the most part, we just worked out of phone books and the likes to get leads as data costs and still does cost a fortune. So we were under a lot of stress to meet those sort of deadlines and promises your father made to our B2B clients, so we weren't in a great place. We were facing the possibility of cutting the staff down to at most 20 agents with two managers, and that's when we met Kevin. We had heard of him from a few associates who ran similar operations as ourselves, as someone who could provide leads and generally had the ability to turn companies around, so your dad got in contact with him and went from there really. We didn't actually hear back for about a month after contacting him, so we were very much in the mindset of, well, we'll screw all this over, close down and start something else, somewhere else. And on the day we hyped ourselves up to tell everyone that you've all lost your jobs, we get a phone call out of the blue. Who was on the phone? Kevin. Long story short, we discussed our situation, discussed his situation, gauged his interest, and dress things up with a little bow on top to perk him up. And by the end of the call, he agreed to come down from Scotland 
to meet with us and discuss options in person. So on Monday, we met with Kevin in the Hilton, and I didn't like him instantly. I thought he was overbearing, condescending, and a complete egomaniac. But your father, in his infinite wisdom, decided to hear him out, and it turned out Kevin had a huge amount of leads for one of his sources in America, and needed a team of salespeople to dial them. We would need to supply 25 agents, and in return would get a fat back of payment, which would allow us to move premises, upgrade equipment. So we agreed, and a contract was written up, and we began our venture. In order to maintain a more hands-on approach to the business, and to keep his contacts in the US happy, Kevin rented a flat close to the office, and would often visit the office to monitor progress, which would normally consist of him lurking around with a coffee. It's also important to mention that Kevin had next to no people skills, and stuck me as either socially awkward, or maybe somewhere on the autism spectrum, or something. And soon enough we would begin to get complaints from some of our younger female staff members that Kevin would watch them too closely and hover around the woman's bathroom, which of course we had to take seriously, but we weren't really in a position to piss the guy off who was potentially our savior. So we would begin to hold bullcrap meetings every time he showed up to get him off of the floor and into a meeting room, which for a time worked, but eventually he had to take a phone call halfway through and he excused himself. I later learned from one of the managers that he would hold the phone up to his ears and just watch the girls closely, not saying anything, and then follow them into the makeshift kitchen area and press himself up against them, or at least stand very close to them to make them have to ask him to move or brush past him. We decided to hold a meeting with the female members of staff to ask them about their concerns and to ask them if we could do anything to make their time at work more enjoyable, deliberately not mentioning Kevin just to test the waters. And one by one, they all had something to say about Kevin. So we were just uncomfortable with his general demeanor and some had been groped by him and even propositioned which was the final straw really. So we decided to speak with Kevin and cut ties and look at ways to exit the contract when we get an email from Kevin saying he's moving back up to Scotland and will only be making quarterly visits. So we are understandably ecstatic that our lead source remains, but contact with the staff will be limited and we believe that no more problems shall arise and we can wear the caring boss hats who valiantly drove away a sex pest which would no doubt boost staff morale. Fast forward another 12 months, and Kevin's visits have all been non-eventful, and the contract is drawing to a close, and we are excited to get our cut, and to expand and move on to another primary contract. When Kevin gets in touch with another plan to extend our contract, and package our company up to be sold to a blue chip company which specializes in the financial service industry, he'd act as a broker and take a cut but we'd make even more money than we originally thought, as well as half of the agreed amount we'd receive when this particular contract was supposed to end, just as a goodwill gesture. He mentioned he had a few contacts in London and the US, which would be interested in merging our operation into their current sales team for a more dynamic sales approach. So this was something to ponder on, and we agreed we would get back to him. I was thinking over the idea and decided to go to the local pub where I ran into a guy called Carl, who also ran a similar business as myself, and we got chatting, and he brought up Kevin, saying something along the lines of, you're working with Kevin Smith, aren't you? And being unsure to how he knew that, I asked him, why? Why do you want to know? To which he responded with, that guy is a total nutcase. Honestly, the things I could tell you about him. And at first I thought, here we go, this is just some more gossip and BS and most likely jealousy, but curiosity got the better of me, and I asked, go on then, why is he a nutcase? And he laughed some more, took another few sips of his lager, and off the cuff said, you know that guy murdered his wife, right? And admittedly I scoffed, but Carl's face was serious, stone-like, and unsmiling. No he didn't, I said, still laughing. He killed his wife, man. I wouldn't make that up. I can always remember the look in his eyes when he told me that. I was unnerved, but still, you can't believe anybody in business. And I decided to probe him some more. Uh, what happened? I asked. I don't know the whole story, because he's kept it very quiet. 
You won't find it in the papers or on the news or anything, but basically his wife was found battered. No signs of a break-in, and the only other DNA in the house was his. He's a wealthy guy, though. Never got out in the press, and he managed to get off, but I tell you, he's a dodgy guy. We had him with us in 98, and we exited out of our contract. Got loads of complaints about him. He's a perv, man. So I'm thinking, oh crap, we have a murderer as our main source of income. And the guy's off his rocker. But I don't let on to Carl, and instead tell your dad. And he says, he's fine, he's eccentric, he's from a different era, and we should just hold out a bit longer. You know what your dad's like. He's got a moral compass of the bloody war criminal, but stupidly I relented, and we entered the new contract. And true to his word, we received half of the original agreed commission fee. So we were able to move offices, and this is where Kevin decides to move back down south and take permanent residency at our new office to oversee the packaging process. So he set himself up in an office opposite the hallway to the woman's bathroom and would spend most of his days on the phone or just loitering again. By that time, we had a major staff overhaul and employed more skilled salespeople and management staff so we were confident that Kevin would behave and we wouldn't have a repeat of last time, but unfortunately this was short-lived as an admin assistant complained to HR that she saw Kevin having some alone time in his car outside whilst watching some of the girls who'd go outside to smoke. Obviously this kick-started the rumors of Kevin being a pervert again and his odd behavior did nothing to help that, so we decided to seek legal help and eventually we were able to back out of the contract. Kevin in our minds was long gone and it would have been in early 2003 when I was working late at the office alone when I saw a figure moving through the office towards my enclosed office at the back. I knew it wasn't security or the cleaners as security wasn't permitted to enter offices without permission when a staff member was present and the cleaners had left earlier. I stood up and moved towards the door to lock it when I saw Kevin's face on the other side. Now Kevin was a big guy, probably about 22 stone, and around six foot four, and I must have been around 12 stone, and six foot one. So he easily pushed back and barged in through the door. I can remember going for the phone to dial security when he got on top of me, and instead of the beating, I was expecting he was trying to pull the watch off from around my wrist. Confused but understandably pissed off, I tried getting him off of me, but his weight was making it difficult to move, and I just remember him looking at me, dead in the face, without saying anything, eyes completely blank. Somehow I managed to get him off of me. I think I managed to knee him or something, and ran out to the reception area where I got security to apprehend Kevin, who was attempting to escape out of a fire exit. I wasn't hurt or anything, and didn't press charges, and he got a warning from the cops, and that was that. That was the last time I saw Kevin. Now this is where it gets bizarre. About three years ago I bumped into Carl and we got talking about the old days when the topic of Crazy Kevin came up and I told him about the time he got into my office, jumped on me and tried stealing my Rolex and Carl was laughing along with me and asked when exactly that was. I told him it was in 03 and this is what he said. I can still remember it word for word. That couldn't have been long before he topped himself then. Shocked, naturally I asked him to repeat what he just said, and he did. He hanged himself in 03, had no money at the end. I'm not sure if he told you, but he remarried to this Thai girl who had a son. When he was liable to settle his contract with the American Chaps, he tried bumping her off to get the life insurance money. Everything he had was on finance. Everything. Didn't own a thing. I was completely gobsmacked. Kevin never even wore a wedding ring, and in all the years that I had known him, we never once discussed a wife or a child. And although Carl is a bit of a gaslighter, it turns out Kevin rented a house opposite Carl's brother-in-law. I tell you what, makes the story about his first wife seem more plausible. I've also worked out why he went for my wrist. I think at first he was angry that we backed out of the contract, and he probably viewed us as responsible for his life spiraling out of control, so probably did want to beat the crap out of me. But I think the fact he had no money and probably needed it quick to settle the contract and impending lawsuits he decided to try and steal my watch to pawn it. This is just my theory, and he could have just been off of his rocker. 
but that was the end of the conversation. I've had a lot of stalkers, more than I would like to admit. They're all kind of creepy, but for some reason, the guy I'm going to talk about in here was the most creepy, but yet the least harmful of them all. We met in college through friends in common. We had similar interests, similar humor, had been to the same events in the city, and he had actually known me way before when I did cosplay. So we started talking and hanging out a lot. For some reason, never felt comfortable hanging out with him alone. So I always had a friend with me and refused to see him outside of the university campus for some reason that I still can't explain. He always seemed bothered by it, but never said it out loud. A month after meeting him, I was feeling very lonely and hadn't been to any social gatherings recently, nor had any flirting or someone to flirt with. I accidentally mentioned this to Kevin, the guy, when chatting one day, and he suggested that he felt the same, and that we should take care of that feeling together. He isn't a bad looking guy, and seemed pretty kind by the way he spoke, and offered it to me. So I said, okay, I'll go to your house after class, and let's see if we have some sort of chemistry. Kevin was a medical student, and I'm an art student. Our faculties are separated by literally kilometers. He had never been in my hallway, or my faculty for all of that matter. I'd never been to his either. We and our friends always met in the middle of both. But that day, as I was going out the door, he was there, waving. I asked, how did you know where I was, and when my class ended? He didn't answer, and just smiled like a kid who just surprised his mom with breakfast or something. So off we went to his house, which was conveniently close to a college around a 10 minute walk. I started to invent excuses because I was feeling uncomfortable, like having to go buy bread or checking an art store or doing this and that. And he accompanied me to everything I came up with. I ran out of things to say and finally ended up at his place. I still remember him hard breathing while we were both into the elevator. Fast forward maybe an hour of us awkwardly talking in the living room, trying to start the deed but failing. I faked a stomach sickness, said that I needed some homemade medicine common in my country, and he magically had all of the ingredients. He tried to rub my stomach, and I kind of freaked out and told him, leave the touching for later when I feel better. Fast forward half an hour, he went into his bedroom and came out in his underwear, socks, and a Burger King crown on his head, asked if we were going to get down to it or not. I'm normally a no-filter person, but his behavior kept putting me off and I had figured by now that I had been uncomfortable since the very beginning, but it was probably the best to act as dumb as I could, so I convinced him that today wasn't the best day to do that, and we left. He insisted to escort me back to my college just in case, and I refused, but he still followed me in silence, walking around five meters behind me. I saw him with the corner of my eye and decided not to confront it, I gradually started ghosting him, stopped replying to his messages, gave him vague answers, stopped sharing my information, answering just, okay, wow, haha, lol, yeah, I know, right? Oh, okay. This went on for another two to three weeks. I barely gave him any info of my whereabouts earlier, so I thought he would leave me alone. He still showed up at my hall and my faculty from time to time, but I made sure to avoid him as much as I could and I also started hanging more with other friends that didn't know him. You see, this is where it gets creepy. Before I knew him, I joined the football team of my school. So most of the afternoons, I was always at the same court where we were trained and stayed there for around four hours almost every day of the week. I had been going there with my new group of friends for six months to train. Then Kevin came into my life for two more months. In this two months, I never told him where I trained. I did tell him I played football, but never that I played inside the college campus. One night he messaged me as usual. I was still in the process of gradually ghosting, so I chatted for a bit, with long time intervals in between messages, and casually mentioning that no, I couldn't meet with him the next day, because I had class and then training. He asked when I was getting off of practice and I said I don't know, probably late, then completely stopped answering. Next day afternoon I trained with my dudes as usual, 
I still am the only girl on the team. It attracts creepers, but I learn to ignore them. And they usually all chill in a tree that's behind the fence where I normally stand. I play as the goalie, so I normally don't look back or to other place that isn't the game in front of me. We play for around four to five hours, chill a little bit on the court benches, then head to the law faculty, which is the closest place where we can refill our water. This has been our routine for the entire eight months. The law faculty is pretty far away from the court, but we like it there. While my friends are refilling their coolers, I check my phone. It starts buzzing, and I see as the unread messages pop up, increased from 9 to 17 in seconds. They read, where are you? I don't see you. Please tell me where you are. I am looking for you. Crap, I go to the bathroom for one minute. One minute. And that's the minute you decide to disappear. How do you do this? I've been watching you all afternoon and you didn't move for four hours. Where are you? Crap, I can't find you. You look nice playing though. Very nice. Probably those dudes all flirt with you. Keep training to get that body looking even more good. I still can't find you. Are you going to tell me where you are or not? Can we hang out later? I miss talking to you. God dang it, I swear if I don't see you right now, I'm leaving. Where are you? I nervously looked around, closed the chat, and locked my phone. We were on the second floor of the faculty. My dudes didn't notice that I was nervous, but I casually grabbed the arm of the biggest one, who also was my best friend, and I hung out to him, and hung on to him while whining about being tired as an excuse. Once we finished going down the stairs, Kevin walked right in front of us, went towards us, and casually kept walking to go upstairs. We locked eyes for a second. I smiled at a joke and then grabbed my friend's arm even tighter, but inside I was freaked out. The dudes of course didn't notice. There were five of them, and all of them were buff. To this day I still think he didn't do anything because I was surrounded by guys who could clearly beat him up. I had planned on staying after practice that day to chill and maybe have a beer or two with whatever friend I could find, but I ended up leaving as fast as I could once all of my friends denied wanting to stay, nor refused to accompany me to the other exit of my UNI. We all had to take different exits that were closer to our houses or the route we took to get home, so I ended up faking that I had to go the other direction, which was conveniently the exit Kevin took to go to his home, just so I didn't have to walk alone. I didn't see Kevin after this, and I completely ghosted him that night. I still have him added on Facebook to be able to check his whereabouts and avoid him. So thanks for leaving the country, Kevin. When I was 17, I started working at my local grocery store. About three weeks in, I got transferred from the front end, where the baggers and the cashiers are, to produce. My first week in produce, I met all the people in my department, and all was going well. One night on my second week in produce, I was closing alone when this girl comes in. My back is turned to her, and I hear, You're new. When did you start? I turn around and we start to have a conversation while I put the last few things in my cart on the shelf. I had about ten minutes left on my shift and was trying to go downstairs to crush my boxes. But this girl continued to talk and took no social cues that I was trying to leave. I finally get tired of listening to her talk and start to pull my cart through the produce section as she slowly follows, still talking. Eventually we get to the doors, where it's employees only, and I start to make my way through and she comes right in after me. I explain that unfortunately she cannot come this way and she needs to go check out as our store was closing soon. She says goodbye and leaves, and I thought this was odd, but maybe she's just a bit weird. Crush my boxes, go home, and I don't even think about it. Two days later, I'm closing again, and the same thing happens. This time she asks for my phone number. I explain that I don't have a phone at this time, hence why I had a job, so I could get one. Okay, well, would you want to hang out when you get off? I kind of felt bad at this point as I thought she was just a bit odd and maybe just looking for friends. I tell her maybe next time, as my mom was picking me up. So every night I worked, she would come in and just pick up one of her grapefruit, and then walk around basically acting like she was either on her phone, or pretending to shop, and then casually stop by me. It got really old very quick, to the point of where I would hide in the hallway, and watch her until she left. 
Eventually, other people in my store heard about her, and rumors went around that she was stalking me. The deli manager explained that she and her boyfriend, who also worked in the deli, also had been stalked by her for a number of months. Eventually, she stopped coming by at night, and I was always hiding when she did come. A few weeks go by, and I had just gotten off of work, an early shift for a change, and my friends were meeting me at work to hang out after, two guys and one girl. So I head out to the parking lot and meet up with them when my stalker comes out of nowhere and hugs me. I haven't seen you at work in so long. Oh yeah, they switched my hours, so now I don't work late anymore. Well, one thing leads to another, and my friend, who's a female, starts to explain to her and basically invites her to hang out with us. She jumps on the opportunity after I explained to my friend she was stalking me. And so we all started walking back to my friend's house to hang in the backyard as it was a nice summer night. The night wasn't bad, we all just hung out and I kind of avoided the stalker while my friend, female, kept her entertained. The night came on pretty fast and eventually it was 1am and my friend's mom came out and told us that we had to leave. My two male friends and I and the stalker head out and we are waiting at the bus stop that my friend needed to catch while the stalker explains that she can't go home this late and that she needed to stay over. So I beg my other friend to stay with me, which he agrees. We wait for the bus to pick up my other friend and then head to my house. Things got very weird at this point. So basically the stalker refused to sleep on the floor and only wanted to sleep in bed with me. I eventually gave up and said okay while my friend slept on the floor. So I'm lying in bed and this girl stands up and just takes her bra and shirt off and then her pants and gets into bed with me. At first I was pretty dumbfounded and didn't know what to do so I acted like I didn't notice and then she started to try to kiss me and have me grope her. At this point I realized the girl had issues. I don't know if they were mental or just social but did not want to find out. I lightly push her off of me and explain that I'm trying to sleep. She wouldn't take the hint and kept insisting that we would cuddle. I was getting fed up and so eventually I wake my friend up. Pretty sure he wasn't asleep at this point. Nathan, you asleep? He sits up. No, why? So she covers up with a blanket so he doesn't see her naked. And then I basically explained that I wanted to go for a walk. And so I have Nathan leave the room and her get dressed so we could go for a walk. On our way, I tell Nathan to get his bike. We walk outside at this point, and it's almost 3.30 a.m. Me and Nathan walking with our bikes, and the girl beside us. I'm thinking of ways we can get rid of this girl. At first, I suggest me and Nathan just take a walk in the alley and go pee. But she says she's scared and wants to go with us. Eventually, while walking and talking, she says how she was on track in high school. Oh, you run track? I bet that you can't beat us to the end of the block. At this point, Nathan looks at me and smirks as he knows that we're about to ditch this girl. For it to be 3.30 a.m., this girl was excited to go sprinting. She takes off running for the end of the block, and we take the opposite direction back towards my house. We rush back inside and hide our bikes in my house and sit at the porch and go to the living room, making sure to not turn on any lights. We sit in the living room talking about how crazy this chick is when she starts banging on my door. We stayed quiet for what seemed like two or three hours of her just banging on the door, talking to herself, banging on the door, then more talking to herself. Eventually we heard the downstairs door open and we watched her leave. I lived on the second floor of an apartment building and my mom was out of town. So the next few days I go to work and I don't see her, which is good. But about a week later she comes in and she's completely ignoring me. She gets her random grapefruit and pretends to shop while me and a co-worker are talking. She is wearing a backpack this time and she walks right in between me and my co-worker. We were maybe six feet apart. She turns to walk away and her backpack touches something on my flat cart. She turns around and starts screaming and throwing all of the boxes off my cart bunch of naked juices, some tomatoes, and a few other things I don't recall. She starts saying I grabbed her, and that she wanted to talk to the manager, and so my co-worker, who's an older guy in his 40s, tells me to go downstairs and just get away from the situation. I head downstairs and sit in the break room. 
About ten minutes later, I'm called up to the hallway where my store manager is talking to the girl. I see from the door that she leaves, and he comes in the hallway to speak with me. So this girl says you grabbed her and shoved her and that you were swearing at her. I explained what happened to the manager. He goes and finds my coworker and then comes back to me after talking to my coworker. My manager comes in and looks at me. You need to sleep with her already. We kind of chuckle and then he tells me don't worry about it, she's just crazy. Eventually she left me alone, but then my girlfriend started working with me. And the girl would come in and see me and my girlfriend and then go to her line to check out and was always very rude to my girlfriend. Eventually she stopped coming around altogether, and from the looks of it, she's married to some 50 year old man on Facebook, while she is 24. Creepy stalker girl, let's not meet. Let me tell you a story about an idealistic, overly naive boy. Well, woman, cause I'm transitioning. But that comes into play during another story that happened at the same time which actually has another story attached to that. In my senior year of college, I decided to study abroad. Inspired by a now ex-friend who was going and information sessions during my Japanese language class. The cost was the same tuition-wise, and I got scholarships for the study to cover that entirely. I only paid for housing, food, and my ticket. It was the opportunity of a lifetime that turned into the trauma of a lifetime. Now on my way to Japan, I was panicking in the car. I didn't think I could do it. It didn't help that my flight was very early and I had never flown alone, left the country, and hadn't lived alone since my sophomore year. My house was only 40 minutes away from the campus, so I was never on my own really. We got to the apartment and I waved to my family and went through bag check only to hear my dad mumble. He actually freaking did it. Thanks, Dad. I surprised myself, too. So off to Japan I fly, smiling and feeling free. I enjoyed my first two weeks, but things took a turn soon after. Now this is where my story branches off into two tales. The story for another time and today's main course. Brief summary. My friend and I had a falling out before Japan. Somehow we ended up befriending the same people and hanging out as a large group. This was fine for a while, but him being a gem led me to getting kicked out of that group. At this point, everyone had already formed cliques in our program, so I was alone. The treatment of that group and one clown made it hard for me to socialize due to gossip and people reading the air and judging me. I was alone in a foreign country, actively being shunned by the study abroad crowd, and gloriously all my anxiety came back with a vengeance. Now here's the thing, I really was struggling. I've been struggling with selective mutism. I had overcome it before, but a stressful situation brought it back. Now mix in a foreign language and I can barely speak at all. All things Japanese escaped my brain, so I was literally only able to say a few basics. Being alone made me decide to try online dating and meet up apps. I know, but I was desperate for somebody to talk to and I had considered a study abroad romance romantic. I never really tried dating before because I wasn't interested in anybody seeing me as a man in a sexual way, being trans. But this was my chance to really mature, and I desperately wanted to make friends to explore with, to really make lasting bonds. All that BS they sell you at the study abroad fair. So here we go. Match number one, cute guy. Claims he's in an acting troupe. He'll swing by if I want to get down. I slow it down, and we chat. He moves around because of the troop, and offers to pick me up. Thinks I should join, since study abroad sucks. I decline. Match number two. Calls me baby right off the bat. A little forward, but I don't mind. I'm awkward, and I've been accused of being forward, so I go with it. He keeps calling me baby. He rants about getting out of this long relationship. Asks me what I think of cheaters. Red flags, but I try to be open. I explain my views. He then asks me what I like. What movies and what foods. Says he'd like somebody to stay home and cook for him. Okay, dude. Since he considers cuddling and watching movies a good time, 
likes to have deep conversations. Sounds great. I'm lonely, an open book, and I hate bullcrap. His perfect date is mine as well. He calls me baby repeatedly, asks me a ton of personal questions, but I get one word responses to my questions. I flip it back on him, ask the same questions, and he asks another deeply personal question instead of an answer. Something feels off. This isn't normal. He swings from erratic anger about past relationships not working out, to heavy flirting, to a deeply personal quiz show, asking tons of questions all within an hour of the first contact. I'm in my room thinking, what the F? Am I being pranked? But I wasn't. I put the phone down and get a shower. I come back to more messages. The last one is angry because I'm taking so long to respond. I apologize and explain I was in the shower, and he gets more mad, calls me a liar. I apologize. We keep talking. Now as this is going on and alarm bells are ringing, I start thinking this guy is trying to get my info to impersonate me or something bad. Crazy, I know, but why else would this conversation be so one-sided? I'm more talkative via text, but I'm not that chatty. We are now on hour three. My head is spinning as I get swept around by the barrage of messages. Never really having time to think, I decide to tell him that I think I've had enough. He apologizes and tells me a sob story. I bite and go in deeper. He tells me that his ex kicked him out. I offer sympathy, and this guy starts saying words are better than actions. Calls me baby again, and tells me I should run to a store and get him a gift card for PlayStation Network. It's been a year. It might have been a specific game, maybe Fortnite or one of those MMO games. I say I think it should be the end. He immediately replies, okay. No anger. He does not rant. Just okay. Something about that was the creepiest part. It made me think this wasn't over, but honestly I still thought I was being catfished by the a-holes in my program. I mentioned to somebody I thought I could trust and he told me there's no way I'm being crazy. This guy sort of lets me lean on him a little bit, but turns out to be two-faced, but that's part of story number two. I turn to the other person I'm still friends with. We barely had spoken before, but she was sweet. I had tried to help her make friends after she was sick the first week. She ended up helping me in return later, as things got worse for me. She and I are actually still in contact. I did get that bond I wanted all because of a nice act I did while overwhelmed with my own crap. She agreed that wasn't normal, and we walked to the 7-Eleven for some chicken and drinks that night. I get a message from an older man. He tells me he's married and straight up just looking to experiment. Says he's never done this before. Yeah, right, dude. He literally says every cliche. Every come on. The works. It's like a bad rom-com. I should know since I love them. This guy talked like he was out of an episode from Will and Grace, so I'll call him Will, because honestly I don't remember his name. I told Will that one, I'm not interested in a sexual relationship, two, I will not break up a marriage, and three, I'm not into older guys. And Will was old, at least in his 50s. He had a blurry profile picture and sunglasses, no close-ups on the profile, but sent me a picture that could pass for the guy in the profile when I asked him to. He wasn't attractive to me at all, so I thought it could be real. Otherwise, why send an average older man's picture? We talk a little bit, and clearly I'm not interested, but also don't want to be rude. But he keeps pressuring me to meet up and asking questions. He likes that I think I'd be a bottom. He likes that I'm a virgin. I'm starting to get freaked out and tell him he's making me feel uncomfortable. He apologizes and assures me he's never done this before. I roll my eyes and say, sure. We talk and it goes back to see. He invites me to his hotel room so he can take my virginity and I can be his first. I cringe. He then disappears as quickly as he came. Whole profile deleted. I think that's weird. Conversations disappeared with him. Apparently that's how the app worked. Next day I get a message from Will. Sends the same picture of the guy without the glasses. Starts asking me about sex again, trying to talk dirty to me, and I say I'm not interested. He disappears again. 
Now this is where the stuff gets creepy. We are on to day number three of this behavior. He tells me he's in the town that I'm staying in. Says he's there one more night, and he wants to take me to Pound Town and pop my cherry. Hard pass, dude. No means no. And now I'm thinking of how pessimist he's been. I thought about stories of being kidnapped or raped in hotel rooms, and how this dude does not accept no. I get a glorious D pick while I'm thinking about what to do. I can't block him since he just pops up with another profile a day later. Life goes on and I accept this. Every day the old chat is gone and a new one disappears. I tell him no and block it. This goes on for a week and I get fed up and tell him to get a clue. I block and report him knowing it'll do nothing. At this point I don't leave my dorm for a few days, even for class. At this point I had stopped caring. I had coordinated my schedule with my friends and had to deal with at least two of them in every class. It made it hard to focus. The sweet girl checked on me and took me to a cute cafe above the station. I started hanging out there alone or with her. It just felt right, like exactly what I wanted. A place to chill away from those a-holes at the dorm. A place just for me and my friend. A few nights into this mess, I get a message from a new guy. We chat. And he seems cool, but the dude keeps trying to hook up with me. I guess the dating pool is slim if you only speak English, and he was super pent up. I explain I'm not looking for sex, and he says it's okay, but keeps pushing. He lets me know he's actually going to be in my suburb of Tokyo. I say I can't meet up, I'm actually in the main city with somebody. He says cool. The next day I get the same message. This time I lie and I say I'm in the city again. He tells me his friend lives by the station, and he will be there if I want to see him. Well that's weird because I live by the station, my dorm is right by the station. That is too convenient. Well here we go, I get a message. I check and it's from the guy. Says he thinks he saw me at the cafe. I look around and see no one who's not Japanese. I look outside and see an older man pass and think nothing of it. I say he should come say hi if he's there. No response. I ignore the message and leave for my other daily ritual, heading into the main area two stops over, looking at anime merch and visiting a local shrine. I had spent a lot of time at this shrine praying. I found it relaxing and quiet. I had been frequenting different shrines and performing rituals, making offering, filling out prayer cards, and buying talismans, the works. I was looking for an answer to things in my life about my mental health and loneliness, my struggles speaking, my ex-friend and the people shunning me. I was praying to decide should I stay or should I go, both about Japan and my life. Should I really transition? Should I go to the grad school or should I get a job? Should I be a lawyer or work in entertainment? Very heavy stuff. Then all of a sudden I feel this eerie sensation like I'm being watched. Now this shine is quiet and I see nobody else. I decide to get out of there as fast as I could. All the way home I feel watched. But I'm being paranoid, right? It's in my head, right? No, it's not. I've seen that old white man before. He was outside the cafe. I start wondering if he was number three. He was at the cafe when number three messaged me. And there aren't a lot of white people in Japan, so who else could it be? Then a worse thought pops into my head. What if this is Will? I try to stay calm and walk to the train, but this guy's following me. I get on and so does he. Just as the doors are closing, I jump out. Will is at the other end of the cart and doesn't see in time. I wait for the next train and I head home. But who do you think I see at my stop? Yep, you guessed it. Will. Now I've already made eye contact with him, so he knows I'm there. I remember something. There's a police box on the other side of the station. If I turn right instead of left, this guy will walk right by them. He couldn't possibly be gutsy enough to follow me after that. I run past Will and up the escalator. He slowly follows me all the way to the police box. Now, my Japanese was bad and I could barely speak over there, but I had a head start and tried to explain the situation, but no words would come out at all. I was frozen there trying to scream help, but nothing. Up walks Will. 
He casually grabs me by the arm, smiles at the officer, and says something in Japanese. He then looks down at me and tells me to be a good boy for daddy. He pulls me away from the cops and I'm speechless, even more so than I already was. As he leads me away, I'm shaking. This isn't going to end well for me. Tears fill my eyes, and he keeps leading me away. But suddenly there's my friend, walking down the street from the grocery store. I see a chance. I try to scream, but nothing comes out. By some miracle, she looks over at me. She reads my face and shouts at him. He's startled, and I bolt towards her. She charges at him, ready with pepper spray. He bolts, and we both cry. I stuck with her even more after that. I eventually left because my anxiety was so bad. The school had done nothing to help with my bullies, and the counselor I had asked to see took note of my encounter with Will, but nothing came of it, and he made me feel insecure like the whole thing was an exaggeration. I'm still struggling with a lot, but I am doing better. I'm on hormones, looking into a grad school program, and I've tried to put the past behind me, but the anxiety is still there, and I have nightmares about trying to scream, but no words come out. This happened about two years ago, and it still scares me when I think about it. First, a little background. My name is Jesse, and I live in the UK, and I'm from a smallish area, nothing fancy. I'm 18, and at the time I was 16, and worked at a family friend's pub collecting glasses. I would work from 7 to 11 at night, and I lived about a half an hour to 45 minutes away. To get home, I had to walk through a park. Now this park has three entrances and exits, two at the top and one at the bottom, which led into the town center and the main shopping area. The top two led to a different area. One is a skate park, and the other is literally right next to a comprehensive school and a big field. This park had a lot of bushes and trees in it, and only has a few lights. These lights shut off at around half ten. The only lights that are on are the lamppost outside. Each entrance was a big gate, and they were always open. This is important for later. I had to walk the path that leads towards the school, since it was the fastest way home. Now on to the story. I worked at the pub for a year, and had stuck to the same routine going home. Not smart, I know. I'd leave the house around 11ish sometimes, a few minutes before, sometimes a few minutes after. It took about 10 minutes to get to the park, so I'd be walking through the park at around half 11 sometimes, or 15 minutes past. Now the one entrance I had to use to get into the park was the one at the bottom, the one that leads to the shopping area. It had a lamppost outside the gate, and that was it. That was the only light, so I could see about 10 feet into the park, and there was a few benches. No one was ever in the park when I walked through it from work. During the autumn and winter weeks, it was always empty, even the streets were, so you could imagine my shock when I saw a man sitting on the bench as I walked through the park gates. Now this was so strange, it's around 45 minutes past 11, almost 12 at night. It's pitch black and freezing, and this dude was just sitting on the bench. I couldn't see him too well at first, but as I got closer I got a good look at him. He was young, about 20, maybe 25. Long hair and a ponytail, but not a scruffy one. It was tight and neat. He had hoop earrings and his nose was pierced. I can't remember his eye color. He was so pale and his hair was jet black, with red tips which went past his shoulders. He wore all black. He dressed like an emo to be honest. Looking back now, he kind of reminds me and looks like Dracula from the movie Van Helsing. He was on his phone and looked up at me. And as I walked towards him, he just stared at me as I walked past. I gave him a slight nod and smile and kept walking. He just looked me up and down, smirking, which freaked me out. He didn't say anything, and I managed to get home and didn't think much of him and forgot about it. The next night I went to work, finished my shift, and walked through the park again, and he was there. On his phone, wearing all black, hair and a ponytail. He looked up and saw me and smiled. I smiled back but walked a bit faster past him. Again he said nothing. This happened the next night, but on the fourth night he wasn't there. 
I walked through the park as usual, but I felt so uneasy. It was pitch black, no light, except for the moon. And what do I hear? Footsteps, quick footsteps behind me. So I turn around, and nothing, absolutely nothing. I wasn't taking any chances, so I ran through the park, and I swear, over the sound of my heart beating fast, and my footsteps, I hear twigs snapping and leaves crunching. After that, I started getting a lift home for about two weeks from a friend. Then, that friend went on a holiday, so I had to start walking home through the park again. The first night, which was Monday, the man wasn't there, but I still felt uneasy, like I was being watched. The second night, he was there, sitting on the bench, smiling, looking at me, but this time he spoke. In a very deep voice, he said, Hey, baby, love the tights and the skirt. I was wearing a black skirt and sheer tights with thick black thigh-high socks and Doc Martens with a black biker jacket and thick scarf. I had to wear all black for work. I looked at him awkwardly, smiled, and hurried away. The next few weeks he'd been in the park and make sexual comments, but always sat on the bench. I would try and get lifts home when I could, but still having to walk through that park most of the time. Lord, I hated that walk. One night, things escalated. I walked through the park as usual, and again, he was there, sitting, smiling at me. I did my best to ignore him as he made comments about my body and what he wanted to do with me. As I was walking away, I was out of the light and could only see two or three feet in front of me. I must have been about 20 feet away when I heard running behind me and I turned around and bam, someone runs into me at full speed and knocks me to the ground. I feel a heavy weight on me and instantly I feel hair on my face and a hand over my mouth. A familiar deep voice tells me not to fight and that it will be over quicker if I don't fight. It's him. He's on top of me and his hand starts to wander down my tummy and he starts to lift my skirt. I hear his zipper, and he's rambling about how he knows I wanted this, and how he's been waiting to do this for so long. He took his hand off my mouth, and that's when I took my chance. I bit him hard, really hard, and he screamed. He sat up off of me, and I could barely see, but he was holding his hand and cursing at me. So I took that opportunity, and pushed him, and got up. I started to run, and I heard him running after me. I ran towards the first gate, the one I usually use to leave, and was shocked and mortified to see that it was somehow locked. I could see it had a lock on it, because the lamppost on the other side shone on to the usual open gate. I was so confused, but I could hear him shouting, and I started to run again, and I ran towards the other gate, and it was closed, but not all the way. There was a small gap, so I squeezed through. This was the skate park gate. I just managed to squeeze through as he tried to grab me, and I turned and looked at him for a few seconds, catching my breath. He stared at me, and then started to try and fit through the gate, so I booked it as fast as I could. I ran towards the skate park path. The skate park was full of bushes. On one side of the path that ran through it, it also had a long dark path, which after about a 20 minute walk down, leads to a main road, but it's usually completely dead. I ran through the skate park and hid in the bushes, waiting for him, since if I had run onto the long path I'd be visible, and he would be able to see me and chase me, and since no one was around, I would stand no chance. The path that led to the road had very little light, but still had enough so he would see me and be able to find me. I sat in the bushes, hiding with my hand over my mouth. I sat for a minute, when I see him running through the skate park looking for me. He slowed down near an exit path, which leads to a long path, and he literally stood there for a minute, sniffing the air. No joke, he was sniffing it. His hair wasn't in a ponytail anymore, it was all over, and he wasn't wearing a coat. He wore a long sleeve shirt that was all black. It was winter, which confused me, since it was so dang cold. He looked around and I felt his eyes scan me, then he kept looking and started walking down the long path. After about 10 minutes, I felt it was safe, and I ran back towards the park, and ran into the park and ran to the gate that I usually go through to get home. It was still locked, so I climbed over it. I walked towards the school, 
following the path I always used, and I had a strange urge to look back. And there, at the gate, the man was standing, just standing and watching me. He laughed and said, I'll catch you one day, baby girl. Mark my words. And he blew me a kiss and walked away into the darkness. I've never felt so scared in my life. I booked it home and told my mom what had happened. She called the cops and council and asked why the fence was locked. The council was just as confused as I had been because they never locked the gate. Ever. The police couldn't do much. They put out a warning and that was about it. The creepy thing was he had to have learned my pattern. He had to have known I used the park every night to get home. It creeps me out to this day knowing that I was being watched and I could have been assaulted or worse. I still have nightmares from time to time about him and wonder what could have happened to me had I not gotten away or he had seen me in the bushes. I quit working at the pub and haven't used the park since. So creepy park guy, I'm glad I never have to see you again. The story is an old one from when I was 20 and it's mostly the reason why I hate catching buses now. I live in a sleepy little city in Australia with freaking horrible public transport. Most buses will go into town, but a place that is a 10 minute drive north of me might be 40 minutes on the bus because I have to bus into the city and out again to get there. There's nothing that goes in the space in between. It's like a spider web. There's a lot of connections, but even more gaps, if that makes sense. I've been bussing most of my life since I was seven. It's pretty safe here, so I was always comfortable catching the bus at night. I lived a three minute walk away from the closest bus stop on a well lit street, so even if there was trouble, it was easy for me to dash home if I was nervous. I know this seems like a lot of preamble, but bear with me, it's kind of important. In October of 2017, I went to a job interview in a part of town that I wasn't all familiar with, and I decided to visit a friend afterwards because she lived a bit further up on that same bus route. I had never been to her house before. The job was maybe five minutes north by bus out of the CBD, but this friend's house was a good 15 to 20. I watched all of my landmarks melt away and ended up somewhere a lot more industrialized than what I was used to. My friend lived in a share house, and the rent was cheap, even if the neighborhood was crap, and that was the compromise she made. No judgment. It was maybe 11 p.m. or so when I decided to head home. I stupidly hadn't checked the bus situation back to mine before I left, and I figured it would be the same as how I got there, into the city and out again. But where I live, a lot of buses stopped running after 11 p.m. at night, and the bus I wanted to get on was one of them. Where I live, even now, most buses don't run past midnight. Even on weekends. No big deal, I thought. There was another bus. It would be fine. The only problem was this bus was going the wrong way. This bus was going even further out of town, further into this shady, horribly unfamiliar neighborhood. It went right up to the interchange, where a bunch of different buses would meet in a hub before taking off again in the sketchy part of the suburbs. And from there, I could catch a bus home. Uber was expensive and I was broke, so I just shrugged and decided that this is what I would do. So I hopped on the bus. Honestly, it was fine at first. A bit spooky, because I don't know where I was, to be exact, and it was dark and late. But I knew the second I was more familiar territory, it would be fine. So I put in my headphones and I just let it all pass by. About six stops away from the interchange, an older guy gets on. He was 40, going 80. He had a tangled, matted beard and skin so thin I thought his bones would tear through at any second. His clothes were hanging off of him, and I honestly didn't know what color they were. So dirty, but like I said, I didn't know this part of town, and you get all sorts on the late bus. I didn't want to assume things. My first clue that something was up was that he didn't pay. The driver was tired and didn't say much, so I rolled my eyes a little and went back to my phone. The next thing was the mumbling. I thought my music was playing up when I looked up and the guy was just staring in front of himself, mumbling, eyes hard as pavement. There were a couple other people on the bus, all looking as nervous as I felt. 
but I figured he was just out of it and homeless. I felt bad for him more than anything. And ten minutes later we pulled up at the interchange and I hopped off to grab my connecting bus and decided to not think any more about it. It was weird, but whatever. I was 20. I had other things on my mind. Then this creepy guy gets on the bus with me. I'd settled about halfway back and I was queuing up more music when I saw him get on. I kind of froze at first, but I figured it was coincidence. Besides, there was a couple other people on the bus, so I felt pretty safe. Then one by one, all these people got off the bus and it was just him and me left. At this point, it was nearing midnight. It was pitch dark outside, and I know the bus route I was on pretty well, but not that part of it, just after the interchange. I started texting my boyfriend because his house was on the route, and it was closer than mine was. The guy on the bus was still mumbling, but when I looked up, it was at me. I watched, frozen, as he slowly got up and moved closer to my seat. I still couldn't make out what he was saying, but it was to me. I know he was talking to me. So you might be wondering, why didn't I just move? Great question. In my head, I didn't want to draw attention to myself by moving. I thought of him like he was a T-Rex in Jurassic Park. Maybe if I stayed still, he wouldn't see me. But he had already seen me. I could feel his eyes on me, like he had taken a hand and pressed it into my neck. His stare felt so heavy. My boyfriend had me share my location for safety. I turned off my music so I could focus better and look at the map to get my bearings. I knew I was about 15 minutes from my house, 10 from my boyfriend's. He lived a 30 second walk from the bus stop in a share house that was never locked because there were people always over. He was at a birthday an hour away so he wasn't home, but he said I could get off early and go to his house if I was scared but I told myself it was no big deal. I was close to my house, and the creepy guy would leave me alone soon. I didn't need to hide behind my boyfriend's friends to feel safe. I was a strong, independent, dumb woman. This stranger was creepy, but I told myself he was harmless. No point freaking out over nothing. And then he moved again. He moved so he was right behind me. I could feel his breath on my neck in small puffs as he mumbled, I still couldn't hear the words, but he leaned forward, and I stopped texting my boyfriend because when it's time to fight or run, I freeze instead. That 10 minutes felt like 10 hours. I felt like I was holding my breath the whole way as that creep leaned closer, whispering and mumbling. I didn't catch a word of what he was saying, but I would swear to all the angels that I could feel it against my neck. My skin was doing its best to slither off of my skeleton and I stared, dead-eyed, at my phone, watching my location and taking in the street names because I decided that I wasn't waiting to get to my stop. I was getting off at my boyfriend's and legging it, so that's what I did. I sprinted off that bus and ran to his house, and I slammed the door behind me, not even checking to see if he followed me off. To my horror, my boyfriend's house for the first time that year was empty. His tiny dog was barking her head off, and I was crying as I texted my boyfriend, asking where everybody was, why tonight was the night the house was empty, why the door was so impossible to lock, and when I finally got it closed, my boyfriend's dog was still barking, barking, and barking. I sat in the hallway for a while, listening for the swing of a gate. If I heard it creak, I told myself I would call the cops. After a few minutes, I got up and I went to my boyfriend's room to wait. The whole time this dog is still barking, but not her, somebody is home bark. She was doing her, I'm trying to be menacing because I do not like this, bark and growl, the kind that shot her whole body forward. So I lifted up my boyfriend's blinds and I peeked for a second, and there in the middle of the road, in a pool of cold street light, somebody was standing and looking at the house. At that distance, I couldn't see them. And I don't think they could see me, so I don't know for sure if it was the same guy or not. But I don't know. As I stared at him, in the back of my head, I heard those whispers that I heard on the bus. My boyfriend got back about 20 minutes later, and there was nobody in the street at that time. But I still cried a lot. It had been a few years since this happened, but I'll never forget that guy and the feeling of the breath on my neck.
So this just happened to me about 15 minutes ago, and more than anything, I'm just embarrassed that I couldn't have just rolled it off of my back and not gotten scared. I live in a fairly low rent, shady apartment complex since I'm in college, and that's what I can afford. Obviously, we are all keeping our social distance for COVID-19, but I really wanted to try to get just a bit more sunlight to help me keep my sanity from being home all day, every day. So I went out of my apartment and sat on a bench near the bus stop just to sit for a while. I put my earbuds in and I call a friend. In my peripheral vision, I can see the people standing outside their doors to have cigarettes and a lady walking her dog. But we were all, at the very least, 40 feet away from each other. So nobody seemed worried. A couple were talking outside their door and for a moment, I thought they were looking at me. I figured I was just being paranoid until the woman started walking my direction. As she was walking, I was keeping an eye on it, but trying to keep acting like I hadn't noticed. The bench I was on was near the mailboxes for the whole complex and the bus stop, so I figured there were plenty of reasons other than me that she could be coming that way. That was until she stopped just in front of me. I looked up, noticed. I'd seen this woman once before on the bus. She wears a lot of very heavy, dramatic makeup including drawing on a set of eyebrows just below the one she has already growing. She once started talking to me on my morning bus ride to school and gave me an itemized list of the things she didn't like about my face. I had just sort of smiled and nodded and then looked the other way for the rest of the trip. It looked like maybe she was talking, so I pulled my earbuds out and I hung up on my friend abruptly. I said, Sorry? Could you call the police for me? She said, Oh, okay, I said, picking up my phone. Actually, never mind, she said quickly as she looked nervous. Are you sure? Yeah, could I have a dollar? I told her I didn't have any change and I apologized. Oh, okay, actually, could you call the police for me? Yes, I said again, unlocking my phone. Wait, actually, it's fine, she said, now smiling at me. Now when she said it the first time, my brain at first thought, She's not visibly injured. Maybe she's in trouble? Had she been fighting with that man I saw her with before? Was she in danger? Was she being so casual with me because she needed help and didn't want to alert somebody that she was trying to get it? I looked her in the eyes and said, Are you sure? I really can call somebody if you need it. She said, No, it's fine. Now, some important context about me is that I have some history of trauma. I don't really want to elaborate too much, but the short of it is that I'm left with a lot of fear of people touching me or violating my personal space. Because some things from when I was growing up, my body now basically has the worst response when somebody violates my boundaries, which is to go very limp and let the other person do whatever they want to me in the hopes that if I don't struggle, they won't hurt me as much. It's basically the worst response I could have, but it's very hard to reprogram my body. Due to my mental health issues, I've also spent significant periods of my life in psychiatric hospitals for treatment. I've met a lot of people with different issues in the hospital, so I have a bit of sense for when somebody might not be there all the way mentally. The longer I tried to talk to this woman, the more of a sense I got that she was perhaps not totally in her right mind. Now I'm in the hospital, I've had similar experiences where somebody who wasn't fully lucid cornered me and I got trapped in a potentially not safe situation. This is all made worse by my inability to A. Get people to just leave me alone and B. Protect my physical space when my body has been triggered into fight or flight. In the hospital when this happens, the hope is that the staff notices and helps me get away. So at that moment my body decided it was time to screw me over. I started to realize that this woman was getting closer and closer to me and probably not totally well in the head. My body started pumping adrenaline, which made my hands and legs start to feel weak. I felt like I couldn't get enough breath, and my head started to go a little fuzzy. The woman positioned herself to sit down next to me, and I started to try to get up. Hey, do you want to walk to the store with me? She said. I stood up. Oh, sorry, I can't. I have to take my friend to, uh, somewhere. I realized I couldn't think of a lie fast enough. My brain wasn't cooperating. He's, uh, been texting me all day, and, uh, sorry. Okay, she says, now standing next to me. 
I started to walk from the bench back over to my building. My legs were feeling pretty wobbly, but I tried to walk as casual as I possibly could. Behind me, I could hear her following. She wasn't moving too fast. I thought maybe she thought I wouldn't notice. So I tried not to seem scared. Not that my legs would have been able to run anyway. I got into my building about 60 seconds before her, and she was still definitely following. I kept thinking, I just need to get into my apartment and lock the doors before she can see which one is mine. My apartment is on the second floor, but it's a short flight of stairs, and you can see my apartment door from the bottom, where the main door to the building is. I tried to run up them, but my head was swimming, and my legs weren't cooperating. It's like that feeling when you're half awake, and you try to move your limbs, and they sort of do what you tell them to, but not really. Like they feel sort of far away from you, and only semi under your control. I made it up the stairs and luckily I had left my door unlocked. I got in and closed it behind me just as I heard her opening the main door to the building below me. I locked all three locks on my door and went over to the window to see if I could see her. She wasn't visible from the window which means she was still in my building. I texted my dad and asked if he thought I should still call the police. He said I should. I went to my bedroom and called 911. Now the windows of my bedroom show the other side of the building and the back door. The operator asked for a description and if I knew where she was now, and I told her I could not see her out of my front windows, so I thought she was still in the building. Then suddenly I saw her walk out and just stand below my window. The 911 operator said that she'd send a few officers and to call them back if she left. I backed away from the window a bit. I was worried she'd see me looking at her and then know which unit I was in. She looked around her for a bit, and then just slowly started wandering away towards a different building. Within about five minutes, three cop cars rolled in and stopped behind my apartment. They noticed her standing over by the other building, looking like she might want to try to talk to the woman walking the dog. Two of the police officers parked and went to talk to her while the third drove off. I watched as they talked to her for a while, and that eventually the man I'd seen her talking to, at the start, came out of a different building than they'd been standing in front of before and seemed to coax her in a way. The officers let her go and talked to the woman with a dog for a minute, and then drove away. I think probably they decided she had mental health issues, but wasn't actively a threat to anyone, so they let it be, which is okay with me. I know that some people deal with chronic issues, and can be a little alarming to the people in the community, most of the time don't pose much of a threat. Now I'm just sitting here feeling like an overdramatic fool and waiting to regain full control of my limbs and for my heart rate to go down. So a short backstory. My older brother worked for his now ex-girlfriend's dad as a janitor. He was 19 and I recently turned 17 and I'm 19 now. His girlfriend was in my class and asked her dad to hire me. This job was a contracted job, so we would go to this business and clean their bathrooms, cafeterias, kitchenettes, and take out the cubicle trash. There were about four different buildings all belonging to this one business, so I rarely saw my brother, who was constantly at the main building. Eventually, I was moved to the main building, where my brother and I worked together. I made sure to be an annoying little sister at times, so he didn't like to work in the same area with me but we would work with our co-workers in the biggest areas together, like the cafeteria. One of our co-workers was around 45, and her son was a grade younger than me. We will call her Lisa. We were the only two working at another building together before moving to the main building. When we had breaks, she would offer me a cigarette every now and then. I always accepted as I smoked prior, but had to quit when my dad found them and made me throw them away. Now the story actually begins. There was a man about 58 years old who worked at the main building in the production area. We'll call him Bob. There were only two bathrooms, a small office and a trash compactor, so I rarely went there. The production area and the main hallway to go outside was connected by the cafeteria. One day while we were cleaning the cafeteria, I was vacuuming the rugs when Bob came up from behind me and poked my sides. This obviously scared me, as my brother was in front of me cleaning the counters. He started laughing about how high I jumped from randomly being touched. 
I turned around and it was Bob. He was laughing as well. I thought it was odd, but since my brother was laughing, I brushed it off. I can't remember exactly how it all started, but I think that was it. Bob kept badgering me about friending him on Facebook. I kept saying that I forgot and I would add him that night, but I never did until I eventually got annoyed and I just added him. He would text me every weekend asking how I was and what I was doing and when the next day that I worked would be. I didn't see anything wrong at first, so I replied. Bob would go on smoke breaks with Lisa. I would join them because they would offer me cigarettes and I couldn't buy them anymore out of fear that my dad would find them. Nothing out of the ordinary happened on our smoke breaks. We would small talk about our days and such. Lisa had a boyfriend, and things were pretty rough between them. This all happened in the span of a year, so the timeline is a bit blurry. But at one point, Lisa stopped going on smoke breaks with me and Bob. I learned Bob's break schedule, and would stop working just to go out and smoke with him. By this point, I was back again being addicted to cigarettes. I didn't tell Bob, but I only talked to him so that he would give me free smokes. I forgot to mention that Lisa's boyfriend started working with us. He asked me if Bob was my boyfriend or my dad because the relationship between us was hard to tell because of how close we were. Bob would say things to me like, I'm basically your dad. We get along so well. He once said I looked like his 20-something daughter and people here think we're father and daughter. But the worst thing he said was, someone asked me if we were dating or related and I told them it's none of your business. I had a boyfriend that he knew about so that upset me a lot. I didn't try to correct him because I was afraid that my free cigarettes would stop. When winter came around, we would smoke in Bob's car. He always started his car so we would have heat, but a few times he put the car in drive and drove around the parking lot. I didn't panic, but I made sure I had an escape plan, plus my brother would know where I was and would get worried if I never returned. Bob also called everybody pet names like Honey and Princess, so I never thought anything of it when he called me them. He once even commented on my profile picture, very beautiful princess. As in Bob's mind, he was my father figure. He thought that Lisa was my mother figure. I have great loving parents at home, so I never looked at any other adult as parental figures. He would tell Lisa and I that he wanted to take us out to eat and we could drink at his apartment afterwards, basically a family night. We would mention that it could be fun, but never went into further details about it, since we both knew we wouldn't be going. Bob would tell me about his life and how lonely he was. He confessed to me his undying love for Lisa. It said things like, I can give her a much better life than her boyfriend, and if she were just to give me a chance, I can make her happy. Lisa cut all contact with him, and he was heartbroken. I told my parents about Bob, and they agreed that he was acting very odd. I asked them to talk to my older brother, as I thought that he should have said something to Bob, telling him to leave me alone. He would always laugh when Bob scared me, so I pushed off the creepy vibes for months. By this time I turned 18, I once made the mistake of trying to joke. A man passed us at the smoke pit and asked if I was Bob's daughter. I said, might as well be, which was a big mistake. After this, Bob started giving me side hugs and eventually kissed the top of my head less often than the hugs. It even got to the point of him telling me he loves me. He would walk beside me and take my phone out of my back pocket, then compliment me on how fast I reacted, saying, I'd never grab your butt, I just wanted to see what you would do. A new lady around 36 started working with Bob in production, and he forgot all about Lisa and focused on this new lady. She now joined us on smoke breaks, and he would even drive her to the store after work since she didn't have a car. She also had a rough patch with her boyfriend, which made Bob complain the same way he did about Lisa. My older brother quit, and my younger brother took his place. He would join us at the smoke pit, but eventually stopped going because he didn't like smoking. I asked him what he thought about Bob. He said Bob was extremely creepy, and I agreed. On Halloween, the new lady and I both dressed up. Bob took our picture on his phone. He even made our picture his lock screen. I just thought that he was using me as a way to have a picture of her, and he wanted her on his lock screen, not me. When the new lady stopped working at the business, Bob again was heartbroken. He told me that he tried to keep in touch with her, but she blocked him with no warning, so he turned back to Lisa. 
She would sometimes smoke with us, but not nearly as much as she did before. When we walked down the hall, he would make sexual jokes to her. And from what she told me, he made jokes to me too, but not nearly as sexual, so I never caught on. She stopped talking to him again. I told my boss and co-workers that I was joining the Air Force soon and would quit a month before basic military training so I could enjoy time with my family. I mentioned this to Bob once. He acted like a proud dad and gave me life advice that I didn't pay much attention to. I have had enough of him sexually harassing my co-worker and giving me the creeps. My boyfriend was also joining the Air Force and wanted me to quit my job sooner than I planned. Two months before my scheduled BMT date, Bob brought up the dinner idea again, but this time without Lisa being invited. He said that we could watch movies in his apartment, and he would buy me whatever alcohol I wanted, and if I fell asleep, he would put me in his bed, and he would sleep on the couch. I told him that my parents would never let me sleep at an older man's apartment, and my boyfriend would be very upset. He told me to lie about where I was going, and I declined. He also thought that when I was on leave, I would go to his work and surprise him. His logic. I knew his work schedule. He honestly thought that we were so close that I would go out of my way with the limited time I had with my family while I was home just to go back to where I used to work so I could smoke a cigarette with him for 10 minutes. Yeah, right. I complained to my parents again about Bob, and they told me to quit the next time I worked. They agreed to help me pay for anything I wanted to do before BMT, when the money I had saved ran out because they wanted me happy and out of Bob's life. It was two weeks before my boyfriend left for BMT, so quitting at that time would be perfect so I could spend the next two weeks with him, which is what I did. I texted my boss and told him about Bob and how he would make sexual jokes to Lisa and how he made me uncomfortable. He said he had never heard anything about it before and I should have told him earlier. Since I was quitting and would no longer be in that building, he couldn't go to HR to complain. Bob texted me the night before I quit. I gave short, dull answers. He asked if everything was okay because I wasn't my usual self. Weeks before I stopped replying to him because why would an 18 year old want to spend her free time texting a creepy 58 year old? I blocked him on Facebook that night too. The next day I went to work and I was in the cafeteria taking out trash. I see Bob talking to Lisa, showing her something on his phone. Then he came over to me. I quickly grabbed the large garbage bags so I could use them as an excuse to leave. He told me that he changed his lock screen because I was leaving soon. His exact words were, your eyes tell a story. I was a senior. It was my senior picture from almost a year ago. I was 17 in that picture. He had to scroll through my Facebook just to find it. I told him that it was nice and that I had to get on with my work and I walked away. The next day I went back to return my badge and keys. I went to Lisa to ask her if she noticed how creepy Bob had been since I thought I was the only one that noticed. I wasn't the only one. She went off about how he was always sexually harassing her and she laughed awkwardly to get away from it. She said, you ever wonder why I stopped going on smoke breaks with you guys? I told her about his love for her and she was disgusted. She then said something that makes the whole last year that I've been working there come together. I think it was you all along. She thought that when Bob was complaining about his love for her, he was really talking about me. She showed me a text from him the night prior. I didn't come into work today because of OP, because it hurts that I can't text her anymore, and so on. My brother told me that Bob was out of work for three days before finally going back. I did unblock him for a day to see if our messages would still be there, so I could show my boss, but they weren't. I did get a message from him apologizing if he upset me in any way, because Lisa told him that I quit because of him. He was asking if it was true. In his mind, I was like a daughter to him that unexpectedly blocked him and quit to get him out of my life. I'm sorry this isn't a very climactic story, but it still creeps me out to think about this old man who was grooming me from poking my sides to slowly leading up to hug me, kissing my head, and telling me that he loves me, texting me every day. I wish I would have followed my gut instinct and stopped talking to him sooner, but I really wanted those cigarettes. I'm just happy that I had enough common sense to not go to his apartment and drink with him. 
He lived over the bar that my mom's friend worked at. She told me that he showed her a picture of me once, telling her how proud he is of me joining the military. To give the context of where this story is based, I live in a smallish college town near a small to medium-sized city. The town itself doesn't have a lot of people and is mostly here to cater to the demand that comes from the college. Because of this, the stores around the college are mostly open 24-7 so that the college kids will be able to impulse buy whatever they like. The other big seller around here is gas. Of course, gas can be bought in a city, but being a town that is often gone through in order to get to the city, a lot of places will try to keep the price of gas slightly lower than any of the stations in the city. My story begins when I was working overnight in a gas station slash liquor store when I was doing part-time classes in college, but mostly doing classes online so they wouldn't ruin my availability for a full-time job. The store that I worked at had only one person working on overnights for a long time. Even though a lot of people, especially girls, would complain of the lack of cameras and the fact that you don't always get the best people going into a liquor store slash gas station in the middle of the night. The owner's hand was forced on one night before I started working there that a woman who came in to buy milk went outside to her car only for a man to come up behind her and shove a gun to her back, demanding her money. She complied with him and luckily he let her go. She ran into the store, sobbing hysterically, and though police arrived shortly after, he was never found. I personally preferred having two people on, even if there wasn't a safety issue. The night seemed to go by so much quicker when there was somebody else there, and it was really nice that the person I normally closed with and I got along so well. Overall, there were four overnight shift workers, Josh, Nick, Dixie, and myself. Dixie had another job and was really only working there as a favor to one of the managers, so she only worked two nights a week with either Josh or I. Josh and I worked together three nights a week, and Nick worked with Josh and I two nights a week. Dixie was really nice and fun to be around, but she didn't particularly like the job or want to be there. Josh would get annoyed with her a lot for just standing behind the register while he did all the work. But it was only one night a week, so he didn't complain too much. Nick, on the other hand, was a bit different. He worked there five days a week, just like Josh and I, but they never seemed to put him with one person more than one day a week. Nobody seemed to really like him or like working with him. Nick was a little bit off from the start. He was one of those people who told you his entire life story as soon as he met you, giving a bunch of really personal details that nobody was really comfortable hearing. One thing he always seemed to talk about was the strain on his marriage. Apparently, he had a really bad drinking and drug problem for a very long time, and the drug part got better when he could switch over to weed, but he couldn't seem to get his drinking under control. He was hard to be around. But you kind of get used to some people in that kind of job being sketchy. I was there for almost three months when Nick's story seemed to escalate out of nowhere. He began telling people that when he was younger, he was diagnosed as a psychopath and he had to take a bunch of pills for it every day so he wouldn't become violent. Not exactly what you want to hear from somebody you're alone with in the middle of the night. But okay, we all have our problems and some people get dealt a bad hand when it comes to mental illness. I, myself, have always struggled to get my anxiety and depression under control and without medicine. I wouldn't be killing people by any means, but I'd probably be hospitalized in danger to self categories. So, as creepy as that was, I assured him that a lot of people need to take medicine for some kind of illness, and as long as you stick to it and are honest with the medical professionals, there's no reason you can't still do anything anybody else can do. He seemed pleased with this answer, and soon after, the subject was turned to other things. He was especially cheery and nice to meet after that for the next week or so, letting me know daily that he was taking his medicine and felt like things were going well for him. I always answered enthusiastically, but I'm pretty sure everybody, especially Josh, was aware of how much I wish he would stop talking to me about it and would leave me alone. Josh had a wife and a daughter who was two at the time, so he couldn't help but see us younger girls through the eyes of what his daughter might potentially have to deal with 
when she was our age and seemed to go out of his way to end my conversations with Nick rather quickly, which I was grateful for and didn't really try to pretend that he liked Nick. It wasn't long before Nick started conversations with me, going into details about why he was diagnosed instead of how his medicine was working, which I won't get into here because a lot of it was very violent and sexual. I told him repeatedly that I didn't want to know about that, to which he would act like he understood and change the subject only for him to circle back to it about an hour later. When I confided to Dixie about it, she told me that she would take care of it and told her friend, which was the manager, who asked her to come work there. The manager couldn't really do much, since I seemed to be the only one that he would talk to about these things, and told me to come to her again if he made me feel uncomfortable. It was starting to get increasingly tense for everyone who worked with him. After he was talked to by the manager, and soon enough two other women who worked with him on the night shift reported comments he made to them to the manager. I was questioned, in which I agreed that all of the statements made by these women were similar to things that had been said to me. Nick was given a final warning and a write-up. The next couple times I saw him, he would go on rants about how people there were only reporting him because they didn't like him. I assume he didn't know that I had been questioned too, and neither Josh or I had any intention to tell him. He got so mad. At one point, he practically was in tears, saying how lucky those C words were that he was on his meds and what he would do to them if he wasn't. Luckily, it was about that point that his shift ended, and pretty much as soon as he clocked out, Josh told him that we had a lot of work to get done that night, so we really didn't have time to talk with him. He nodded and walked out the door, without another word. Josh wasn't lying either. The truck had come extremely late that day, so there was quite a bit of things that still needed to be put on the shelf. One thing that the earlier shifts never seemed to do, unless they absolutely had to, was stock in the drink coolers. It was true that it was easier to do at night when there were a lot less customers, so it was annoying since we couldn't chat, but we just went with it. I can't remember the time that Josh went into the drink cooler, but it must have been pretty late since we had been there for a while at that point. I was still focused on stocking the shelves and making sure everything looked full if we didn't have it. When the bell chimed, signaling that someone had come in, I threw out a good evening and I'd be right there since anybody that came in that late usually only wanted a pack of cigarettes or to pay for the gas and cash. I put down my box and I went to the registers, slowing dramatically once I could see them. You guessed it, there was Nick. Not looking at me, but leaning next to my register. I'd be lying if I said I had a reason to be afraid. It did turn out that he was drunk, but I couldn't detect it right away from the smell of the booze that always seemed to linger in the air around there and Josh was right on the other side of the wall. Even so, I considered for about 30 seconds if I should actually go, or if I should run into the cooler and get Josh. Nick wasn't a young, fit guy or anything. Years of drugs and drinking had aged him prematurely and ruined his body, but he was still intimidating to a 20-year-old girl. Unfortunately, Nick made the decision for me, when probably tired of waiting, turned towards me, and that's when I noticed immediately that there was something off about him. My voice was nothing more than a pathetic whisper when I asked him what he wanted. He just stared at me. Nothing of his face to tell me what he was thinking. I was about to speak again when he spoke, barely intelligible because of his slurring. He leave you here alone? It took me a second to shake my head and tell him in a hopefully steady voice that Josh was in the cooler and asked if he wanted me to go get him, again staring at me in silence. At this point, I didn't even care what he said. I just wanted him to say something. The silent staring was creeping me out. I asked with more force in my voice, What do you want, Nick? As soon as I stopped speaking, he grinned at me, and in a disgusting, almost singing voice, he said, You're lying. You are alone. He laughed and took a step towards me, but stumbled, allowing me to take several steps back. At this point, I should have run into Josh. I should have called for him, or anything. But I couldn't believe that I was reading the situation right. Nick was very weird, but I never felt in actual danger around him before. He had never come off as more than just a little unstable. He continued to come forward in slow, stumbling steps, telling me to come here, 
I just want to talk. I kept out of his reach, telling him to back off and that I would hurt him if I had to. He thought that was particularly amusing and laughed loud enough that Josh told me later that that's what caused him to look through the spaces of the wax and see what was going on. Josh was out the door in a second and seemed to come out of nowhere, shoving himself in between Nick and I. They didn't even say anything. They just stared at each other before Josh said in a stern tone, I think you should leave now. Nick stared blankly for a moment, then scoffed, telling us that we couldn't take a joke. I was trying not to cry at this point. The only thing more terrifying about the situation was knowing that if Josh hadn't been there and he had somehow caught me, I would have stood no chance against him. Josh left me standing with my back against the wall, corralling Nick to the door, completely unexpected on both of our parts. Nick turned and took a swing at Josh, luckily either because he was drunk or just really uncoordinated. He missed Josh's face and Josh grabbed the back of his coat and brought him down as he smashed his knee into Nick's stomach and chest area, I'm not sure which, and used the opportunity of his sputtering to drag him to the door and throw him out, locking it. Josh had just turned and told me to call the cops as we heard this sickening crack behind him. We both jumped and looked at the door to find this big circle of glass. It's hard to explain, but if you've ever seen a movie of one or an actual car wreck when something hits a windshield, but not hard enough to break through it, and it turns white all around the point of impact, that's what the door looked like. Josh didn't have to tell me what to do. This time I ran to the register, I grabbed my phone, going to the corner farthest away from the front door, and huddled on the floor. I didn't even notice at the time, but Josh told me later that when he turned to see the glass, that was the first time that he had noticed that Nick had a hunting knife in his other hand. The fact that he had tried to punch Josh instead of stab him is a mystery and a miracle. I was sobbing when the operator picked up the phone. I don't even know how she understood me. I was crying so hard. But between my distress and the sounds of Josh and Nick yelling at each other in the background, with loud smashes of Nick hitting the door, she got the urgency of the situation. She asked me where I was, and luckily she knew the address because just as I got up to look at the receipt to see what the address was, the glass smashed. I dropped back to the floor and she told me that officers were already on the way and to do whatever I could to get away or hide, even if I had to leave Josh. The hole wasn't big enough for him to get through, and he had made it by grabbing the ashtray from outside and throwing it at the part of the window he had been repeatedly punching, causing it to break through. He didn't make it to break through though. From that hole he could reach the lock on the door. According to Josh, he walked to the door and put his mouth against the hole that had just formed and said something that I'm sobbing right now even thinking about. In that horrible sing-song voice that he used the first time I talked to him that night, he said in such a happy tone, they're never going to find you two. Needless to say, as tough as he was acting, Josh was crapping bricks as much as I was. He was older than Nick in his mid-30s but he was a beanpole and wasn't exactly known for his fighting skills. Even so, as soon as Nick unlocked and started to open the door, Josh slammed his body into it, knocking Nick backwards from the impact. Josh yelled for me to run, and even though my legs felt like they would give out at any moment, I ran behind him to the receiving doors in the back of the store. Nick was cursing and yelling for us as the door jingle went off. Josh slammed into the back door, cursing in pain as he realized that it wouldn't open. We found out later that Nick had pushed the dumpster in front of the door, locking the wheels of it again before he came in. We seemed to both realize at once that he actually planned this out to kill us. Nick rounded the corner, still doing that awkward stumbling walk though faster now. It at least gave me time to slam the back door shut and lock it. I was sitting in front of it, Josh bringing over anything he could find to barricade the door shut when Nick reached it. He must have heard me crying because he kept calling out my name, telling me that I wasn't who he wanted. He would make sure that I died before I even felt the pain if I opened the door. He then started stabbing the door, screaming at me to open it. I screamed and moved when he stabbed it the first time, but Josh and I both moved immediately to hold it shut again. I remember Josh and I making eye contact. 
We were both crying by now, and I wanted so badly to say something to comfort him, but I couldn't think of anything to say. I had dropped my phone when I ran to hold the door shut, and neither of us could move to get it, so we had no idea how long until the police got there, and the door was made of wood so it wouldn't last long against his body slams, and offered no protection if his knife went into one of our hands. All I could think about was that I was going to die here, that my dog would never know why I didn't come home, that I would never get my degree and have enough money to actually start enjoying life, that all of the plans for the future my girlfriend and I had made would never happen. In the most anticlimactic and wonderful finish ever, it suddenly went silent. There was no police car alarms, no yelling, nothing. It was as if Nick had just vanished. Josh and I looked at each other, not even daring to breathe, listening for any sign of life on the other side of that door. We both slammed to the ground when a gunshot went off once, then twice, and then a third time. There was more silence, then a voice rang out, asking if anybody was there. We weren't sure if we should say anything. Then the voice continued with his name and that he was an off-duty EMT who had just been listening to the scanner. Josh got up and pushed the thing aside in front of the door, opening it just enough to put his head out, and then it seemed like all the breath just left him. He opened the door and went out to the store, relief all over him. I ran and grabbed my phone, seeing that the call had disconnected or the dispatcher had hung up. When I went out into the store where Josh and our rescuer was, he was in the middle of explaining how the police over the scanner were sending a bunch of cars, but they all were pretty far away, and he had a horrible feeling that they wouldn't get there in time when the dispatcher was telling them what they'd find when they got there. He didn't want either of us to go outside until the police got there, because though Nick had been shot in the shoulder, he had still had the knife when he took off. The EMT said he would run after him, but with the state that the store was in, he was scared that somebody in here could be dying or hurt. The next 20 minutes were a blur. Josh and I were sitting on the ground, hugging each other, when the police got there. The EMT had called dispatch and told them of the new situation, and most of the cars that were coming to our location were diverted to looking for Nick. It was soon after that that Josh got to use his phone to call his wife, and she came right over, only bringing their daughter, because he begged her to. He seemed to completely break down when he held his daughter and hugged his wife. I had an extremely similar reaction when I finally got to go home and came in to see my dog's body wiggling, excited, proudly displaying his flamingo toy for me to have as a welcome home gift. Nick was found two weeks later in an old RV in the woods that he had been using to do his drinking and do drugs so that his wife wouldn't catch him. Apparently the reason that he had came after us was because he thought that the reason that Josh wanted him to leave so quickly was so that he could call the owner again, and this time, the complaint would get him fired. Unknown to us, his wife had kicked him out four days before the event of this, and was in the process of getting a restraining order against him over threatening texts and phone calls that she had been getting. He stated that his job was all that he had left, and Josh needed to be punished for trying to take that away from him. He said that I wasn't the target and he didn't want to have to kill me, but he knew that he had a much better chance of killing Josh with me there than Dixie since Josh would be more likely to face him to protect me. Neither Josh or I called the owner or even a manager over his comments that night, though maybe we should have. It was disturbing what he was saying, in hindsight, but we were so used to him being a creep and saying horrible things that at that point, that didn't even register to us that he could be serious about trying to hurt somebody. I had known him for three months, and Josh had known him for six, and he had never done anything violent towards anybody. Everybody just thought he was all talk. We also put faith in the fact that every employee had a background check on them before they were hired, so it's not like Nick had ever been violent before. He took a plea deal so that the two counts of attempted murder would be dropped and he would instead go to a mental hospital for offenders. The reason that I'm telling this story is that I got a call two weeks ago notifying me that as long as there's no setbacks to his health status, Nick is set to be released on June 8th of this year. When I called Josh, he said that he had received the same news the day before. Neither Josh or I work there anymore, and Josh has since moved away to another town on the other side of the city. 
and I have switched to going to college completely online and I'm in a new place that I'm renting with a roommate. I don't think he'll come after either of us. I don't see how he could blame us for what happened. I read so many of these stories and after the fact, everyone seems so prepared for what to do if they have ever seen the person they're writing about again. I don't think I'd be any more prepared to face him this time than I was back then. I've had pretty intense nightmares ever since that day, but ever since I got that call, every time I close my eyes, all I can hear is that one sentence louder and clearer than I ever had heard it since it was actually said. They're never going to find you two. Nick, if it was true that you were diagnosed as a psychopath, I hope you're getting the help that you need. You already destroyed my peace of mind, and even now, years later, I don't feel safe, especially at night.